Hello and welcome to this first live stream on this channel. Let's go ahead and talk about briefly what we're going to be doing. We're going to try to create a digital humanities project from scratch. I've had this idea in my head for a while now, and I think that it's going to be doable in a 48 hour period. It's all going to be done in Python with about five or six different major libraries in the workflow. The purpose of the project is going to be to create a digital humanities project that can dynamically represent the letters of an individual named Alcuin. And like any project, it's best to begin, let's start with some good practices, by just making a new GitHub repo that we can kind of push everything to so it's stored in the cloud and we've got some versions. So we can go back and kind of see an earlier version if we need to make some changes down the road. So I'm going to just jump right in and we're going to go ahead and start. And if you don't know who Alcuin is, if you don't know Latin, if you don't know uh, what letters are, <laughs> don't worry. We're going to be going through all that kind of as we go through. We've got a lot of time to do this. So let's call this Digital Alcuin Project. This is going to be the name of my new GitHub repo. And I'm going to do everything so that the audience can follow along more easily in uh, GUIs. So if I need to use an environment, I'm going to use the Anaconda Navigator. If I need to make a new repo for whatever reason, I'll use the GUI. I think it's easier to follow along in this kind of setting than pushing everything via the terminal. So we're going to go ahead and create this project. And if you want to follow along, I'm going to go ahead and publish it right now. And throughout the next 48 hours, I am going to be uh, kind of pushing everything to it as I make changes. Let's go ahead and publish it. And I've made it unprivate. So you can find it on my GitHub, which is WJV Mattingly. And now our project should be made. So I'm going to go ahead and move this to the side, and I'm going to grab this directory and find it, a digital Alcuin project. There we are. And I think I don't need to make a special environment here. I'm going to be using the standard uh, versions of all libraries, I think, throughout this entire project. If I do realize that I need special versions of libraries, I will make a, an individual environment for this project. I don't think it'll be necessary. I can probably get away with as it is using just the root base environment. So let's go ahead and just make a Jupyter notebook here. I'm going to be using Jupyter Lab, and that's going to get everything kind of set up for us so we can go ahead and start working on the project. So while this is booting up, let me explain kind of generally how I envision this whole workflow working. So I'm going to have a, at the end of the day, the end goal, always important to think about that, is an app. The app's going to be designed in Streamlit, which is going to make it relatively easy for me to get a front end a version of our front end part of this project up and running relatively quickly. I think the app is actually going to be one of the easiest parts of this workflow. Nevertheless, I need to have a general idea about where I want this project to end up if I want it to be kind of successful. That way I know what to do earlier on in the project. So the app's going to look something like this. It'll be this. So imagine that this is the entire page that a user will see. There's going to be a sidebar here where the user will select different features of the app. Uh, I want this app to have different things. I want it to be able to actually display the letters of an individual named Alcuin, both in the PDF form, which is how they're currently only available. I want them to be able to see them on a letter by letter basis rather than on a page by page basis. So I want the letters to be displayed in two different forms. I want to see one right here on the left in a box and one right here on the right in the box. The one on the right, and these will be even, uh, the one on the right is going to display the letters in PDF form as they're available right now on the MGH website. And then the one on the left is going to display the, the raw text. A user will have the ability to either look at the raw text for the whole letter, which means that they can easily copy and paste it, which currently is not possible to do in the current DMGH website terminal or a front end project. Uh, and then also on top of that, they're going to have some features up here that they can highlight. This will allow them to automatically annotate uh, people, places, and groups. I think I can get dates in there as well. Uh, but because we're working with a very domain specific set of textual data, I'm going to include in this also some other features like uh, specific monasteries, specific abbots, specific monks. So we're going to try to get rank and everything worked in. And for all of that, we're going to be using Spacey. I'm going to do a lot of it from scratch because in a typical project, you wouldn't already have code written. So we're going to write some stuff from scratch. The other thing that the user will be able to do is down here at the bottom of the app, they'll be able to export this textual data. They can export it as uh, JSON, XML. The XML will not be TEI compliant, 
but a user can easily do that. I don't have enough time in 48 hours to ensure TEI compliance because the manual is about a thousand pages long and I don't have the time to do that right now. That'll be for a later version. But nevertheless, as long as the data is annotated consistently, any user who can program can actually take that and convert it into TEI compliant text with a Python script. The other thing that I want is some features over here so a user can switch between different aspects of the app. Now I've talked about the, the textual side of the app and the, the NER or the natural language processing named entity recognition side of the app and the, kind of the output. But the other thing that the user will be able to do is they'll be able to extract uh, networks from this data either textual networks, which will contain a, a network of how each of these letters survives in different manuscripts, which we're gonna be working on. That'll be a little tricky. I think we can do it though. And the other thing that we're going to do is we're also gonna have social networks. So uh, we can make some presumptions about our data. If an individual writes a letter to someone else, then they probably have a relationship with them. What that relationship is, we can we can only really surmise by the context of the letter, or we can play the safe game and just presume that the relationship is epistolary, unless proven otherwise. And so that's what we'll do. We can also make an assumption that anyone who is referenced within a letter is going to have some sort of relationship with both the sender of the letter and the recipient. So we can use these kind of general heuristics to construct a very elaborate epistolary network between Alcuin and all the people who received his letters and all the people he referenced within them. And I think a good course of action here is going to be to use the prosopography of Anglo-Saxon England's uh, uh, data that they have. And for that, we'll get to it later on, but they've got IDs for each of these people. And I think it's going to be good to do some entity linking and connect individuals to a specific ID number. And we'll get to that in a little bit, but that's going to be the general idea. So this on the left hand side will be a parameter where they can kind of control the what face of the app they want to use, be it the textual one to navigate the letters and they can select multiple letters if they want to, or if they want it to be a network side so they can kind of uh, uh, switch between different network uh, analysis methods, be it textual or um, uh, pedagogical or epistolary. And then all that's going to be outputted in here. So whatever you select in the left-hand side affects what this looks like. And if an individual is going to be doing network analysis, it's just going to be a network graph with some options where they can select recipient and uh, sender strictly or include people referenced within letters. And then I think a good feature also is going to be a little network graph that can be expanded up here at the top from the letter point of view. So a little expander maybe right here that a user can open up and see the network graph represented in the individual letter or letters that that user has selected. So that's where we want to end up. So how do we get there? Well, we, like any good project, we need to start with acquiring our data. So I'm gonna be going to the DMGH website this is the Digital Monumenta Germania Historica, which is a place that uh, houses a whole bunch of critical editions from the 19th century onwards. They still publish them today, probably one of the best, especially for early medieval texts. Now, I'm very familiar with this website, but essentially it has different uh, collections that you can kind of navigate. You can go through uh, different scriptores, uh, leges, a diplomoda, epistoli. We want epistoli, which is Latin for letters, and we're going to grab specifically in here uh, epistoli uh, carolini ivy. So the, 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 the letters from the Carolingian age, and we're going to grab the fourth one, here, and this is going to be the one where we find Alcuin's letters. Now, if we go through, we can find where Alcuin's letters start, and I already know that they start on page 18. So I can scroll down, and I can see, once I get to page 18, where they actually start. Like I said, we're doing everything from scratch here, starting from acquiring the data to cleaning it to manipulating it. And this project's going to be a little harder than you might expect, because one of the things that we have to do still is we got to OCR it. So that's going to be our first task after we download it. So I know it starts on page 18, so I can go ahead, click on this I, and it's going to open up this option. I can select anything from page 18 onwards, but I need to know where his letters end. So let's go down and find where his appendix starts, and uh, we should be able to scroll up, and we see that it ends on page 481. So I'm going to go ahead and grab that, and then we're going to talk about this data a little bit and how I need to OCR it, because understanding how to OCR something is just as important as actually being able to OCR something. If that doesn't make sense, it will make sense in just a second. And then I have to go through and answer some of these questions to prove that I'm not a robot 
and uh, I'm gonna hit PDF, and that's what I want. And it'll take a few seconds. These PDFs are high resolution, which means that they are going to be um, quite large. I think this collection of letters, if I've downloaded it in the past, I think it's around 100 and, oh, 117 megabytes. So we're gonna go ahead and save that. And let's go ahead and navigate now to our projects. We're gonna go down into uh, Digital Alcuin. Here we are. And let's start making a data subfolder. So we're going to call that data, and we're not going to be able to push this to GitHub because it's over 100 megabytes. That's okay, though. Uh, we don't really care about the PDF being pushed right now. We're going to separate out into individual PDFs based on letter in a little bit. Those will be smaller, and those will be easier to push. So right now, we're just going to call this letters.pdf, and that should be good. And if you have questions, feel free to ask in the... Uh, the question side, and uh, I'll try to do my best to answer them. It's a little hard. I've got many uh, screens up and running right now, so I might lose track of the chat occasionally, but we'll get to it. All right. So now if I go back to my Jupyter Lab, we see that we have data now as a subfolder, and we've got uh, letters here as a PDF. We can open it up. It's going to be a little slow. Jupyter Lab doesn't really handle large PDFs very well. Uh, there's a huge delay in them. This is a massive PDF. Uh, for Jupyter Lab to actually handle. But nevertheless, we see that it's there. And we see that um, the MGH has kindly put this little stamp on the front, uh, which you can go ahead and read in your own time if you speak German. Uh, but we're going to really care about what starts on page two. So our first task is going to be to grab this data. Let's go ahead and open it up. And so we can view it outside of Jupyter Lab. It'll be a little easier, I think, to, to follow along. So I'm going to zoom out just a little bit. So the challenges with OCR, if you've seen my OCR series, uh, we use these letters as kind of a template so I could kind of reference back when I knew I was going to be doing this 48-hour uh, project. We've got some challenges with this letter. Uh, if we zoom in, we'll notice that we've got some problems with regards to the, uh, I don't want to say poor quality, because as far as scans of old uh, critical editions go, this is fairly good, but we've got some cleanup to do on these documents. So we've got some bat, uh, some OCR kind of uh, page marks coming through. We've got some bleeding around the letters. We're, we're going to be able to fix all of that, but the real, the real problem for this is going to be the amount of data that is on this critical edition. Critical editions, they cost so much because of all of this metadata. Unfortunately, that metadata is not easy to separate and remove from the main body of the text, which is what we need to do. So one of the things I want to do is OCR everything. But I know I'm going to have some problems specifically with these uh, footers down here. These footers are going to be giving me a lot of issue. They're very important. They contain a lot of metadata, such as variant readings. Uh, they even give me some contextual clues about uh, who individuals are. I'm not too concerned about these right now because some of these are uh, outdated, not the variant readings, but the footnotes. Some of them are wrong. Uh, these are going to need to be manually annotated. And I think for this portion, I'm really going to rely on the uh, the annotations coming from a few different places, uh, such as Pace, which we're going to get to. And I never actually started my countdown. Let's go ahead and do that right now. Uh, looks like I'm a little bit in. So I'm going to switch this over to, uh, what time is it now? 13. Uh, so we're going to switch it over to uh, 13, and we'll start there. That way, uh, should be seeing a little countdown in the bottom right-hand corner now. Good, we do. Fantastic. And so that way, we all know what time we're on. So let's go ahead and talk about this metadata that we need to get rid of. Um, the metadata on the left is going to be references. Now, in these letters, these are oftentimes going to be references to scripture. So you're going to have these things like uh, Ecclesiastes uh, 5.8. So it's a reference to the, uh, the book of the Bible, the chapter, and the verse. And these are quoted in text. So right here we see that this is being referenced probably to this quote right here. I'd have to do a, a manual check to make sure. But other times it's, it's a very subtle illusion. So that could be what that is too. We're going to be able to use this metadata down the road to understand what verses are kind of contained within the text. And we're going to come up with some creative rules to extract these things after we OCR them. Uh, I have tried in the past to consistently grab the left column, and while that's possible to do, I think we can uh, keep the left column, simplify the problem, and apply some simple heuristics to just kind of grab all the text and then find or come up with a heuristic way to grab scrip scriptural, uh, scriptural references and then extract those and separate them from the text. 
So that's going to be kind of what we do there. The main problem though, like I said, is going to be to get rid of these things here on the left, which have no bearing. They tell us what line on the page it is not really relevant for our purposes and getting rid of this footer. So that's going to be our first task is going to be to just OCR everything and get rid of all of that and start cleaning up the PDFs and go ahead and start actually grabbing the raw text from them because it's not really the, the, the PDFs that we care about so much as the raw text. One of the things I want to keep preserved because individuals do like to cite these critical editions is I like to um, I like to preserve the page numbers. So the page numbers are going to be really important here because if an individual wants to cite these letters, I don't want them citing this Digital Humanities Project. I want them to be able to cite the standard critical edition, which is the MGH, which put these volumes out um, because I don't deserve credit for that whatsoever. And the other thing I need to maintain is this right here. This number re uh, refers to uh, the typical number that an individual will cite for which letter they are using. In this case, it would be letter number one. And I want to keep this MGH description. This is a brief description of what the, the letter will be about. So Alcuin sending a letter to his friend in a monastery or uh, concerning the, uh, the monk Benedict. And then the other thing I do want to preserve, even though these are now, um, in some cases, have been corrected by a scholar named Donald Bullock, I want to keep these. These are the, the date ranges for the letters. Now, a lot of these have been recently in the past, like 20 years or so, corrected. But nevertheless, it's important to maintain what was once believed to be the, the date range. So I'm going to have two different pieces of metadata for dates. It's going to be the standard original MGH edition and then the uh, the new Bluff uh, uh, date for that specific letter. We'll get to that later. And then another thing that I need to grab is this. I really don't care about the additions. These are now outdated. Nobody is going to cite the Patrologia Latina where it appears. It doesn't really matter because this edition replaced it. Back in the 1800s when this edition came out, it was still important because individuals still were using these earlier editions, but these are kind of irrelevant now. So I'm not concerned about those. I am, however, interested in seeing if I can grab this. This references the manuscripts in which they appear. So in this case, it's going to be manuscript H, and it tells me that it comes on a folio. I have to zoom in a little bit to actually read that. Uh, yeah, so it's 61 to 62. So what we can do is, is use that to get a sense of what manuscripts this letter appears in. These will be appended also by the Bulloff edition, or Bulloff um, monograph on Alcuin, which gives us more information about the letters and the manuscripts in which they appear. And what we're going to be doing is using that as a way to recreate the uh, the Bulloff thesis, which is an argument for all of these letters circulating in certain collections. Now I have to take a sip of coffee. All right. So that's going to be how we kind of solve this OCR problem. So grab everything on the page with the exception of what's here on the on the right and what's here down on the bottom. So that's our first problem to solve. And then once we have that all extracted, then we can start applying some uh, string-based heuristics with regex and maybe some spacey to start actually getting the data, the textual data, the raw text output into the uh, more structured form so that it can eventually go on the front end page of the website. So to do that, we need to do a few different things. We need to leverage a few different libraries. And we're going to be doing everything and different notebooks at different stages. This is going to look a little sloppy, um, but that's kind of the whole point. I'm hoping that I make a ton of mistakes here as well so that we can all kind of learn from them. This is going to be in real time, so any mistakes I make, I'm going to have to troubleshoot them on the fly. And you'll see how every coder constantly makes mistakes and is constantly looking things up on Stack Overflow or GitHub. So let's call this first notebook. Uh, I'm going to give them a, a sequence, so 01. Uh, the first step of the of the problem. And this is going to be getting uh, raw text. Nothing creative there. A standard name. And fortunately, uh, I do have a bit of previous work in this area uh, with getting these specific additions into raw text. I'm going to be leaning on that a little bit here, but not a whole bunch because this problem is a little bit different. All right. So uh, the first thing I need to do is I'm gonna, I know I'm going to be working with uh, two different libraries here. I'm going to be working with PyTesseract, and I'm going to be working with OpenCV. Uh, and so we import those very standardly, import PyTesseract and uh, OpenCV as CV2. We can go ahead and execute that cell, and everything hopefully good. The first cell of the video actually executes well with no errors. That's fantastic. So the first thing I need to do is I need to grab that entire uh, PDF. 
The problem is I really can't do that. The first thing I have to do is I've got to separate that PDF out into individual individual pages. So I'm going to make a new folder here because I don't feel like making a directory uh, in, in my code. Um, I'm going to call this letter pages. And this is going to be the first thing I have to do now before I can even get to OCR in it. And so I got to take this whole PDF and I've got to break it down into individual pages. So there's a few different ways that I can do this in Python. Um, the first one that comes to mind is uh, PDF to Py. Let me find that real quick into pages. And so you can follow along. This is something I don't have to do too often. So again, you're already seeing me trying to figure out how to do something. And yeah, so I remember it being this from, um, so it's pi PDF two. Uh, we can do that and it's actually gonna break everything out for us into, oh, this code's fantastic. Let's just commandeer that real fast and execute this cell. So what this should do is it's going to grab everything for us from the PDF. It's going to go through, um, figure out the number of pages, iterate over them, and then what it's going to do is it's going to output them as PDF file writer. Okay, I'm fine with that. And then we need to tell it where to actually store the PDF. So we're going to add to this one little bit, uh, letter pages. And then what this is going to do is this is an old way of kind of formatting strings. F strings replace this. I'll leave it for now. Um, and then what I'd like to do is always in my code, I add like a little, this is both for citation purposes, but also so I can go back and see where I originally got it from. Again, 99% of what you do is look at Stack Overflow when you have to figure out a problem at first. And so what this is going to do is it's going to output everything to uh, to this letter dot, uh, data letter pages and should drop everything into letter pages. Now, always it's a good uh, good practice to um, to do this just on a much shorter set not all 400 pages at once to make sure that there's no bugs in your code. And we see we already have one. So there's no document.pdf. That's my fault. I got to go back to letters.pdf. Now it should work. And if we open up uh, letter pages, we see we've got these two things right here. This should be our first page. Indeed it is. And this should be our second. So I already see one problem with this. The first problem is, is that I don't really care so much about that page. We'll, we'll take it for now. Um, but what I need to do is I need to make sure that I starts higher than, uh, or starts at 17. So there's a couple different ways I can do that. Um, I can do, let's go back to make sure that's right. Data slash letters. There we go. So I could either start I in a range at a, a certain interval. That's going to lead to a problem though, because it's going to affect the, the number of pages that it has to parse over. Um, so what I need to do is I don't really care so much about I. I want to iterate over all the letters. I'll make a separate variable. We're just going to call this X. This is not necessarily good practice, but it'll work. And then we want X to iterate up each time equals X plus one. And yes, I I do it this way instead of the, the shorter way with the equal plus. Um, so what we want to do is start off there. And we want to start off at page 18. Now, the reason for this is because we want to retain... Um, that bit of information there. So we got another problem now. Now when I is going to be injected into this string, I'm going to go ahead and replace this with the way I prefer to do it, which is as an F string. We're going to insert X into here. We've got a, a simple, oh, we've got a short problem right here though. When we do this, when we go through and iterate through all these things, uh, we're not going to have the leading zero, which means that while on the surface it's going to look like it's in proper order, it's actually not going to be. And the reason for that is going to be when we try to load this data into code with like glob or some kind of all the files at once, it's going to put them in order of 0, 1, 2, 3, uh, or 0, 1, 11, uh, 12, 13. It's going to put them in order that way. We want a leading zero. I know that I'm going to have uh, at least three numbers long in this. So I need to actually make sure that uh, when I convert this into a string that the... Uh, that there is a, a set of leading zeros depending on if it's uh, if it's below 10 uh, or below 100. If that doesn't make sense, it will hopefully in just a second. 
Uh, for right now, I'm going to go ahead and comment this out to make sure that my code works before I run it over everything and have to constantly replace the PDFs, then uh, it's it's a nightmare. So we want to make sure that the code actually works first. So we're going to print off X. And again, this is now just troubleshooting. It should tick up from 18. And in fact, it does. Great. So that code works. That was not nothing tricky there. The next thing that we need to do is we need to make sure we're going to create a simple condition here. If X is less than 100, then we're going to have a new variable called Y, which is going to be equal to um, a string, which is going to have X within it, because we don't care about the actual number here. We care about the number as a numerical string. Uh, so it's going to have X there. And if it's less than 100, it's going to have a zero ahead of it. Now, in this case, we want to print off y. Let's go ahead and do that. And we've got a syntax error. What have we done? Um, oh, I can actually tell, tell it something. There we go. So now we've got 0, 18. Fantastic. And if we go all the way down, we should see it change right at 100. And it doesn't. It keeps on iterating at 99. Ah, because we never gave it another condition. Um, else, we don't have to worry about too many conditions here because we don't have anything less than 10 and we don't have anything greater than um, a thousand uh, y equals uh, x and what that's going to do is let y be equal now to zero zero and it should change right at 100 and it does so while this little change doesn't look like it's that big of a deal it is it means that when we load these files in code now they're going to remain in the proper order that we want them to appear in now i know also that this is going to start at the first page, so I probably want to start at number. Um, I want to start at number 17, and I'll just not worry about that page when I import it with glob. Now I'm going to replace X here with Y, and I don't like this document page thing. I'm going to go ahead and delete both of these. Actually, um, I want them to be um, maybe letter page. MGH page. How about that? MGH. And I like underscores as opposed to dashes, so let's do that. And we'll add a little underscore there as well. And now what we have is um, the pages should be separated out. Again, let's do one more final test. Troubleshoot this just to make sure. Um, we have to go back out because I don't know why it does that. All right, cool. So page 17. That's right. It's not the actual 17 in the MGH edition, but this is the page 18. And it lines up with that right there. So now it's time to let this run. And this should be perfect. Let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to pop out of this directory. And uh, we don't have to print off Y anymore because we know that's going to work. Cool. Uh, it's already done. <laughs> Gotta love Python. This is what makes life a lot easier. Uh, and now they're formatted in the correct way. We should be able to open up any of these. 481, and it should be the last page. And it is. And it lines up with the 481 here. This is going to be perfect because what we need to do now is we now need to iterate over uh, everything in, uh, in this entire directory. And to do that, we're also going to be using, let's go ahead and import it up here. We're going to import it glob. That's going to be essential for iterating over all the files. So let's go ahead and make our files list right now. So if you're not familiar with glob, what it does is it allows for you, oop, it allows for you to just pass in a simple string command and that string command automatically goes in to whatever directory you tell it to and finds all the files within that directory. There's other ways to do this using OS, but I prefer to do it this way. It's cleaner, it's one line of code, and typically the files that I work with don't have too much variance. So I can usually grab them pretty easily. So we're gonna look for any, any file that is a PDF in that directory. So we say data backslash, uh, in this case, letter underscore pages, backslash and we use an asterisk that means anything that happens prior to dot pdf now i could have just gotten away with anything there but this is always good practice to specify things if you can a little bit more uh, because that means that some for some reason a text file or a jpeg gets dropped into this um this directory it won't come up here and if we execute that let's print it off so you can kind of see what it looks like we have a list of all of our files which is every single um, essentially every single individual page. Now that we've got that, we know that that works. Let's go ahead and clear that out. We can start actually doing the fun part, which is loading in and iterating over all these files. Now, again, always good practice to start small. So we're going to say for file and files, and we're going to just grab, uh, we're going to only grab the first one. 
So we're gonna say for file and files, now we need to start writing our script to do some of that pre-processing to start generating some raw text. We want that raw text to be stored outside of letter underscore pages. Let's score it as raw pages. So this would be the raw text. Or maybe, yeah, we'll start as raw pages, why not? All right, so what we're gonna do is we're going to first have to open up that image. So we can do that using OpenCV. I am read, and we can pass in one argument, which is going to be the file. So this now has opened up that file. Actually, I have to do one more thing. I have to convert these to, um, I have to convert these to images first. So again, I have to go back, and I believe there's a way that I can easily do this uh, and store these as individual pages. Uh, Python images or PDFs to image. You can see I've looked this up before. And uh, in this case, pip install PDF to image. Oh, this is when you have to use poplar. Uh, that's kind of a pain. Let's see. Hmm. <laughs> Am I might just cheat. Uh, use Adobe Acrobat. It turns out I actually can do this. All right, let's open up Adobe Acrobat then. All right, so let's just save this whole thing as a set of PDFs or JPEGs. Um, how do we do that then? Nope, not redact, whoops. Let's see. Hmm. Well, let's see if we can get Poplar to work. Uh, there's a problem on Windows with this. I remember working with this in the past. I might already have it installed. That's good. Okay. Let's go ahead and see if this works. Let's just do a test on file. So remember correctly, oh cool, you can convert straight from the whole PDF. That might have been even easier. Uh, page and pages, output JPG. Put this here. Let's just see if this works. Let's create a new, this is good practice, create just a temp, just to drop things in that we're not entirely going to be keeping, just to make sure everything works. And we've got an error. This is probably popular. Yeah. Uh, if anyone does remember how to actually install Poplar correctly, very much open to the idea. Ah, we can do it in Anaconda. Let's do that then. That's going to present some issues though. Let's go ahead and try it. Um, nope, I'm going to open up Anaconda. See, while that's loading, I'll see if there's chat questions, and it looks like there are. Uh, is there any full of blank pages? No, I don't think so. I'm pretty sure every page has some text on it. All right, looks like Anaconda's loaded up. All right, let's just use our root environment, open in terminal. See if we can get this to work. <laughs> Maybe it will.
Geeks for geeks. They always are good. Oh, we can download it here and just add it straight into the path, it looks like. That might be an option if this doesn't work. Let's go ahead and at least pursue this option. All right. Uh, release version 2103. We want the... Release. Looks like I even downloaded this before. <laughs> All right, let's see if we downloads. Okay, let's go back to the Geek for Geeks site. See if we can figure this out. Okay, so we've got to be able to drop the path. What needs to be in the path, though? Is it library? It's probably the bin. Cool. All right, let's go ahead and extract this. Copy. We'll just drop it into downloads. or Let's put it actually in our repo. Or not in repo, let's just drop it in projects. Probably need a link just to this bin directory, set up the path. So in Windows, you have to edit the path variables this way. Environmental variables, we need to have uh, an edit there. And we're going to add in a new, uh, that. And I might have to restart Jupyter Notebook. This might not work. Yeah, all right, so let's go ahead and save. Let's close all this down. And then open up Jupyter Notebook again. Get to projects. All right, now let's see if we can get this to work correctly. Cool, all right, well, maybe that'll work. Yep, glob's not defined, oh my goodness. There we go. Awesome, I think we got it working. Um, let's go to temp. Yay, and the pheasants rejoiced. And there was much rejoicing. Okay, so cool. So we got now we have Poplar into our uh, path. So it means we can actually use this powerful library PDF to image. Very happy about that. It's a huge thing that we can actually uh, save time on. So we've got all of our pages now loaded up as individual pages. What we want to do is we now need to iterate over each of them. So we're going to now go into. Oh, we are now going to be going into letter underscore pages grabbing all these we don't really need this anymore let's go ahead and delete that one that's just the uh, the first page that comes with every download from the mgh and now what we can do is we probably should re-grab all these files now it won't include 17 and won't get us an error 
So what we want to do is we want to iterate over all of these pages and, um, and essentially we want to uh, grab each PDF and then convert it into a JPEG. So what we can do now is we don't need to have this. Let's put this up here just for good practice. We'll do this as well. Nah, we'll leave that there. Um, so what we want to do now is grab for file and files. We want to grab that. It's only ever going to have one page. I guess we could have just grabbed everything from the PDF and done it this way, but you'll see why that's important not to do that. I want each page represented as a PDF as well anyway for a later part of the project when we work on the front end because I want to assemble these PDFs uh, on a letter by letter basis. And in order to know when a letter begins and when a letter ends, we're gonna have to work with the raw text, but we're gonna be using these anyway later on. So this wasn't a waste of time to go ahead and do. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna iterate over the files and then we're gonna just do a page count uh, for a file. And we don't really care right now about um, about the pages because there's, always, there's only ever gonna be one page. So what we need to do is we need to get the file name. It's gonna be equal to file. And we're gonna say a new file name. And that's gonna be equal to file <clears throat> dot replace. And we're gonna try to replace letter pages with raw, so we're gonna replace letter pages with raw pages okay and then we are going to be saving it as instead of replace pdf we're going to replace it with jpg and that's going to be what we put in right here Let's do first a test. It's always good to you know debug these things. We're gonna first print off file name, and then we're gonna print off new file name, just to make sure that we got this working correct before we let it run over everything. So let's do that, and we see that it's now changed from uh, data letter pages into raw pages. It's a JPEG as opposed to a PDF. That looks good. Let's do it now. A small test on just this one file. Make sure everything works correctly. We should go to raw pages. Oh, no, we didn't want it in raw, raw pages. We wanted it in images, image pages. Oops, I'm gonna have to change that. Hmm. figure that out in a second. Uh, the first thing we have to do is we have to replace that with image pages. Fantastic. And looks like this is kind of a scary error. Uh, decompression bomb warning, image size, what? Let's figure out what this is about. Um, hmm. Looks like this might present a problem. So we have to fix the image from pillows. All right. This might be because these PDFs are very large. Let's go ahead and see if this fixes the problem for us. Hmm. Now this is telling us that it might not be a PDF file. Letter pages. So it looks like 18, page 18 is giving us some problems for some reason. 
Let's go ahead and try and do this a little differently. Um, what's the issue? So our file's been damaged somehow. I'm not entirely sure how or why. Um, let's try to grab the second one, which has been untouched so far in this process. If that works, then what we can do, cool, and that did work. Let's go ahead to images. Maybe it worked, raw pages. Hmm. Let's just save it as uh, temp output.jpg. And again, the same thing. So something's happening here. It's damaging our files for some reason. Let's go back to temp. So this is what it looks like. That looks good. OK, I'm, something's happening with the way in which I am Images, pages, maybe that's why. Hmm. Let's try something else. Okay. Let's see if this works now. And we got that same error. I think I'm about to recreate those PDFs. Oh, oops. And we're going to have to put new file name in there. Now it should work. And again, the same error. We have to go back. Very odd indeed. Let's try something else. Let's make a copy of our letters PDF so we don't have to re-download it. Duplicate. 
All right, what we're going to do is try to grab just that one and uh, not worry about glob so much right now. So let's just get rid of that, change this back. And we're going to call this um, data letters.pdf. For page and pages, make sure, convert from path. For page and pages, save file. MG data images pages. Uh, we're going to save. Uh, MGH page, and then we're going to put an X right here. Actually, let's just go back and grab this bit of code. Set up X outside of the loop. Hmm. This might take a second longer to run because it's such a large PDF, but I think this should do it. Let's just, uh, right, let's run it and hope for the best. <laughs> Not entirely sure what's happening here. I think something's happening when it opens up the PDF. It might be because it's so large. It's somehow uh, corrupting the files. I'm not entirely sure how or why, but that seems to be what's happening. This is going to take probably a few minutes to run because it's having to go through a 117 megabyte PDF and convert every single image down. Uh, but before it even gets to that, it has to actually read in the entire PDF. And that, I think, is what's going to take the longest amount of time. All right. We don't really need this anymore or this. Let's see if OpenCV can actually open up a PDF though while that's running. Uh, OpenCV doesn't support PDF format at all, so yeah. Huh, we could do that. That looks a little sketchy, though. If this fails, we're going to do this and just figure out how to do it in Adobe Acrobat. It sounds like from my computer, it's doing something. <laughs> All right, let's see. Let's at least have a backup plan while this is running. So we're going to try to figure out how to do this in Adobe. Uh, and I might as well go ahead and open up that copy file so we can mess around with it here. Um, so put it to the side, see if we can figure out how to do it. Need your PDF, and yes, I do. I've got the Adobe Acrobat Pro DC, so that should be fine. Convert scans. Here we go. Uh, choose an image format, so we can just do export. So looks like we can do export PDF as an image. Huh. We just would do JPEG and we can export all. Huh. All right, that's what we're going to be what we do if this doesn't work. It's always good to do something in Python if you can uh, because you don't have to do this manually. Let's say we had 30 different PDFs. 
I could just run this script and it would do all of them for me without me having to sit there and do it uh, for each one of them. Or if you add that up to 100 or 300, that would happen as well. Um, I'm not getting any results here though. I'm gonna go ahead and do this in a separate um, folder. Let's just do Adobe Images just to give this a go. Uh, we're gonna export all as that. And let's select where we want to drop them off. We want to drop them into Adobe Images because why not? Uh, doesn't look like we have any ability to control what the files will be called. Hmm, see if it works. Well, that's a lot faster. Our big problem here is going to be the file names aren't going to line up. It's probably going to be page one for this one, page two for page 18. We can address that though when we load things in. And what we can do is we can actually uh, change it as we save them, open them up as images, and then save them back. So it won't be too big of an issue, I don't think. Let's go ahead and pull up our Jupyter Notebook again. Yep, and that's what it's doing. So it's starting off on page 001. Good, it does have the leading zero. I'm happy about that. Uh, that would be very annoying otherwise. And we're going to just go ahead and not even worry about doing that in Python anymore. And we're going to stick with this. Cool. All right, so we've got that. Let's see how much longer this is going to take. Oh, it should be done in just a few seconds. So we'll have all of our PDFs now. So first major hurdle or problem is going to be solved. Um, looks like we could solve it in Python, but if we can solve it this way for right now, I'm going to go ahead and do that since we are in a 48 hour, uh, time crunch and it looks like we've already got almost one hour down. All right, cool. Minimize this. We know that they're all loaded in here as individual images. We know that we don't care about this one. Um, so let's go ahead and just delete that one for right now. Permanent delete. Yes, please. We're going to start off on page two. Uh, we're going to now just stop the cell from running. I think this would have actually worked, but why bother? All right, so let's get rid of that. We're no longer worried about that. Um, now what we're going to be doing is we want to grab each of these images. So we are going to worry about that. Let's grab each of the images under Adobe Images, and we're going to grab every JPEG. Now we can actually start getting to the OCRing part of the problem. And let's go ahead and um, just cancel that out. Let's comment that out. And let's go ahead and restart and run every kernel just so we get whatever's stuck in memory out. Uh, fantastic, that's done. Now it's time to, to start grabbing our actual images and OCRing them. So now we're gonna save for file and files. Now we can get down to the actual OCR part of the problem. So what we need to do is we need to say uh, image, we're gonna create a base image file that's gonna be equal to CV2. So we're gonna call our CV2 library, which is OpenCV. We're gonna say I am read. And we're going to read in the file. Now we should be able to do this, uh, but I'm going to just to be safe. I'm going to only work with the first image, which is going to be page one for right now. So what we can do with this is we can start to do some basic pre-processing to this image. So the first thing what we want to do is we want to convert it into grayscale. So we can do CV2, I think it's convert color. I always have to look this up. We're going to call in that first image, which is uh, the image that we just created in memory. And we're going to run cv2.color, I'll look, capital, capitalize, uh, bgr, and I am cheating right now. I've got a list of, I've got the docs for uh, OpenCV over here on the other screen. Cool, we're going to do that for gray. Create another one, we're going to blur the gray. So we're going to say cv2. Dot, and this is where we use the Gaussian blur. And we're going to pass in the gray object, and we're going to blur it seven by seven that should be enough and we're going to do a zero okay and then what we need to do is we need to set up a threshold so we're going to say thresh is going to be equal to cv2 dot threshold threshold i think that just doesn't have two h's uh yeah it doesn't cool blur we're going to do zero two five five and cv2 dot thresh we're going to choose the binary inverse plus, there we go, cv2 thresh otsu, which is going to essentially choose for us the right parameters. 
All right, cool. So now that we've got that, we can set up a kernel size. And that's going to be equal to cv2.get structuring element. And this is going to be cv2.morph rect. And we're going to have a kernel size of 3 by 50. Cool. Kernel. And then we just dilate the image. So we're going to create a dilated image using that kernel size and the threshold. cv2.dilate. We're going to say thresh kernel iterations equals 1. Let's run that. It should not give us any ideas. Doesn't have or errors. Dilate. Uh, I probably didn't spell dilate correctly. Where are we? Dilate. There we are. Cool. So that is looking like it's working. Excellent. So now we can uh, kind of a couple different options. Let's let's write this to image so we can kind of see what it looks like. We're gonna save it as temp sample.jpg. Oh, it takes two arguments. We gotta tell it what we want to write. So we want to write the dilated image down. Let's go into our temp so we can kind of see what it looks like. Uh, sample. So this is gonna be what this looks like. We're gonna try to grab some uh, some structure from this. I don't think this is gonna work because the first thing I want to do is I want to separate uh, this footer out. We're gonna have to make some changes here, I believe, because we don't want that blurring to happen between the main body and the footer. Nevertheless, the the data on the right has clearly been separated. Uh, we don't see any blurring coming over into the main body of the text. Um, and we don't see the the data over here on the left really blurring too much. Um, all in all, it's not looking too bad. I think we're going to be able to do this relatively easily with uh, only a few adjustments. So what I want to do is I want to try to find some structure with this dilated image. I want to find some structure in it so that I can actually extract the body of the text from the footnote. I want to separate that footnote out. And in order to find the footnote, I want to look for something that is long and thin in the uh, in the actual page, and then use that position to the position of that long thin item, which is going to be that that long line that separates the footer from the main body. And then make a presumption that anything below that long thin line is going to be stuff that I don't care about, stuff that I don't need. And so I just can work with everything from here up. That's the idea, at least. I think it'll work just fine. I've thought about this in the past, so I do have a general idea about how to solve this problem. Uh, but let's go ahead and try and, and find that item first. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to make a series of contours. And so we're going to first try to find contours. So we're going to say cv2.find contours. We're going to look at that dilated image. And we're going to say rter external cv2 dot chain approx simple. Again, I am looking at the documentation here. I'm not remembering all this off the top of my head. I can never, for the life of me, remember everything in the OpenCV library. I always find it a bit challenging. Uh, so we're going to look at all the counts, the first one, and we're going to say if the length of CNTS is equal to two else CNTS one. So we're going to look for essentially the largest here. And this should grab us the the main body. So what we're going to now say is um, CNTS dot sorted. So we're going to sort everything out. Key is going to be with the lambda. This is going to keep us keep the structure of these bounding boxes. X two CV two dot bound Dean rect x one. Cool. So let's execute that. Shouldn't get an error. Has no arguments sorted. Hmm. Ah, there we go. Yep. Cool. No error. That's a good sign. Now what we need to do is we need to iterate over these bounding boxes. So we can say for C and C and TS. So we're going to iterate over all these. We're going to grab the X, the Y, the width, and the height. I think that's the correct order that they're always in. And we're going to set that equal to CV2 dot bounding rect C. And for right now, let's just kind of print off X, Y, W, H. There might be a lot here. Yeah, there are. So these are all of our bounding boxes, essentially. And what we're trying to figure out is where are these, and the, the bounding boxes that are being drawn are being drawn on, on that structure dilated image. 
or that dilated image which we can extract structure from. So what we need to do is we need to use this knowledge, this data, to find the bounding boxes that are probably going to be um, have a, a long width and a short height. So this is what we can kind of see here. So we're looking for something that has a long width and a short height. So this has got a long width, it's 814, and it's got a, a tall height. So what's actually happening here is this is grabbing pretty much this one right here is the main body. I ha if I had to guess, if I had to guess, that's going to be the main body of our of our document. Uh, I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but that's what that's looking like. So it's always it's always good to be able to kind of get a sense of where these images are drawn. So what we can do is we can draw these images onto a new sample output just to see how our bounding boxes are lining up because it can be a little difficult to decipher all of this information. And so let's go ahead and see if we can if we can do that. Actually looking down here, yeah, we'll figure it out. Okay, so let's comment this out for right now. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to draw these bounding boxes. So we're going to create an ROI, which I can't remember what that stands for. If anyone knows, please do let me know. But that's kind of the, the standard syntax with OpenCV. So we're going to draw them on the image. And then what we're going to do is we're going to draw them on uh, delta, uh, the Y, which is going to be the, uh, the Y axis to Y plus the height, which is going to give us um, essentially one, uh, one component that we need for the box. And then the next thing that we need to tell it is the x. So we're going to say the x to the x plus the width. So that's going to give us the dimensions of the bounding box. And we can print off the ROI. I think you should be able to see it. And this is what it looks like, which tells us essentially the dimensions to draw this bounding box. Let's ignore that for right now. And so what we're going to do is now draw this CV2 dot, uh, we can do the rectangle image. And we're going to say the X and the Y. And then we're going to say uh, the X plus the W. This is how we have to look this up. The Y plus the height. And then we're going to actually specify the color. So in this case, let's stick with 36, uh, 25, or 255 by 12. And then we're going to also pass in two. And now what we can do is we can save this. Uh, so let's go outside of that loop. So after we iterate over all these different uh, uh, contours, we're going to do cv2.im write, and we're going to write out temp, and let's just save this as contours.jpg. And we're gonna save in that original image because we've made all these alterations to the image. So let's see what that looks like. And it should be finished instantly, but I have to pop out on here. And we can see where our bounding boxes are drawn. Okay, so this is the bounding box that I suspected was the the whole main body, and in fact it is. So the reason why is this drawing the main body, the whole body? Well, it's a very simple reason for this, and it's because of the way I've structured my kernel size. And I kind of did this on purpose so that we could kind of walk through this problem. So what we have is a kernel size that is, I believe I selected three by fifty. Yeah. So it's looking for something that is. Uh, very tall. So it's doing the blurring on a very uh, tall level and on a small width level. Now, if I wanted to capture structure that was very small in height and very long in width, I would kind of do the opposite of that. So let's see what it looks like if I do the opposite of that. Let's do 50 and 3. And we're going to close that because it's going to change it. And we got to close that too. All right, let's open it back up. And we now see that we've got different structure now grabbed. So what we've grabbed is structure that is long and thin. This is where changing your kernel size can really be um, useful. And I suspect if you've ever gone to the Digital Humanities Project T-Pen, uh, which came out in, I believe, like 2010-ish, uh, 2009, I believe this is how T-Pen actually works. It uses OpenCV to identify structure in, uh, in texts. If you have never seen it before, uh, T pen. Nope, that's not it. <laughs> uh, manuscripts. It's for identifying structure. It's on 2.8 now in um, in like manuscripts or early modern editions, and it allows for you to kind of automatically identify structures such as lines and columns. I believe this is kind of the back on um, what's happening on uh, T pen on the back end. 
Uh, and this is how you can easily grab lines in a, in a document. So I need to adjust my kernel size because what I want is to be able to grab the longest, thinnest thing. Actually, I might not need to adjust it at all. Uh, if I look for the longest, thinnest box, it's going to be this one, I think. The question is, is it going to be consistently that one? And my suspicion is possibly so. Let's see if we can figure this out though. All right, so what we need to do is we need to make a condition now. So what we wanna specify is we only wanna grab a bounding box. We only wanna do all of this stuff if the width is of a certain width and if the height is of a certain height. So if the width is greater than, let's just say 200, we're gonna start off with just the guess and, and this could be wrong, um, and the height, let's say the height needs to be less than, uh, I don't know, let's say less than 15. I don't know if that's gonna be right because this is all dependent on the pixels. So now what we're gonna do is do a test. So in theory, the only bounding box being drawn right now is one that meets this condition right here. Let me zoom in a little bit. It might be a little hard for y'all to see. And if we scroll down, fingers crossed, we've got it, success. Okay, now comes the big question of, is this is this reproducible? Is this going to be what happens on every page? And that's that's a big that's a big question. So let's go ahead and just try it out. And let's make another temp folder. Um, let's say we're gonna do that. So we're gonna do that and we're gonna say, call this, let's just call this X for right now. I'm gonna have to change it later. X equals zero. And we're gonna do X is equal to x plus one. And yes, I know you can do that differently. That's just how I have always done it. And so I do it that way. Uh, oh, looks like I didn't actually give it <laughs> the F string, which is helpful. And I also have to specify that it's supposed to go into my contours subfolder. Okay, let's go ahead and run that. Is it already done? Oh, wow. Uh, what? For file and file. Oh, I know what I did. That's gonna be all kind of, kind of messed up. We're gonna make an I. Instead, that's probably better syntax anyway. The reason why I, that all looks like that, let me go ahead and delete all these because these are all gonna be out of order, is because I was not thinking, I'm gonna start off I at 18 because that's what we're gonna have to do anyways in the future. Um, X is already a variable in this for loop, so it was grabbing the X, there we go. Uh, so let's grab the first five images. Hmm. There we go. And now, okay, so should be the same there. Good, good. And I got lucky <laughs> because this uh, and the critical edition is not actually long and thin. That could have been a really big problem. Uh, so let's go ahead and keep on looking down. Good, it's looking good. Let's choose a random page. Oh, it doesn't matter. It grabbed the same thing, even though it didn't grab the, the, the whole of it. As long as it's identifying that as the longest, thinnest thing, we're okay. So we might have a couple problems that pop up with that let's try let's uh let's try to do it with oh, let's just try it with 20 again i'm just trying to debug things early on it's grabbed it there I'm picking these at kind of random now it's grabbed it there i, I want to make sure that no matter what i can rely on this heuristic this rule that i have generated that that is always going to be the longest thinnest thing on the page uh, and now, now that I know that it is, okay, this is fantastic. Now I, I've got some very important data. I've got information about the page. So let me close all these out. These don't matter anymore. Um, I've got some really important information about the page. Because I can identify where the, the longest, thinnest item on the page is, it means that I can now also understand where on the x and y coordinates that is. Now, I always, I always get confused on x and y coordinates, so I'm gonna look up real fast uh, x, y graph, just to make sure uh, I'm right. And this is quite embarrassing, but I can never remember for the life of me which is x and which is y. So y is going to be our vertical plane, x is going to be our horizontal plane. Cool, all right, let's go back to this. So if I know that the where it appears on the horizontal plane, then what I can do is I can say that anything that is occurring lower than that horizontal, where it occurs on the uh, horizontal plane, then just ignore everything below it. And I want to grab the image based on everything above that. So for example, right here, when I'm grabbing this ROI, 
I'm grabbing the section that corresponds to um, to the area that corresponds to that line. I can use that same information to grab everything that is above that line. So let's try and achieve that right now. So I'm going to come up with this main ROI, which is going to be blank for right now. Uh, we're going to make it blank and we're going to because it doesn't matter what it is right now. So we're going to then say if this happens, we're going to save it as if it does have that main ROI is going to be equal to ROI. Just so I can find a follow along with the code and the logic of it. So what we want to do now is we're going to ignore this part. We don't really care about writing print main ROI. So let's make sure that that works. Okay, so I need to keep main ROI out of that loop. That was my mistake. Now what we should have is just a series for each image about where the ROI appears. Cool. Okay, so let's just preserve the, let's just do the Y. So for all these, and we can see we've got a couple instances where we don't actually have an ROI found. So let's go ahead and look at these. So it's the second to last one, so 36. Nothing was grabbed. All right, cool. So now we're able to easily debug this, and we found an instance where this wasn't the case. So let's go ahead now and try to figure out why. We know that we have a couple instances where this isn't actually working. So let's make our, our kernel just a little bit smaller. See if that fixes the problem. It doesn't, maybe a little bit smaller. Might not be an issue of, of width then, rather an issue of this. Let's change this to 25. And we actually make the problem worse. Let's blur it larger. That's right. If we blur it, blur it larger, it should make it a little bit better. We're gonna blur it all the way over. Let's just blur it all the way with 100, 200. Cool. And we got one that's definitely not gonna be right. Uh, three is definitely not going to be our uh, thinnest, longest uh, thing. Uh, 845 doesn't feel right either. This is where it's occurring on the page. So we want to see really high. Um, it could be. That could be a really high footnote. Let's go ahead and see what it looks like, though. So we're going to stick with this and try and debug this a little further. Um, what am I doing? Oh, no, we don't need that. There we go. Cool. And let's go ahead and open this up now. Oh, I didn't draw my rectangle on it. There we go. See, now we've got some problems because it's drawing multiple lines. So we've got to change our width now to the thing that is even wider than 200. So let's say 300. And this produces more problems, but we probably got the right line there. Now on 36, we've got two that aren't working. So we can do a couple different things here. We can keep on playing around with these or set these aside for manual, uh, manual kind of checking. Uh, so we know also now that 968 is a perfectly common um, place for the footnote to appear. Uh, so that one isn't too scary. And so I'd imagine 85, let me print off the... print this off as well so I know which file to grab okay so these are gonna be the problem files it helps if I actually put the F string there there we go uh, so problem file 22 doesn't have anything let's go in with 22 it has grabbed that We'll figure that out in a second. Um, the other thing that I'm looking at when I look at this is I got this 845 one, which means that it's going to be super high up. And I think I've just grabbed the wrong file. There we go. That's that's what it is. So it's one um, down. Cool. So if I look at this, oh, that's right, because it comes after. 
So I know that that's a really high footnote. So what looked like a, a scary number to me because it was so uh, so low actually isn't uh, problematic at all. So we know that number 24 and 23 are causing issues. So let's see what's wrong with these. Oh, and this is this is great. This is great news. So these are actually not false positives or anything wrong. They're just pages that don't have a footnote at all. And I suspect if I go to 23, I'm going to see the same thing. So what I thought was actually a problem now is actually not a problem. It's the correct solution. So we got a, a question, it looks like. Sorry about that. I just saw it. Uh, make a, a very brief explanation uh, for the idea of finding contours. Sure. Um, so yeah, I'll try to keep these uh, replies to questions as we go through. So yeah, finding contours is a, a thing that you can do in OpenCV. And what you're trying to do is to use the dilated image form to identify structure. So if I go over here and I were to go to temp, and I think I kept it as, uh, what did I save it as? The dilated image, uh, sample.jpg. This is what it looks like. This is a dilated image. And uh, what we're trying to do is see where the dilation begins and ends. And so what we want to do is we want to ensure that our dilation, and let's go ahead and see what the, our, our change in this dilation actually did. Um, we're going to save this, and it'll now be the last page instead of that, that first one. This is what our dilation now looks like. So what we're trying to do here is we're using this dilation method to identify structure. And I, as a human, can actually look at this and very easily tell where the long, thin line is. It's right there. So if I were to pull up the last page, let's go to contours and pull up the last page and look at it side by side, there in fact is the long, thin line. And so what we're doing is we're using uh, a couple different methods of uh, OpenCV to actually uh, kind of dilate everything by a specific kernel size that is best suited to solving the problem at hand. There is only ever going to be one long, thin line. Uh, there's going to be a short, thin line if there are two letters on the same page. So I can tell you right now, just by looking at this as a human, that this page has two letters and they're separated right here. So this is going to be whatever letter is the second one on the page and everything up here might be the first one. So if we go back to our sample page, we do in fact see that's the case. And I didn't even know this. So 11 is up here and 12 is down here. We're going to probably, I didn't realize I could do this. This is actually going to make another problem a little easier. We're going to look for the th a, a short thin line and be able to use that to identify if a page has two letters. So I hope that's a a quick explanation for you, um, kind of just real quickly on how bounding boxes and contours kind of work and how we can use them to our advantage. So now that I know that this works, I can make a presumption that if there is no ROI on a page, that that means, or if there is no hit for this on a page, then that means that the, that the, the box that was found is, um, there, there's no footer on the page. So I can write some custom exceptions in based on that one simple rule that we've just discovered. But before we get to that, let's go ahead and just run this over everything. And we're gonna save a lot of stuff to disk, but it's really good just to make absolutely certain that everything that we're looking at is what we want it to be. And I'm gonna just get rid of that. Um, all right. And just because this was confusing, I'm gonna put this higher and just have a break in between. There we go. I can get rid of that. Cool. So we're going to iterate over everything. So we're just doing all images now without any. Oh, yeah, no worries. No worries. Happy to help. Uh, now we've got everything. And we've got a problem because we don't have the leading zero. We're going to ignore that for right now. This is what I was explaining earlier about the leading zero uh, presenting an issue. Let's go ahead and leave. This should be done fairly soon. Start looking at a couple of these. It's grabbing it. And again, I'm just kind of looking at everything in general, making sure that every page does in fact have one. And if this starts to be an issue, we could add some custom rules. It doesn't look like these ever appear at a lower distance than 800 pixels. So we could add an extra condition in that if it appears uh, below 100 pixels, then um, I don't know, then that could be another issue to consider. And for whatever reason, it's printing things off there we go. All right. So if we go down, everything is looking pretty good. I'm not seeing any occurrences right now that are below 800. And I'm not seeing a lot of exceptions, which is also good. So for example, 194. 
Now, if we use our heuristics that we kind of came up with, if I go to 194, I can make a guess, and hopefully I'm right, that 194 doesn't have a footer. And it does, but we have a very problematic footer. Um, this one is going to be ha giving us some issues. So, hmm, we need to think about how to solve that. And the reason why we're getting issues with this one is because this footer is very, very, very faint. Uh, let's keep on going. Again, I'm just looking at the exceptions. I saw one that said 500, so page 203. Well, just a very, very, very high footnote. So that's actually not a problem. That's a good one. So we know that footnotes can actually start much higher. I did not realize that. If we keep on going, all these numbers are looking good. We've got one at 269. So this is a great way I can just quickly kind of troubleshoot things. And what I might do is I might put any occurrence without a footer as an exception for manual validation or manual extraction of information. I think that's going to be what I do because I can't rely on this method to consistently presume that the absence of a footer is an indication that there's no footer versus just a, a really bad one, uh, or at least a, a poorly um, visible one, I should say. If we keep on going down, it's looking pretty good. Cool. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add a condition. So if main ROI, um, I'm going to say if main ROI equals is equal to that, then do this. So we're not going to write images to disk anymore. We're just going to, because we've already done that, we don't need to do it again. We can do this. And I am going to change this because this is bothering me. There we go. And the way it prints out above it, not below it. And we've got a problem if main ROI is equal to, oh, I deleted my extra quotation. So this will just tell us the instances where, where we have this problem. So we've got it on 23, but we mark 23 out as acceptable. And it looks like there's only a handful that we have to do some manual validation for. So out of 400 and something pages, we've got what? I mean, I can make a loop to count, but 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We've got 10 pages that we have to manually validate. I consider that a success because that means that I only have to draw these, our custom draw boxes for only 10 pages. That's a lot easier than having to go through and actually annotate everything. So cool. I'm happy with these heuristics. I can move on to the next part of the problem. So I can, I'm can. i going to use this exception. So we're going to say now if that is not equal to that, we want to So we're just going to print that list off so we know which ones are in need of manual validation. Why do I have an error there? There we go. So now, if the ROI is not equal to just that blank space, now what we're going to do is we're going to start writing some rules. Let's knock that down a little bit. And we're going to line up our contour images better so that they have a leading zero. It'll be important later on. But for right now, let's work on a solution that solves our problem at hand, which is going to be, again, we're going to just iterate over the first five. We're going to try and grab now our our body text. So we're going to use this output. Let me kind of go over what we're going to do real fast. We're going to use this output to draw a line. And we're going to say anything from here up, we're going to consider that what we want to keep. So let's go ahead and start doing that now. So anything that's above there. So let's say we know the main contour. We know the image. We don't want to draw a rectangle on it. So the ROI that we want to use is going to be an ROI that is, I should think this out, uh, the base ROI. So it's going to be zero with OK, let's, let's leave that as is for right now. All right, so we're going to say that we want to do a new ROI, main ROI. I uh, know I already called the variable that. ROI image is going to be equal to image. And we're going to use what we know about it. So we know that the main image is going to start at a 0y, which I think is height. And we're going to have that go all the way down until it gets to main 
ROI. And then we're going to grab the traditional uh, 0 to uh, whatever the image size is. So I think that might work. And then what we're going to do is we're going to save that as its own separate image. So I think what we can do, <laughs> I think what we can do is we can just save this extraction as an image, because I believe the ROI is the image just sub, uh, pulled out. So let's go ahead and try that. So we're gonna say cv 2im right, which I think I'm pretty sure is the right syntax here. Uh, we're gonna just do a temp and we're gonna drop this as extracted.jpg and that's gonna be our ROI image. And let's see if we got it. I didn't have to run it over all five. And it worked. Cool. <laughs> awesome. So that logic panned out. That, that's good news. Uh, now we've got our, our data extracted. Let's go ahead and um, let's write it as we would um, add in the I there. And let's kind of now go through and make sure all of our extracted rules that we just wrote out actually are correct. So we're going to do temp extracts are going to be that and we're going to add in a new folder because I don't want to do make directory. Cool. Uh, that looks good. And let's go ahead and run it over all five for right now. Shouldn't take too long. And we've got a problem. I don't have that temp. There we go. All right. Page 18 ends right there. That's what we want to see. Cool. All right. That's looking good. That's looking good. All right. It passed our first uh, kind of manual validation. So we've gotten the footnotes now extracted. So we know that it works on these first five. Let's go ahead and let it run over everything. I know I'm, I'm doing a lot here with regards to, and again, we got our exceptions being printed out. So it's going to do all of these except for the ones that actually have exceptions. And it's pretty quick. It's already halfway done. Again, it's also helpful that these things have been loaded in the memory already. I believe they sit in RAM when you're working with Jupyter Lab, and they sit there so we can kind of go back and quickly call them. I'm not entirely sure about that, but I think that is the case. So let's keep on going through. And we're at 462, it should be done, and it is. So we go to extracts. Let's grab some random ones. <clears throat> cool. <laughs> it worked. That was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. All right, that worked. Awesome. So first part of the problem is now solved. We've gotten the extracted main body text. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now comes the next part of the problem. The next part of the problem is going to be actually taking the extracted text and trying to get some kind of structured metadata out of it. So I think what I'm looking at are, are good enough results to go ahead and save outside of temp and start saving as our actual files. Let's see. Yeah. So I th we have a couple different things we need to do next. Let's go ahead and get this all put into like our actual data directory now. So I've got the l images pages. We're just going to drop it in there, I think. We never really got a chance to do that because we did Adobe images, and that's OK. So what we need to do now is just make sure we print this off correctly. We're going to do a little test to debug. We're going to say uh, new file is going to be equal to the file is going to be equal to Adobe Images. We're going to say um, file dot split. We're going to split it at that. Does it pop in as a backslash? I think it pops in as a backslash. I'm going to grab it at one and let's print off new file. And uh, letters copy blah, 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 blah. OK. Well, we can't use that. We're going to have to automatically write our own. So we're going to save this now to data. Where's my handy dandy little condition up here? Uh, all right, we're going to change that from X to Y. And we're going to or from X to I and we're going to change Y to um, let's just call it num. That's uh, new I why not? 
change that to I, that to I. We're going to change this to oop, new I. And we're going to drop this now into data. And we're going to drop it into images, pages. And we should extract it underscore new I. Let's run this and just make sure that our, our test works. We don't really care about that anymore. And we should go be able to go now to image pages, extracted 018, and it's on page 18. That's what we want to see. Excellent. And so I always find when I'm doing OpenCV or anything like this that it's good practice to, um, to go ahead and do these stages in different parts. So the first thing we're going to save is just this extracted image. So that means that if, if we make a mistake later on, we can go back and kind of start from a previous state. So we're going to save extracted images. The next thing that we're going to save is uh, the image without this stuff on the side, these, these numbers on the side. The next thing that we're going to save is the image with, uh, hopefully if we can, maybe get these out of the way as well. But then we're going to start actually saving the images that actually have the different components put aside. So if it consists of two letters, separate those out. If it consists of just one letter, separating that out, etc. But for right now, let's go ahead and make sure that this works. We're going to uh, just go ahead and run it on everything, and we should be all right. So I'm going to call these extracted underscore zero whatever. And again, our exceptions, page 23, page 24, not worried about those. And it's done, or it's really close to being done. Again, our exception of 194, page 146, 269, 294. And I think we have a couple in the 400s, and then it'll be done. So we should have all of our extracted main bodies ready in just a few seconds. 454, 462, and done. Excellent. So let's go ahead now and just scroll down. Jupiter Lab is a little delayed. I always find it's easier just to go back out of the directory and then pop back in. Let's go to page 481, which is that poem. And that one's not uh, grabbed correctly. We're going to have to figure out what happened there. But I think for the most part, we're going to be all right. We can write some rules also later on to identify if something was missed by our rules. I think pages with poetry might end up throwing more problems than we realize. And the reason for that is because its structure is different. So the way the contours will be drawn on a poetry page are going to be very different than how they're drawn on a prose page or a page that would look something like this. But for at least all of our prose pages, we were able to capture things this way we want to see them. And if we want to figure out if something is a poetry page, when we start going through an OCRing, we can write rules. We can say if there are only like 10 words on a line, then that's probably poetry. Uh, if we see that consistently throughout an entire page. Uh, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But for right now, mission accomplished on separating the footer out. Let's go ahead and close all these. All right. Let's go ahead and start now on a new cell, because this whole Jupyter book is going to be for the first page of the part of the problem, which is getting the actual data into raw text. We're not there yet. So now we need to create uh, new files. We're going to call these, well, let's just call them files again. It doesn't matter. So files is going to be equal to glob.glob. Yeah, let's extract it. Files. It's going to be equal to glob.glob. .glob, and we're going to grab uh, data backslash images pages backslash images. I spelt it wrong. No, I didn't. There we go. Yeah, I did. There we go images, pages, and we're going to grab anything that is a .jpg. Cool. Now we've got that saved. So what we're going to do now is save for file and extracted files. And remember, we're going to always start off with just the first page and kind of debug some stuff. So we can copy and paste a lot of our code from up here. We're not going to worry about that for right now. For right now, let's just kind of grab uh, this bit right here. It's not good practice to copy and paste, but because we're trying to do this quickly, and this isn't polished final code, we're not too concerned about it. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the same process that we just did. But remember, when we change the kernel size, the dilation of the page is a little different. The dilation of the page will be dictated by the, um, the, 
the way in which we structure the kernel. So instead of doing long and thin for right now, I want to find something that's tall and thin. Thin in the sense of its uh, vertical sense. So it'll be a very thin line. You'll see why in just a second. Let's make these opposite. Uh, instead of 200, I'm going to do just for right now, eh, I'll do 200, why not? So it's going to be a very thin, tall line. And so let's draw just a, a quick rectangle on it. And uh, let's save that. Um, rectangle for CN. All right, cool. And then we're going to do CB2. Dot I am right. We're going to save it into temp. And we're going to save it into numbers. Dot JPEG. So our goal in here is to get rid of the things on the right hand side of the page. And we've got an error. Fantastic. Oh, yep. Yeah, that's my fault. Image. There we go. Now it should work. Dot temp. And we're looking for numbers.jpg. So it didn't work. We weren't able to grab any structure that was, oh, it's because I had this as a rule. So if the width is greater than 300, so let's first just draw every line that matches our kernel size, all right? That'll give us a good sense. Okay, all right, cool. So we achieved this exactly what we want. We have tall, thin structures identified. This is great. And it means, again, I can write my rule and grab and separate out all of these lines on the right. I don't want these. These do not bear any use to me in a digital edition. I don't care where the line's at. Nobody today cites the MGH, references the specific line, at least never that I've seen. These were irrelevant. They were very useful in the uh, 19th century, but not so useful for me today. One thing I have to be careful of, because I'm going to write rules later on, I know, is I want to be careful that I preserve these dashes. I never want to lose a dash, because that's going to allow me to say, whenever there is a dash followed by a line break, make a presumption that that is a, uh, a word jointed together. We'll see that in a little bit. But I need to get rid of all of these uh, these numbers on the right. And it looks like this rule might actually work pretty well already, which means I can add a, a condition in. I can say, um, if the width is now less than, let's say, less than, let's say less than 15, and the height is greater than, um, I don't know, it doesn't even really matter to be honest, because there's only gonna be one thing with that thin of a width, but just to be safe, just to be safe, let's say the, the height is greater than 50. I don't know if that's going to be enough to catch everything, but we'll try it right now. And it's not. We had a problem. So we've got the thinness correct. No, we don't have the thinness correct. I think we have the thinness a little, a little too small. Let's try 30. Close that. Open it back up. Cool. All right. So we've got the width now. Probably we can probably go a little bit bigger with the width if I'm being totally honest. Let's try it one more time. We're gonna grab more stuff, but you're gonna see why that's not a problem in just a second. Okay, cool. Let's grab that thing up at the top. We're gonna get rid of that, don't worry. That's that's a highly problematic thing for OCR purposes. But that's an easy solve. Alright, so we know that the width needs to be about 50, or at least something less than 50. Now we're going to make the height 200. And the reason why this is prob oh, that didn't work. We need to go a little taller. That's interesting. We're going to make the height equal to 500. Now that should definitely, definitely do it. Cool. And I can be pretty confident. <laughs> I probably shouldn't be, but I can be pretty confident that this is going to work on every page, mainly because of the fact that the uh, the height uh, these numbers are always going to appear in the exact same structure on every single page so what i can do is i can go through and have kind of that same condition so let's save this and temp to uh, numbers make that i we'll do this i equals zero i equals i plus one and we'll make that an f string and then we'll say we'll do the same exception that we wrote up above try to find the ones where the 
where this doesn't happen. Uh, and we're gonna print off here. Uh, data, no, we're gonna do temp. We're gonna do numbers. And then we're going to do uh, numbers like that. It doesn't really matter. Do I, again, we're not too concerned about the condition right now. We'll change that later. And we are interested in any instance where this is not right. And there we go. So we're interested in any case where that occurs. We're not going to really worry so much about printing them off just yet. Let's see how many exceptions we actually have to this rule. Um, let's let it run over everything. And I think that's going to be all right for us. And this, in this instance, we're not so much concerned about the Y as we are concerned about the X, because the Y told us the height of the item. The X is going to tell us the, the place where the, the box starts on a horizontal plane. So let's go ahead and run that now. And it looks like we have a lot of exceptions here. So this is, eh, these are manageable at this stage. This is a manageable number of exceptions. And now it's starting to get a little annoying. So we need to write some rules out. Let's go ahead and save these exceptions to, to disk so we can actually kind of take a look at them. We need I to start at 18. It's gonna make it a lot easier for us to 18. Um, okay. Oh, that's, that's why. Oops. Stop. <laughs> there we go. All right, so it looks like extracts numbers is where I'm going to go. And I need to comment that out. And let's make a new one right now called, we're going to call it the exceptions folder. Again, this is all in our temps, uh, temp area. So let's call this exceptions. And we'll print that off there. So we should be good now. I think it'll only print off the handful of exceptions that we have. And we can get a sense of what's happening. So if we go to exceptions, uh, we've got page 19. Again, this is why you need the leading zero. It's found one. I don't know why we've got a problem. Ah. I didn't think about this. Uh, sometimes the line goes isn't going to be all that long because in some instances the footer is going to be deleted really high up on the page so the line might not be the full length that you would expect. Hmm. This makes me wonder now if maybe the first step should be to actually try to get rid of the numbers on the on the right hand column first. And so this is an example of a page where I guess the whole page was a footer. I'll have to go back and check on that. Okay. What is happening here now? Hmm. So these are understandable exceptions. Let's go through and understand why these are coming up the way that they are in order to actually get rid of them. So this one makes sense because it's an instance where two letters are separated. So the break is really large between these two contours, which means I need to make the bleeding happen at a lot larger kernel size than I originally intended. I can do that, uh, but some of these other exceptions are kind of interesting. So this is important. This means that I need to actually write these two rules out in a different order where I have the numbers coming first and extract what happens to the left and then have a rule that extracts what happens to the right. Because if I had to guess, um, let me find the contour one. If I had to guess, yeah, this is always going to be the longest thinnest line and it's never gonna come all the way out to the numbers. So it's not gonna affect my rule for finding the longest thinnest line. It will, however, affect the numbers, all right. Okay, cool. So let's do this now in a reverse order. So we're going to add uh, this right here. And this is going to be grabbing, keep these straight. 
Adobe files. So we're going to iterate over the Adobe files first, and we're going to save the extracted numbers. Let's do that. And see if we have any exceptions now. And we're going to do the blurring. We're going to learn from our mistake, and we're going to make the blurring um, a bit more prevalent. I don't know what this is going to do. Let's do a first sample test to make sure that this is going to work. So I've loaded that in. And um, let's save this to temp numbers. We're going to go to temp numbers. We've already got one in there. Let's make a new subfolder. We're going to call this just Adobe test. OK, cool. Uh, well, that's not good. That's not what I wanted. Hmm. Oh, that's why. We don't want that. Uh, so that will be all right. We're going to just save the image with the rectangle on it. All right, let me close all these now. Again, this is why we kind of do this. We troubleshoot things that pop up. This should be a lot better now. Cool, so that's worked. Let's see if there's any exceptions now when we run over everything. We won't save anything to disk. We're just gonna try to write out the exceptions and then we'll worry about if, if we have to actually examine them, then we'll write something out to disk. Uh, we're gonna say if main ROI is equal to that, then do that. It's going over everything. Cool. I don't see any exceptions popping up, which is a good sign, which means this is the correct way in which we should do this, solve this problem. So we need to extract the numbers first, and then we're going to worry about um, extracting the um, the actual body text second. Great. We have no exceptions. I think this is going to be an acceptable solution. So we have to do the kind of the inverse now. So now we're going to say that if that's the case, we need to get the ROI image. And our ROI image in this case is going to be the X side. So we need to go from zero to the main ROI, as opposed to uh, from zero on the uh, on the Y before. We're doing it on the X plane. So let's go ahead and see if this actually works. Um, so we're going to Adobe test. Yeah, we'll keep it in Adobe test. Let's add in our, our little rule for our hanging, our leading zero. Um, I is 18. All right, I'm happy with everything there. Uh, we're going to put that all in Adobe test. Let's do a quick test just to make sure this runs the way we want it to. Cool. Oh, and it's a good thing we did that because I did this backwards. So we need to go. Uh, all right. So I've grabbed the opposite side of this. We don't want to draw the rectangle either. So I've grabbed the opposite side. So we know that where X is, I think I need to go from main ROI to zero, is that right? Let's find out. What am I doing wrong? All right, it's probably gonna be the same. No, no, okay, good. I don't know what I did wrong then before, let's see. Hmm. This isn't good. So there is an exception happening. I need to understand what that exception is. So I need to draw that rectangle on 19 so that I can understand why 19 is presenting an issue. Um, so I'm gonna draw all the bounding boxes on to image and we're just gonna save image for right now. And we're gonna see what's happening with image number 19. My suspicion is that there are two lines and one of them is on the left. And in fact, it is. Ah, so on left-handed pages, the numbers are going to be on the left. On even pages, so I guess if I did 21, we would see the same thing. And we do. Okay. 
Okay, cool. I hadn't thought about that. So our, this is going to switch back and forth. So we can now write an exception. And if I is is even, then do one set of rules. If I is um, odd, do another. Okay. And we also have a problem because this is popping up. So we need to make our, uh, let's set our height to, I'm kind of nervous to set it really high, to be honest, um, because it might not get everything. Uh, let's see though. And it looks like this worked. Cool. All right. Uh, I really don't want to do that because we might have exceptions, but it looks like it might be all right. Cool. All right. So now we need to write a, a, another rule. So we're going to have to do a little fun trick here. So if you don't know how to do this, this is how you determine if a number is, um, in this case, even or odd, but you can do this with anything. So you're going to say if I um, divided by with a uh, by two equals zero. So if I, when uh, divided by two, uh, equals zero. So you're saying if, when I is divided by two, if the remainder is equal to zero, then do that. And that means that it's even. Else, this is where math actually comes in for this. Uh, so else we're gonna do the opposite rule. So we're gonna say start at main ROI and then go to zero. I think this will work. Let's give it a go. So our even, let's grab it on that side. Good. Oh. And then it helps also if you write the ROI. And we're going to get rid of that rectangle for right now. We don't really need it. And we got a problem. Let's make sure I did this right. Uh, print I. Cool. OK. So now we need to go from, oh, we got to get rid of the zero, not two zero, because we're trying to go backwards in that setup. Now we're going to be going from ROI to the end. And see how it's only printed off our even numbers? We should be good now. And uh, 19 hasn't done what we wanted it to do. Ah, because we have to also pass in not just the R, X, but also the width. So X is going to be equal to... Uh, we're going to set the ROI equal to X and W. And then in this case, we're going to grab just the zero. And then in this case, we're going to say zero. There's a better way to do this, but I'm going to write it out this way for right now. ROI plus ROI one. So that's going to give us both the X where it starts and the width. So if we add those two together, we'll get the... Uh, we'll get the right side as uh, as opposed to the left side, which is what we were getting there. So let's try that out, see if that works. Fingers crossed. Success. Cool. So now we've got the numbers extracted. That was our big problem last time, was we, we couldn't extract the numbers when we had the body extracted first. Ah, so we've got a question. I'm just going to be live streaming this for 48 hours, actually. Uh, thanks for the question. So there's not really a first video. I'm doing this one a little differently. Uh, the idea is to take you from beginning to end for a digital humanities project. So everything from acquiring the data to altering the data to cleaning the data to eventually implementing a front end user uh, interface. So I think there's like a link in the description down below or there's a description down below where you can kind of see the, uh, the general workflow of the 48 hour video that I'm streaming right now. So uh, we've got that solved. We've got uh, our odd and even pages treated differently and everything looks good. Now comes the fun time of just letting it run over everything and kind of hoping for the best. We can get rid of this I because we know that that rule is always going to work. Let's go ahead and just get rid of it entirely. Um, we don't need to draw the rectangle. I think we're going to be okay with that 800. We'll have to see. There might be some exceptions that pop out now, but I'm not entirely sure. Let's find out first if there are any. If there are, they'll be printed off. So far, it's looking pretty good. Cool. Should only take a few more minutes for everything to pop in. And we don't have an exception yet. And if these are all looking really good, I'm going to go ahead and rerun this so that these are preserved in the outside of the temp folder.
actually preserved in the, the main data folder. The temp folder is always used for when you're doing experiments to make sure things work. And it's done. So we've got all of these pages now. Let's just pick a couple at random. Cool. No numbers on the right. That's an even one. Let's check out the odd. No numbers on the left. This is a good day. <laughs> awesome. Uh, what? Oh, yeah, I did that because I didn't have a leading zero for some reason. Why didn't I? Ah, I got to put new I in here. Well, whatever. I wasn't going to I have to rerun this anyway. Cool. Use that and the else. Why not put that there as well? Cool. Um, I think we're good then. So I'm going to do this now, not in my temp folder anymore. I'm going to add this to um, make a new folder called number extracted. And we're going to call this uh, data number extracted data. And what's good about this is that I don't think I have any instance where this rule didn't work. At least I hope not, which is going to make iterating over over these files now a little easier. So let's go ahead and execute that. And we're dropping everything now into our, our main data subfolder where everything is going to actually be stored. So fingers crossed that, that works. <laughs> We've been going for two hours now, it looks like. So we started at 6 a.m. Eastern time. It's now 8 a.m. And we've already gotten a lot of success uh, with this project. We were able to actually get the first major step for performing clean OCR uh, done, which was extracting the numbers on the right-hand side and the footer from the bottom. And when we run this next bit of code, which is going to now iterate over all of our um, all of these files, which are going to be, let's call these the number extracted X files. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, glob dot glob. We're going to grab all of those from the data uh, number extracted subfolder. And we're going to grab everything that is a .jpg. And that's going to be what we iterate over now down here. Let's make sure that this is done. It is. Numbers extracted. It should be a leading zero. Cool. And let's just grab a random even number. Good and a random odd number. Good. And I can tell that I'm going to have a little bit of uh, an issue of de-skewing, uh, which is when I'm going to have to kind of adjust this um, this a little bit in order for the OCR to perform better on pages like this, where we've got some skewing. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. I'm just kind of making mental notes to myself for things that I might have to do later on. So let's create this new set of files, which are going to be our number X files. So we're going to iterate over our number X files. And this is our same code that we wrote just a few minutes ago. Now we can actually do this in this order and everything should still work. I think I would be shocked if I don't want to say shocked. I'm hoping that I don't have the same exceptions. I'm hoping that I have the same exceptions that I had before. So 23, 24, 133, all the way down. I'm going to run this again and iterate over all these files now and kind of just hope for the best. So let's see 23, 24, 40. We've added a couple new ones in. Um, this might require a couple of different tweaks. If it stays under like 20, I'm not too concerned about it, but I'm going to go ahead and start printing off these images so I can kind of get a sense and temp. Let's go there. We're going to go into temp and we're going to print off exceptions to call that exceptions to there's not a lot. So if I have to make an exception for each of these, it's not the end of the world. I can do it. Um, so we're going to do that, but we're going to write it down here and we are going to comment that out and we're going to say, uh, temp backslash exceptions two. All right. And we just want to get a sense of why these are, are, be are being exceptions. So what's happening here. And we know in this case, it's because there isn't a long thin line. We're okay with that. In this case, I think it was the same. So 23 and 24 aren't really issues. Uh, what's going on here is I don't really know why that's a problem. It shouldn't be. It's extracted the footer the way we wanted it to. And the same thing there. Uh, 
I'm writing the ROI down. Let me try writing the main image and see what happens. Let's make sure this is done running first, and it is. Because it looks like what was once a problem is now not so much of an issue anymore. Gotta close these so that I can reopen them. So those ones we knew, 23 and 24 just didn't have footers. We knew that. What's going on with 40? I don't understand the problem here because it actually worked correctly on 40. The ROI that we grabbed was right. Hmm. Most peculiar. Uh, one zero six four is a blank page. So it was an earlier question. Are there any blank pages? Uh, there shouldn't be. Uh, what we happened on one six zero six four is a problem with our number. So we can do that. We can write these, find these exceptions when we start doing the OC, uh, OCR. Hello. Welcome. Uh, so what we're trying to do right now is figure out rules for uh, separating this footer out. We've already got it kind of got it solved. Um, I don't think this is going to be too much of an issue. Uh, so what I'm going to do is write an exception. So ROI, in this case, it's going to be an ROI image. And then I'm going to add a little tack onto here so that I can image pages extracted. Okay, so if there's a underscore none, that's gonna be how I, uh, I handle the exception. I'm not entirely sure if it's going to be that big of an issue, to be honest. Okay, so let's run this. And we should have these 10 exceptions kind of popping out as we would expect. And, oh, nope, I need to rerun this. Stop. There we go. I need to make sure that these are written to the same directory. Now, the reason for doing this is so that I can still continue to work with, so there might be, like, maybe this method doesn't work on extracting the footer. What I can do is I can use this, uh, use that data. So even if I can't extract the footer, I can still go through and try to do the next steps that are going to come after on those images. And they shouldn't, they might, they might not be exceptions. I can tack on, so I'm tacking this little bit of, of information on the end there. So I can remember which ones are the exceptions later on. And I can write rules to capture them. So these are all going into images underscore pages. And we see 23 and 24 both being the exceptions, but I know having already looked at these that they're exceptions for um, for no good reason. Uh, they can be processed the same way, same way that we will with everything else. And then we've got uh, 25 right there. That's looking good. And there might be a couple pages where the rules I wrote for numbers didn't work correctly and it's going to be a blank page. Uh, when I OCR, if I get the results back and everything's blank, I'll know at that stage that there's a problem that I need to go back and do some manual validation on. And for that stage, I can just go back and manually save in the page. I think that the idea here is to minimize the amount of manual work that you have to do and automate a lot of it. So if I can automate everything for all 400 pages or 480 pages and just do a manual validation on what is this like 10, 12, 13, that's, that's considered a success to me. So now all of my data in images underscore pages is going to be exactly what I want to see, which is a bunch of uh, data where the numbers on the left have been removed and the footers on the bottom have also been removed. Now comes the next stage. In order to OCR this, I really, really need to try and capture uh, this main body text. It'll make for better OCR. There's going to be a couple problems, I think, going forward. If we look on page... I think it's maybe page 19 I saw this. Yeah, we've got cases where the main body of the page could could 
have two letters on it. Again, you don't need to know Latin here. It doesn't matter. We've got letter number three and letter number two, and there's going to be this big gap in between. It means that when I try to do a bleeding with the kernel, I need to make sure that it's a little extra large horizontal. Uh, and I'm not too concerned about the width, uh, uh, sorry, extra long vertical, but I need to make sure that the width is, is still small because when I do it, my goal is to bleed all of this data here into a single page. And I'm not too concerned about preserving the page up here because the page number is preserved in my file name. So what I'm gonna be concerned with is trying to separate all of this data out here and saving these as separate files. So I wanna save, this is Judith 13.7, which is pretty cool because um, the book of Judith isn't actually quoted that often. And I didn't realize that Alcuin actually uh, quoted or cited Judith here. Um, my point is, is that we want to preserve this metadata. This is very, very useful stuff. And we want to preserve also the location that it's actually located on the page. Oh, looks like we had a comment. Uh, hi, Ian. I mean, I had no idea it was uh, doing this so early in the morning. I need to have a coffee to wake up. Should we go? Cool, cool, cool. Uh, it should be recorded. I think after all this is done, it gets automatically saved to YouTube. Uh, sounds good. So he's going to watch later. All right. So let's keep on moving forward. So we've got this now in a pretty good format. We've got 773, as we would expect. And we've also gotten... Um... Okay, cool. So... Let's try to remove, I think, let's try, this is going to be the final step before OCR, I believe. So I'm going to just try and remove, remove this side column and preserve them. And then I think the, the best course of action is going to be to save them into two different places. So final images and final images scripture. Uh, it's not always going to be scripture, but it, there's a good chance that it can be. If this method doesn't work, I can write a rule with the, uh, when I extract the OCR and I can write a rule that's going to look for any occurrence of CF period, followed by, um, some abbreviation, followed by a number, followed by a comma, followed by a number. I, I can capture these in the OCR, I think without an issue using regex. But if I don't have to do that, if I can write a rule to separate it out here, that's the better course of action. Okay, so we know where the, what we're going to do now. At least I think we do. So uh, we've got... What's all this here? Extracted files. I forgot where I was at. So we're going to just comment that out for right now. Comment that out. Let's go ahead and do that and do that. Okay. So I'm concerned now with this images underscore pages uh, backslash extracted, right, this subfolder right here. So let's scroll down now. And I'll be pushing all this to GitHub at some point so you can kind of uh, look at the code. This is, the whole point of this is to be well documented so you can kind of see beginning to end of a digital humanities project. And hopefully the video is being saved so that we can kind of post this on YouTube and everyone kind of follow along for the 48 hours. So let's go ahead and uh, final, we're going to call this our uh, main um, image, uh, image files. Why not we just call it that? It's going to be equal to glob.glob. .glob. Let's paste that in, and we're going to look for anything that is a .jpg. Now, we know that we've got two different kinds of files, one where the footer was able to be grabbed and one where it wasn't. We're going to try to preserve that bit of notation as we move forward. So we're going to say for file and image files, and again, image files, we're going to be able to preserve a lot of what we've already written. So we had success with this bit of code for capturing our numbers. Let's go ahead and just steal that and bring it on down. And cool. All right. So let's go ahead and comment this out just for right now. So draw the tri or the uh, rectangle again. And we're going to just grab the first page. Again, we're just debugging right now. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to, let's comment that out too. And then we're going to comment that out. 
So what we're going to do is we are going to say cv2 to I am right, and we are going to write out the, let's put it into another temp folder, or let's just do, since it's our main one, we're going to just say temp test um, final image dot, dot JPEG, and we're going to write the image down. We have the image being drawn there. All right, cool. Let's run that and let's go out of the temp folder and pop back in final image. So what we're kind of capturing now or trying to capture is going to be these things in this case on the left. So again, we have the same problem that we have with the numbers. We're going to have to write an exception for even and odd number pages because this is going to be the opposite for them on, it looks like uh, even pages, they'll be on the left on odd pages. They'll be on the right. So let's think about that now. So what we want to do is we want to have a kernel size that is going to be uh, long and thin. We're looking for anything that has a width of less than 50. This probably needs to change. Uh, let's just change this to 150 right now and see if that works. And the height equal to 800. I think the height's going to be too big. And I'll tell you why right now. I think that the way the kernel is going to be bleeding is these aren't going to be caught every time. So let's just let's just not even worry about the right kernel size right now and just do this or the right uh, condition so we can kind of see what we're grabbing so we're not doing a good job of separating the main body from this right here we need to do a better job at that so we have to change our kernel size a little bit this is probably too extreme but let's change this to to one so we're gonna try to change the width a little bit make it a little smaller cool now we're grabbing it. So we've grabbed that right there. We don't, ah, these are going to be a problem. Uh, we're going to have to write some exceptions in a little bit more uh, exceptions because we need to make sure the width is of a certain width. Like, in, uh, so it's got to be at least uh, X wide, but it also needs to be at most X wide. We'll have to write that in in just a second. Uh, so we don't grab these things. And this is why I'm not, wasn't too concerned about the BSE up there. When we do this for even pages, that'll be gone. When we do it for odd pages, it won't be, but it sh at least it shouldn't be an issue because we can just make the image a little shorter. But for right now, we're not going to worry about it. Always better to work with more data because the more data you have, the more rules you can write. So that, that little bit of, of problem might come in handy later on for doing something. Probably won't. So I think we're looking all right here. Okay, um, let's now start writing a rule. Okay, so if the width, we wanna make sure that the width is less than a certain number and the width is greater than, let's say, let's say 20. And the height is 800. I think 800 is gonna be too big. We'll find out. Okay, cool. So we are going to have some pages, I would suspect. I don't know this to be the case, but I suspect we're going to have some pages that are um, that are going to be not have any scriptural quotations. So we have to think about a way to handle those exceptions. So one of the things we could do, now thinking about that problem out loud, is that probably will occur. <laughs> so rather than trying to solve the problem then, we can kind of think about this problem on the inverse side. So let's close this once again. Let's get rid of this exception one more time. We're going to go back and we're going to write these rules now or not any, there's no, I mean, no conditions. And we're going to notice that we are able to always get the main body without a problem. So what if we don't worry about capturing the small one right now? We just worry about capturing the main body. And then what we can do is once we capture the main body, we can separate these out and save them in two different fold or directories. And then we can write a rule for capturing this separately. I think that's the route that I'm going to go because I know there's always going to be a main body on an image. There's not always going to be these scripture things on the left. So let's do that. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save two different things now. So I need to keep, keep track of this. So we're going to have two different ROIs. This is going to be how we identify our first ROI. Actually, no, we just need to identify the main body. So we don't need for the width to have a minimum length. If the width is greater than greater than 150, 
and the height is, uh, we know that sometimes the height isn't going to be 800. Let's just set it up as 500. And let's see what that looks like. We should have only grabbed this one, and we have. So this is good. We've grabbed just the body. Now, I want to keep all of this metadata here. Uh, I want to keep, I don't really care about the page number, but I want to keep this right here. I want to keep that right there for right now. I want to keep as much of that as possible because I can use that output to generate some rules on when we change letters as we go through an OCR everything. So when I see a, a, a alkaline epistoli followed by a number, followed by a period, I'll know that that is actually going to be uh, uh, the change of a letter in this edition. This is going to allow me to automate the structuring of these letters on a letter by letter basis, not on a page by page basis, which is how most people would want to read these letters. So let's kind of go through and think about this problem just one more time. We've got the, we've got the box drawn. So we know that this works. What we want to know is if the main ROI is still nothing, then these are the exceptions that we need to look at. So let's see if there are any. There might not be. This might be a good enough rule to kind of just capture everything for us. So let's uncomment all that out. <clears throat> so we don't care about this right now. We care about the exceptions. Um, and then we're gonna just ask it to tell us what numbers are the exception. So let's just make sure that that didn't show up anything for that. And it did, why? Numbers underscore 490. Hmm, what's going on here? So we've got that done. Oh, that's why. It's using the ROI from the from the last loop when we were up there. Okay, so main ROI is going to be equal to that. Now it should fix that. Cool. That's fixed. Now let's just let it run over everything. We don't see anything pop up. We might be all right. We'll do, need to do some manual tests. But okay, so we got an exception for one for five fifty six thirty nine. What is happening here? These numbers are confusing to me. Ah, I know what happened. I never reset. I. <laughs> so there will be some set exceptions that we know. Of. We can go ahead and look at those, but let's see how many there are. So page 48 is going to be an exception. We can look and figure out why, probably by just examining these. My suspicion is, is 48 might be a, some of these might be a blank page. So something that was missed in the, in the uh, numbers extraction. So it looks like it's done. We only have four exceptions. Now let's look at these exceptions. Let's write them to uh, to disk. We're going to call these exceptions uh, three, and let's make that now. Probably not the best naming practice, but it works. I, I'm pretty happy if there's only a handful of exceptions. Again, I, I think I made this clear before. Poetry it was going to present a problem, and we see that actually panning out right now. Um, the reason why this is presenting a problem is because the width is going to be different. Now, having seen this, I can make a reasonable guess, a reasonable guess, and this shouldn't be 481. Something's happening here. I got to figure out what, uh, but that's the wrong page number. These are all page 481. So what is it doing? It's not iterating over the files correctly. Image files. Ah, that's why. I didn't write new I. There we go. Now it should be all right. Let's go ahead and delete these. Uh, where is that? Uh, delete. Cool. I think that should be all right. Huh, we still have 41 for all of these. So something is amiss here. I have to go now into my data image, uh, image pages to figure out what's happening. 43. So something's happening within this area where for file, Oh, 
Oh, that's why. I'm not saving my image here. I'm saving the ROI. There we go. It's always something simple when you have to debug something. So let's go back. Let's stop this. Let's now save it. It was saving the ROI, and the last time I used ROI was in this. So it was always grabbing that last item. Now we're going to be able to see the exceptions pan out probably more accurately, or definitely more accurately. But again, we only have a few. So page 48, blank page. It's a blank page. It's a blank page. It's a blank page. So these were the four mistakes from our numbers OCR. So let's put these to the side. We can remember these as being the, the, the ones that we got to watch out for because these are going to be the ones that we have to manually go back and OCR or uh, uh, manually kind of go through and grab the, the correct bounding boxes for them. But again, we only have four exceptions that we have to do this for. And this step was really useful then for grabbing that. So what we need is we need two different ways to handle this problem. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to know where we can take the information that we have and we can make sure that the ROI image is going to be where the bounding box starts. So where it starts on the X pl uh, pane, plane. And we need to know also its width. So we can say X to X plus width. That's going to grab us the, the bounding box for when it's a... Um, Actually, it's going to grab us the bounding box regardless for um, if it's a uh, if it's a left page, so if it's even, or if it's a right page, so it's odd. That's going to work no matter what. So we need to make sure that this is changed from ext uh, final images, I think is what I have in my data folder now, final underscore images. So again, we're going to stick with that idea of if two is uh, odd, then do that. If it's even, then do that. Okay, so we've got this kind of exception written in. Now it's time to think about uh, trying to capture that X. And again, I'm talking out loud right now, kind of thinking through this problem. So if we want to grab where the bounding box begins, X to X plus width, it's gonna grab it on the width pane. Then this is gonna need to be main ROI, zero, plus main ROI, one. Okay, so that's gonna be the X and the width. Now I'm not too concerned about the height here. So I'm gonna start at the highest point and just work its way all the way down. Because I'm again, I'm trying to grab all of that data. So this should work. I don't think this is gonna matter whether it's odd or even. Because if we look at our, where, where are these coming from? Data, images, pages. If we look at our even page, it's gonna grab the bounding box around everything here. If you look at the odd page, it's gonna do the same thing. So I think we're gonna be okay. I think we're gonna be okay. We don't really need to write that exception in if it's even or odd. I'm gonna comment that out for right now. I might need it, so I'm gonna keep it there just in case. Um, again, we're going to do a small test, a small test up to five. And if it works up to five, then we can talk about maybe it being used all the way through. Final images. We started this at zero. We need to start it at 18. So let's go ahead and fix that mistake right now. And we go back, final images, 18. All right. So I notice a problem. It didn't do the entire height correctly. Or did it? No, it did not. So something's happening with my ROI. Let's see. We don't want the rectangle being drawn. So I'm doing the, the width correctly, but for whatever reason, the height is presenting an issue. So I've got the width. Let's go ahead and run this now, just to see. Get rid of that. We shouldn't see a bounding box anymore, but the, the bottom part's getting cut off and I'm not entirely sure why. 
So we've returned the x and we returned the w. That's the only two pieces of information that we need, right? Oh no, it's not. It's the, uh, the y that we need. So we need the y. See how that looks. Hmm. So we need to know where it starts, the bounding box. Oh, it is the x and the width. So the x is going to be the main ROI x. It's going to be the first position. Width is going to be the second. So it's going to go, you know, let's just do this now. So I'm going to go RIX. Two. ROI X plus ROI width. So we're going to grab the actual width of everything. So wherever it begins to where it ends, but for whatever reason, I must be doing something wrong. I'm grabbing the, uh, the Y, the height. Maybe I am thinking about this backwards. Here, let's do this. Oh, I am. There we go. Now it should work. All right, let's close that. Now I think this will look better. Yay, that's what it's supposed to look like. So we've gotten rid of those scriptural notations on the left. So now we've got everything looking a lot better. Now we have got no numbers, we've got no scripture, so we're doing good. Now in this case, I'm not too concerned about all that extra white space. So I could actually make sure that the ROI returns not just the, the width, but I could also make it return the height and the, uh, eh, I think I'll leave that for right now. I can, because sometimes the, the body might be quite short or there might be those instances where we have two letters on a page. And I'm worried that if these letters are too far spaced apart, if they won't be grabbed. And notice here, we've got something not working right for us there. So I am gonna have to write the exception for the left and right notation because the way in which we go, go from left to right is going to be different. So let's go ahead and do that. I was wrong about not needing it. So this is how it's going to work for an even page. We got the even page working correctly. We don't have the odd page working correctly, which is going to work the exact opposite way. So we're going to make sure we grab that information. And so for the odd page, let's look and see what happens. So an even page, it's going to be going from left to right, so the the body's going to be that way. For the odd page, oh no, yeah, for the odd page, hmm, looks like it's just an exception. So we have to adjust our parameters, our bleeding, because for whatever reason, this odd page isn't being grabbed correctly. It's not separating that scripture out. So I'm not sure if you can make a kernel size smaller than one. Let's try it. Yeah, it has to be at least a one. I got the iterations as low as possible. Hmm. So for this page, the the scripture is actually bleeding over a little bit. And I'm not able to grab it safely because it's bled, bled into the structure of the main body. I think that's the result of the skewing. Let's see how, how many pages turn out that way. Let's just do it on everything right now. There's a lot. I don't know how to write an exception in to know when that happens. I can, however, know when that happens on the OCR output. If I see an output that has a occurrence of some kind of scriptural reference, I can make sure that I 
write an exception in so I know how to handle that one differently. Let's go through and just make sure that this works first and see how many odd examples that we actually do have. And again, these are the four exceptions that we saw when we did a test run over all this a little, a few minutes ago. All right, and it's done. Let's go in. So we know that 19 was a problem. Um, let's kind of just pick some other ones at random. Okay, this is gonna be a problem here. So I gotta really think about this solution. I might need to be thinking about, uh, eh, it's actually, so it didn't happen here either. So it's definitely there's some mistakes occurring. I, um, maybe it's uh, something I can change when I change the, or fine tune the parameters for how I'm blurring this image. That might help. Uh, we can find out there. So if we do the Gaussian blur a little smaller, this might actually result in, this is gonna require a lot of fine tuning though. So we know that one of our exceptions was number 19. So let's just do the first three. So the blurring affects uh, the way the kernel is actually structured. Cool, and the blurring trick seemed to work. My concern now is that I've played with one of my parameters. Is it going to result in poor... That looks good. That's actually supposed to be there. I remember this page being a problem before when I was looking at this. So that's good. That's good. We've got a page with a footer now. Uh, Oh, this is one of those exceptions I think I had. Cool, 41, 70. And we've got some page alignment issues because this is on 68 and this is telling me that it's 70. So something's amiss here. So for whatever reason, page 40 is duplicated. I'm not sure why that's the case. Shouldn't be. So 40 is appearing on both 40 and 41. Then 42 becomes that, and it ticks up differently. All right, so something's happened at some stage that's led to these numbers being off. Because if I go all the way down, I'll know how often that it actually happens. So 487, um, I deleted the page number there. So 486, so it happens quite a few times. So in order to actually maintain these page numbers, I was really reliant on the file name containing that. So something is occurring. So let's look and see if we can find these exceptions. Where has it occurred? image pages. Oh, this is why it's happening. Okay, this is not a problem. Uh, because when they're skipped, they don't get written this way. Okay, so I think I can save this then. So what we're going to do is we are going to make sure that the exceptions are also written in there. But we're going to have an additional A little extra tag there. And so what this is going to do is it's going to make sure that that problem that we're seeing doesn't surface with duplicate pages being written twice. I think that was the issue. I don't know for certain. Let's find out, though. Um, I'm going to delete all of these. And we're going to go up to page 40 and just make sure that this is working correctly now. I think this will do it no problem. That'll take a second to do work through. Let's go up to 50 just to make sure. <laughs> Am I gonna code for 48 hours straight? I'm gonna try. <laughs> Probably will sleep for about six hours at some point. And I will need to, to take uh, water breaks and other breaks that I shan't mention right now. Um, but. Yeah, I'll try to go for 48 hours, or at least as long as I can. 
Uh, but it, by the end of 48 hours, I'm hoping this project will be done. The hardest part is this project that we're this part we're working on right now. So let's go back. Final images is now blank. Let's load it in. Run this, and this should solve our problem. So if I remember correctly, it was 40. Gave us that problem before. 41. We're still getting the problem. 42. So I think maybe something's happening earlier on when I went through all these exceptions. So image pages extracted. Let's go there and make sure that these are the correct order. Ah, there is where our issue is occurring. So 40 is occurring twice in here. But why? Oh, that's why. Because when I did this before... All right. So I'm going to recreate these files, and then I should be good. So let's go through and just make sure everything is looking the way it should look. My suspicion is I didn't add this extra context of none in. Actually, I think I can just delete these manually. There's only a handful of them. So any instance where there's a duplicate page, I'm going to delete. And then 64 is going to be duplicated as well, I suspect. It is. Delete. And let's just make sure 65 is what we expect it to be. It is. That's good. So 69, same thing. We're going to delete. And this will solve our problem. I'll have to rerun everything I just did. So 133, I have no idea why this is occurring, why it's skipping some of them. But I think this would be an easy way to catch everything. I think I ran this the first time. And then because I added that little extra none tag to it, uh, it went ahead and recreated some of the ones that were the new exceptions that came in when I changed some of the parameters before. <laughs> Let's see, keep on going down, 248. Again, this is going to be one of our exceptions, just to make sure. And then we're going to say delete. 269 stayed the same, so we're good there. 294, 295, good there. 385 and 385, we have a duplicate here. And again, these are the ones that produced errors. That's why I'm keeping these. I'm, I'm, I don't really care if they continue through the pipeline as a blank page. That's going to be a good way that I can just kind of troubleshoot things later. I'm going to do all these pages manually. So for whatever reason, one of the things on this page threw off my, my rules I came up with. Uh, for whatever reason, probably the numbers were bled in too much. So let's go ahead and delete that. And probably only have one more, maybe none. So 450, we're good there, good there, good there. All right, cool. So now when I run this, let's grab all these files again. Now when I go back after this is done, So final images, 40 now should be resolved. Let's go check out 40, correct, 41, correct, cool. Now that's not a problem anymore. We can let it go ahead and run over everything. And we're gonna have our exceptions kind of written in so that we've got these exceptions written out as well. All right, we know that 161 is a problem. These are gonna be the, the blank pages most likely data let's go back it'll be done in just a second and i think once this is done we can actually start doing the ocr which the first major hurdle of this project was getting this stuff into the appropriate state for ocr once we got the raw text we can start doing some fun stuff with it
And I thought this part was going to take a lot longer. We might still hit some snags with the with the actual OCR output, but this is so far pretty good progress. Uh, 18 now is looking a lot better. Again, we don't care about the number up there. We don't care about any of that stuff. The odd pages, again, uh, looking looking good. Cool. And the main way we can test to make sure that we're right on this is if 481 is on page 481. And it doesn't say 481, but I know that it is. And as I promised, these pages with uh, poetry are going to present some issues. We'll have to come up with some rules to fix that in the OCR output. Uh, but 480 is lining up correctly, which means 481, which is the next page, is also correct. Cool. Um, now comes the, the next stage of this project, which is going to be taking all of these images and OCRing them. I'm going to take a quick coffee break. I'll be back in probably about 10 minutes, and then we'll start working on the OCR portion. Uh, feel free to drop comments or questions in, in the chat, and I'll try to answer them when I pop back.
All right, and I'm back. I'm gonna go ahead and start pushing some of this to GitHub. I don't think it's an issue with the user interface to push this much stuff. It might be. Um, looks like it shouldn't be an issue. Well, I'll be pushing that in just a little bit whenever it actually loads everything up. So now we've got our images in a form that we can actually start to OCR them. Um, so let's go ahead and start working through that problem. And for that, we're gonna be using PyTestRact. So I've got all of the images in this final images folder, and I know which ones are probably gonna return some errors. These are gonna be the ones that have except at the end. <clears throat> Excuse me. So for these ones, I know I'm gonna to have to write some custom rules out or do some manual manual uh, extraction of the main body and then uh, figure that out later. But for right now, uh, this isn't going to be that much of an issue. So I've got all of the um, all of the pages ready to be OCR'd. So all I really have to do now is iterate over all these images and I should be able to OCR them. So let's go with final images, image files equals glob dot glob. We're going to the data backslash final images and grab anything that is a .jpg. Cool. Now let's make that into an object. So I have all of my images now all loaded up as, as an object or as a, a list of files. So with that, what I can do is I can go ahead and actually start writing out some code to call PyTesseract and extract it. Now I already have, I believe I do already, Latin OCR. If we go to latinocr.org, uh, this is a PyTesseract model that's specifically trained on early modern Latin. I have this installed. And while this looks like it might be useful specifically for what I want to do, it's not going to be. Uh, this is what I use whenever I need to OCR something like the, the Patrologia Lactina or something that has these early modern kind of fonts that we see up here in the top right corner. Um, it's useful for that. For this problem, because we're dealing with a script that is not conducive, so it doesn't have any of these special kind of early modern uh, uh, characters that were represented in early modern scripts uh, used in printing houses, we don't really need to use Latin OCR. We can use the off-the-shelf uh, OCR from PyTesseract for the language of Latin, and we should be all right. Uh, Tesseract comes from Google, um, and it basically lets you quickly, and especially in Python, use the PyTesseract library to automate the processing or the um, automate the uh, the OCR of, of all your images. So there's certain things that we need to, to kind of test out first. The first is going to be, I haven't used the new version of Tesseract, which I've just, which I've just installed. And the way in which you pre-process images for Tesseract, I think we're on four now, is a little different than how we pre-process them for prior editions. So let's go ahead and kind of just test this out with a couple sample pages. So we're going to say for file and final image files, that's a lot longer than before. Uh, we're going to actually uh, make sure we're just going to do this on the first image, which is going to be page, um, page 18. So what we want to do is we want to try to take that image, load it up with OpenCV. So we're going to say image is going to be equal to um, uh, cv2.imread. And we're going to say uh, file. And what we want to do is we want to be able to read that image and then pass that image now to PyTesseract. There's a couple different ways that we can do this. Uh, I prefer to use OpenCV because it allows for me to do some modifications to the file. You can also use Pillow or Pill if you want to as well, different ways of opening up images. But OpenCV gives me more control if I need to do some kind of pre-processing on the image. So let's go ahead and try this out. Let's just see what our baseline result's gonna look like. So we're gonna say OCR result is gonna be equal to, and this is where we call PyTesseract. And I got videos all over this channel on how to do all these different things. So we're gonna use PyTesseract's uh, method uh, image to string or function image to string, and we're gonna pass in our image. And now let's just print off that OCR result. Uh, if everything goes correctly, we should see it printed off and below this cell. Cool, that's what we wanna see. Uh, it doesn't look too bad, actually. Um, as far as Latin goes, I mean, we got some weird things here. This is occurring because it's a bad scan. We can get rid of these in, the, in kind of post-processing. But one of the main things I'm looking for 
is the preservation of these dashes. This is really important for reconstructing uh, the raw text because what we want to do is we want to preserve two different things here. We want to preserve the line by line raw text. That's going to be good for certain human humanist uh, needs. They want to know they want to preserve that line order to reference back to the critical edition in some way. Maybe that's really important, especially with with poetry. But we also want to to preserve for uh, take this text and put it into a, a, a form that is better processed by machines for things like machine learning or some natural language processing. And that's going to be a cleaned up raw text where we have all of this data structured as a separation of, or all this uh, text separated out uh, and, and sep break all the line breaks away and have it as a continuous string of raw text where paragraphs are separated but not, not uh, mid-sentence things separated by a line break. We'll get to all that in just a second. But what I'm gonna do right now is just kind of look at some of these outputs and make sure that they look good, and they do. The errors that you see are ones that are very common with OCR, even with good English texts that have been very well OCR'd. This right here is a perfectly normal thing to see on the output. We can write some rules in to make sure that it doesn't, uh, on the end, we'll be, so we can clean it up, so we can do like, you know, a replace function. So get rid of all those. What's happening here is these are all instances where Tesseract is trying to identify what a footnote is, I think. Let me go up and see if I had to guess just from my general knowledge about how this works, you're going to see after this quem here, a footnote most likely. Maybe. Cool, yeah, it is. To see there, uh, regalis. So let's put this side by side and be easier to kind of troubleshoot. So regalis was an issue as well, I think we saw. Let me zoom out just a little bit for just a moment. So regalis is right here, and we see the asterisk. That's going to be the two footnote. And I saw another one up here with solend. So... I'm fine. I'm actually happy, very happy, if I'm being honest, that these that these errors are popping out in the OCR because this is normal behavior. Uh, OCR is really uh, does a poor job at handling footnotes. Um, it doesn't have a way to really represent them as raw text on the output, and so it makes these weird guesses. Perfectly normal, but we can use these weird guesses to actually clean up the text even more. I thought I was going to have to go back and manually remove all these footnotes, and I'm not going to have to do that, which makes me very happy because it means I have less work to do. So now that we have a script or a little cell that works for iterating over all this, let's take a look at another output. Again, we're just going to kind of troubleshoot a couple of these and then let it run loose. So we're, now we're going to do the, the second page. Let's go ahead and see. Cool. This is kind of what I want to see. Oh, it, I jumped ahead, it looks like. Um, so I'm on page 19. Seeing this one ahead just a little bit. Uh, we don't want page 20. What did I do wrong? Oh. I forgot how indexing works. There we go. I want to see what that second page looks, page 19. So let's drag that over there. Cool. This was the other main thing I was looking for. So I had two different approaches to how I was going to solve this problem, and I was not entirely sure what approach I was going to use. And to be clear, while this looks like a footer, it's actually not. This is all the manuscript data. I'm going to come up with ways to gather all that. I haven't figured that out yet. Um, but let me illustrate one point here so i need to come up with, i needed to come up with a way right now to kind of generate to separate things out on an individual page so to separate out the uh the the letters so in some pages you're going to have two letters i don't think there's any instance of three so we need to make sure that because we want to store these as separate files on a letter by letter basis and so one of the things that we need to know how to do is how to separate them when they occur on the same page together and it looks like this is going to be doable and the reason why it's going to be doable is because the three period is preserved. Now, it is my hope, it's my hope, that whenever this occurs, it's going to need to match the header. So the header is going to tell us a couple pieces of information. Let's zoom up so we can kind of see. We're going to know the page number, which we don't care about because we're going to have the file number. That's only going to occur, I believe, on odd pages because I think on even pages it was cut off. So... We have the page number, which again, like I said, we don't care about, but we've also got two vital pieces of information up at the header. We've got what the text actually is, in this case, the letter of Alcuin, uh, the letters of Alcuin in Latin, and then we've got the two letters or one letter that appears on the page. So let's go ahead and take a look at what happens when we do uh, the next page. Let's do that a little, change that a little bit. It's now going to do page 20. 
Let's bring that over. My hope is that the OCR has that three period preserved, and it does. So what we know is if a page has, oh, it looks like the even page number was preserved as well in some cases. So what we know now is we know that if we've got a page, we know what page what letters we expect to see. So if we see a sequence of numbers after Alcuin Epistoli that correspond in that first line to two letters, then we know to write an exception when we try to reconstruct everything. And again, for right now, I'm kind of just also quickly looking at some of these outputs. And we see again, like I told you before with the footnotes, we see an odd use there. This is going to give us some problems. This right here, this exclamation mark, because an exclamation mark is used. And we see the same thing happening with a question mark. I think I can come up with a rule for that. If a punctuation is proceeded by a lowercase letter, then we can make an assumption that it's a poor attempt at the footnote and remove it. If it's not, then it's a proper punctuation and should remain. Where that's going to be a real problem, though, is in the handling of semicolons. Because if one of these footnotes is returned as a semicolon, as it's kind of like um, interpretation, a semicolon will always be followed by a... It'll always be followed by a period, or a, a lowercase word. So here's a good example as well. Let me write these exceptions in. Here's a case where the punctuation is coming prior to the footnote, or to, prior to the, uh, the punctuation is coming after the footnote. And, oh, I'm looking at the wrong one. <laughs> it's up here where that error is happening. Let's scroll down, though, and just kind of get a sense for the one I was just pointing out, which I think I just lost it. Where did it go? There we are. Well, it was somewhere. Uh, but there was a punctuation that came. It's probably this one here. Um, yep, right here. So the punctuation comes after the footnote. This will be a little easier to write some rules for as well. Because it means that if, if the punctuation is coming after the footnote, then when I start writing my cleaning rules, we can, we can uh, correct for that. So that's going to be good. Uh, the other thing that's also good is that these long descriptions, let's see if we can, it, this is all in uppercase. So we can use some rules to capture when, when something's all in uppercase maybe handle it a little differently as a header kind of piece of information. Again, I'm kind of writing these rules out of my head right now, and then I'll eventually translate them to Python. So I'm looking at page 19 again. So right here, again, we have the same thing. So we've got this bit of text, in this case, two lines. We see the A registered as an eight, or the S registered as an, an eight, common, common mistake. Uh, but anyways, we have all this stuff in in capital case. And again, if I start writing these exceptions out with the exclamation mark being preceded by an A or by a capital letter, this will be a, a false hit. So I got to also take into consideration if it's a header. And if it is a header, then the next thing is always going to be an uppercase letter. So therefore, I need to write a rule in to actually account for how to handle headers different from main body text. So this is kind of the stuff that I typically do when I'm going through and trying to think about ways to write rules to automate a process. So just kind of quickly looking at a couple sample pieces and then let's pick something kind of a lot later. So let's pick page 50. I'm picking these at entirely random. And that's, oh, I happened to pick one of the pages that was just the BSM, uh, BSB. So this is good. So if I see a an output that is really short, I know it's one of my exception pages. So if we were to go down to, I think that would be 49 then, or 50, hmm, or is it 48? How does it work? Well, this is interesting then. We've gotten a problem. Let me print off the file. The final image is page 66. Why is that an index at 50 and 51? Final images, page. Oh, because I start off at number 16, so 66. Hmm. So um, looks like I've got an issue that kind of resurfaced here. i got to delete these exceptions. This might have worked out in my favor, though. No, I don't want to risk it. I mean, I could leave this in here. So having looked at this, this exception is a perfectly fine exception. 
So what I need to do is I need to go through and um, delete the instances where I have duplicates so it doesn't duplicate the page unnecessarily like that. So in this case, I'm fine with page 66 being an exception because it actually looks clean to me. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this, I think. Let me just do a couple more checks just to make sure. So this is page 63. This is page 60. So the, I do need to delete, like, delete that because this 66 exception, hmm, 67. All right, so I'm going to delete this one. Cool. All right, so 66. This one actually doesn't look too bad, so I'm going to leave that exception as it is. I think that was a case where there was just no scriptural quotes on the side. That's why that exception got written in. So 66 was acceptable to me. Let me just go back through and kind of manually check some of these exceptions real fast just to fix this problem entirely. So we know that 64 is going to be a problematic one. That's going to be a manual check one. We've already fixed 66. I think there are only a handful of these. So 61, good. We're leaving that in. 248. Good, we're leaving that in. That's a problematic one. And 385, and I don't see either one up above. 386 is there. Cool. So our exceptions are now fully built in. I think 23 and 24. Okay, good. Good, good, good. I think we're all right now. So I happen to randomly pick one. <laughs> Let's fix this now. Let's grab all that. And this is now page 68. Let's go look at page 68. Check out this output. Again, these are being chosen entirely at random. OK, so I'm seeing, uh, again, our, our header data is all capitalized. This is going to be the, the the salutation, I should say, now at this point. This is a, the technical part. Technical term for this is the salutation. These are sometimes preserved in manuscripts. Other times they're added by editors. Um, they don't always get preserved in all manuscripts. So, But this is an important piece of information for a reader to, to actually have. So we want to keep that. So we want to. what I'm trying to come up with right now are sort of rules so that I can actually preserve all this valuable metadata. So the manuscripts are important. Uh, like I said, I don't really care about these things, but I need to know where they start so I can separate them out. And I want to make sure I preserve this as a header. So I think this is going to be a fairly straightforward way to do it. I'm going to actually make um, a giant string. Actually, I'm just going to call this all texts, all pages. It's going to be equal to an empty list. And this is going to take a while to run. So if there's questions, I can answer them. Um, if not, we're just going to sit back kind of and let this, this whole process iterate over everything. But as always, we're going to start off with a small sample of five pages. And we're going to say um, all pages dot append. So we're going to append to that list. I'm going to zoom back in now since we don't need to be zoomed out anymore. We're going to append the OCR result. So this will tell us how fast it's going. We're going to keep that file print off. It's going to print off all 400. And so you're getting a good sense of how long it takes to actually OCR a single page. Surprisingly, not that long. And once this is done, just a second here, with this sample of five pages, we're going to print this off. And notice now that you can actually see these line breaks preserved, these slash ends. If you're not familiar with them, they actually mean line break. And then we also have other things preserved, such as particular characters, which we can use all of this to our advantage. So what I'm envisioning doing right now is something like this. Uh, so I can say for I, for X, or for, let's say page and all pages. Uh, actually, let me do this. Let me insert something here. This is why it's always good to, to do this first. I'm going to insert a few things here, a few special characters to denote when there's a new page. So I'm going to say new page. It doesn't have to be. This is a format string. It doesn't have to be in what you would what looks like HTML. Um, this is just how I want to do it. 
and I'm going to put the file name in there. That way I know what page number it is. Now, do I have to have the whole file ne uh, number? No, I don't. Uh, but I think it's going to be helpful for me kind of remembering where I was at. Now that we have all of that, I think we're going to be all right. So what I want to do at this point, let's call it all pages joined. Let me equal to, we're going to join this up. And we don't really need to join them with anything. It can just be a blank. Let's do like a... We'll do like a, what is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, six line breaks. That way we can kind of figure out where a new page begins more easily, or at least see it. We're going to do uh, dot join. We're going to do all pages. And so let's run this one more time. And again, I'm just troubleshooting right now to make sure that this looks the way I want it to look. And then once I know that it works well on these five pages, it should work in theory on all the pages. Now there might be an error. So I might have to do a, a try an exception in this, and I might do that anyways just because it takes so long to do. And then save those pages and put them to the side because it means that for whatever reason the Tesseract model had a hard time with them. So this is how it's going to look, and this is a good thing that I did this because now I know I need a little line break there. Um, I'll just put like a, again this is not HTML, this is just a good way for me to kind of keep this structured nicely. So whenever I see something that looks like this, a colon, new page, I know that's the start of a new page. And if we keep on going down, we see that it looks quite clean. I remember this letter number three is a really long one. It's actually not a letter. It's a church council. And here we can see a Roman numeral being poorly OCR'd. My suspicion is... Um, that's not uh, an I, a TIL, it's just a guess. Uh, but anyways, let's keep on going down. Everything's looking good. Cool. So like I said, I think I'm going to end up having an error. I think we saw one a second ago when we tried to OCR. What was it, page 51 to 52? Returned in there, maybe? I can't remember. You know what? I'm not going to worry about it. If I have to redo it, I have to redo it, but I think this is going to be good. Whenever you, if you don't have to put an exception into your code, it's always good practice not to, because if an error happens, it means that you've missed it. And again, I just want to do one more final check just to make sure that this works correctly, because this is going to take about 10 minutes to run. I don't want to have to redo it. So I'm trying to just debug things that I'm at, at this stage. And this should be looking a lot better. And we don't see the line break actually preserved here. And I'm not sure why. Hmm. New page. I'm wondering if it's because that Jupyter Lab is actually interpreting that as HTML now. Let's just try it one more time. Oh, that's why. I put it at the wrong spot. There we go. We can just leave that there then. We'll do that there. And then we'll have an end of page tag. Not that that's entirely necessary. It'll just make it look a little cleaner. All right, let's run that one more time. And then we're going to just make sure that we've got the output looking the way we want it to. And then we'll run it over all 400 pages. So we've got the new page tag right here. We got the thing that's tagged and we'll get rid of that because we don't really need it. And then we've got uh, end of page right here. So maybe we'll do start a page followed by line break followed by the file. And we'll just close the file. Yeah, I'm not going to stick with proper HTML format. Start of page, file, file. Let's do a slash, why not? Uh, and then we'll do end of page there. 
cool. One more test just to make sure this looks right. Again, this is gonna make the process of automating this a lot easier because if the page number is missed in the OCR or for whatever reason, we still have the page number preserved in the file name. That's why I'm so insistent upon doing this. And that looks the way I, like I wanted to see it. Uh, we got the date data file, start of page, end of page, we can see a clear de uh, delineation where these page breaks happen. We're going to preserve this as its own complete string now. And let's go ahead and just run it over everything and fingers crossed that there's no errors. This is going to take a little while to run. So let's sit back and relax. <laughs> but again, now what we have after this whole long pipeline that we've kind of been working on, for lack of a better word, this workflow, for working throughout all this problem, we've been able to take now these um, these texts that were in PDF and un-OCR'd, and now we were able to OCR them. And not only OCR them, but these texts that had lots and lots and lots of um, marginalia, so data that's on the side, data that's on the left or the right of the page, data that's in the bottom of the page, or like a footer, we've been able to remove all of that to get a good OCR output. And most importantly, we know exactly which page we're on all the way through. So that, like, let's say down the road, we need to do another thing, which we are going to have to do, which is we're going to have to grab all those scriptural references as well. So we can go through and grab all the scriptural references for all those pages, and we know exactly where to inject them into the page. So, because we'll actually have the, the proper page number for that and the proper page number for the scriptural tags as well. So we've gone through 10 pages out of 400. Like I said, this is probably gonna take about 10 minutes. And if you can hear it, my computer is now ramping up. <laughs> and it might cause the stream to go a, a little bit slower, I think, just because the uh, the stream is happening. Actually, the stream's happening on the GPU, not on the CPU, so it might not affect it at all. But if there's any questions you all have, feel free to post them in the chat and I'll do my best to answer them. And for those of you just now joining, uh, this is kind of the, the rough sketch that we did at the start of this video for what the, the end result's gonna look like. It's gonna be a, a front end, this is the front end of an app that's going to allow a user to have different kind of features that they can do with these letters. So extract the, uh, look at the raw text, copy and paste it if you're, if you're writing you know, if you're writing a, a paper or an article, you'll be able to actually copy and paste the raw text as opposed to having to write it all out by hand, looking at the uh, looking at the images on the DMGH website. You're also going to be able to automatically have, because we're going to use Spacey to do this, all the entities extracted. So the people, the places, and things like that. And because we're doing this all custom, we're also going to be able to extract uh, the actual titles of the people. So if a person who's referenced as a monk, we'll extract them as a monk. And we're also going to be able to take all that data and output not only a nice visual representation of, of the textual data and its annotations, but also maybe they output a nice set of network graphs that are gonna be of the people referenced within the texts on a letter by letter basis or collectively. We're also gonna have the textual relationship represented. So uh, how these letters survive and the different manuscripts, which is gonna be a visual representation of the Boloff thesis, which I have coded that part before, but we're gonna do it a little differently because I coded that about a year ago and I uh, can do a few more things now than I could do back then actually over a year ago now. So we're at page 52 out of 481. <laughs> oh, looks like somebody actually tweeted it out. I should probably share this on Twitter to at least get some some more interest in it. Let's go ahead and do that while this runs.
All right, there we go. Cool. Now it's on Twitter. <laughs> so we're at 77 out of 480. If you're just joining this, we're going through an OCRing um, after a lot, a lot of pre-processing on the images. We're OCRing an entire critical edition from the DMGH, which required us to remove a whole bunch of extra uh, marginalia, so things that occur in the margins and uh, footers, so we could actually get good OCR results. I've done some videos on this on the past on this channel, but um, in case you're just now coming to it fresh, um, went through and kind of redid a lot of it. And I actually made a lot of improvements so far this morning on some of the prior code that I've written. And the code that I have here, it should work for all critical editions from the MGH. So the, if you wanted to replicate this project and do it with a different collection of letters from those critical editions, this workflow should work pretty well for that. If you want to do it with a critical edition from uh, any other in this any other volume in the series from the MGH, but there's hundreds of them, you can do it for that too. The ultimate goal for this also is to have this code where it's uh, reproducible so that we can OCR the entire MGH and also at the same time use that OCR output to train more robust NLP Latin models at the CLTK, uh, specifically for BERT models, which are uh, kind of the newer, uh, more advanced language models. We can kind of close some of these tabs because we already got a lot of these problems solved. And if you are on Twitter, do feel free to tweet it out. That way you could see uh, the word out about this live stream. I don't know anyone else who's uh, who's done this. So the idea is to take uh, to give kind of some guidance for how you go from beginning of a DH project all the way to the end with a front end and user face. Uh, and like I said, we're doing this in 48 hours, so it's not going to be incredibly sophisticated, but it's a good model of a DH project, something that solves a problem that is not currently solved, that provides solutions, and most importantly, a workflow that's well-documented that can be replicated for other projects that are either similar or uh, even not only in the same domain, but in an adjacent domain as well. All right, now we're about a quarter of the way through, and this OCR result should be pretty good. Uh, I think it's going to look comparable to all the other results that we've seen. Once we actually have all of this data kind of uh, saved as a single text file, then we can start doing some fun stuff, and that's going to be the, the cleaning up of everything. So that's going to be the next major hurdle, is now that we've got the OCR in as good of a state as we could probably get it, what do we do with that OCR? So the next major st hurdle is going to be actually cleaning everything and, co and coming up with a set of rules for uh, tackling these uh, these problems that we're seeing, such as the um, such as the the results of the bad footnotes that I referenced a few minutes ago. And we're about three and a half hours in now, and we've already got one major component of this workflow uh, figured out and solved, which is actually getting the raw text. Because remember, if you're working with data, you can't work with a PDF, you can't work with a JPEG if what you're dealing with is a textual document. You need to get it into some kind of raw text form so that you can actually work with it <clears throat> and do some data analysis on it and data extraction from it. And I think it'd be fun also to not only give uh, on the front end page the the data that you might see, but maybe we can steal some ideas from Voyant and actually put things like um, maybe use some some scikit-learn, some TF-IDF, so term frequency inverse document frequency, and give some data there. There's also another project that I'm a huge fan of um, that comes from Germany, and let me, it's the Patristic, give me one second. I'll pull it up right here while we're going through and doing this. 
it's the um, hang on one sec the patristic text archive i always have a hard time remembering what pta stands for uh, but one of the nice things about this uh, this archive, and this is, I think, something that we can kind of use as we go through and, and develop this, is let me go back to forward one. There we go. Uh, we can kind of use their, their layout. I quite like it. Uh, on the right-hand column, they've got a list of, of key aspects of the text at hand, which is displayed here in the front. On the right-hand side, we've got things like persons. Now, this is all in Greek. I can't read it. Uh, but we've got things like all the persons referenced, the groups of people referenced, the places referenced. If you don't know about this project, even if you can't read Greek or Latin, it's a good project because it gives you a great model for how to represent a text dynamically on a page that's easy to read, and how do you give users the tools that they need to analyze it, either in uh, kind of more normal form where it's on a page-by-page uh, -page basis, or in a form that where you can export it as XML or uh, JSON or however you might need it for more advanced things like NLP or if you're doing other more advanced things, something like machine learning, which is one of the things that I use this for at the CLTK. So that's going to be something else we can add on to our app when we finally get to that point of designing the front end is maybe a little other sidebar or toolbar kind of on the right hand side, maybe like a third column that'll give users all that kind of really important data, or we can kind of keep it on the left here. We'll, we'll figure that out as we get towards the end of this project and start figuring out and designing uh, the front end. But like I said, when we started about three and a half hours ago, it's always good to have kind of a general idea about where you want to end up so that you know what you're doing and how it's gonna fit into the end result in some capacity. And let's check back now with our OCR run. And it looks like, uh, where'd it go? I'm on page 153 now. And for those just joining, uh, what we've done for the first three and a half hours was all of the, the necessary and uh, labor intensive part of trying to get raw text, which is performing a whole bunch of pre-processing on uh, images extracted from a PDF, and then going through and extracting and removing different features from those uh, those images. So for example, and if you look at kind of the, the first images that we worked with, they looked like this. And now for the OCR, we've removed things like these footers, we've removed things like this marginalia on the right column, the marginalia on the left column, and now we're OCRing um, after some pre-processing, the main body of the text, which is right here. And that's what we're kind of seeing. We're using uh, Tesseract 4 with the Python library Pi Tesseract because we don't need to pass a lot of advanced uh, keyword arguments or config setups. Uh, typically, for a single column text like this, our results are going to be quite good without them. And we've got a couple exceptions written in, which were the results of blank pages that we accidentally uh, we did not accidentally, we uh, ended up having as a result of some of our rules so that we know which pages we have to go back to. And there's only four or five of them to do some manual validation. And we're about, it looks like a third of the way through all the OCR. And once the OCR is done, as uh, if you're just now joining, one of the things that we're going to see is the output that will look kind of like this. And we're going to write this to a text file so that we know where each page starts and each page ends in the MGH critical edition. And so that we can also start coming up with some rules to then separate all the pages out, not by page, but by, um, but also by uh, specifically which letter. So that when they go on the front end of the website, that will be on a letter by letter basis, not on a page by page basis, which makes them much easier to, much more easier to navigate than they are currently on the web. And again, we might take another 10 minutes for this to finish up.
And we're now pushing all these files to uh, to GitHub. So you'll be able to have access to this whole repo. It's on my GitHub, uh, which is WJB Mattingly. I should probably provide a link in the description. But we're pushing all of these initial files now, which is going to be all the different steps of our OCR process. So we can kind of go back and work with them at a later date when we start trying to get to uh, identifying the actual scriptural references that come up in these texts to assign better metadata when we start actually developing the front end and, and outputting some XML files. Uh, so it's pushing now. Again, it's a massive quantity of images, so it's going to take a little bit. And like I said at the start of this video, I'm going to try at all costs to use the uh, the GUI version of things because I think it's a little easier for an audience to follow when you're using a GUI as opposed to using the terminal for GitHub and, uh, if we have to, environments as well with Anaconda Navigator. But I, I don't think we're going to need any special environments. Like I said, all the libraries that I'm doing in this entire DH project are going to be fairly straightforward standard ones, the most recent uh, versions, and I think that's what I have installed in my root directory already. There will be a requirements.txt file, though, that I'll just probably manually cultivate on GitHub so that you can kind of recreate this entire process all on your own. And it looks like we might be experiencing some buffering issues right now. The stream's just a little weak, it looks like. And I think it's actually because I'm trying to push everything to GitHub, which is actually using quite a bit of bandwidth. All right, we'll see if that fixed it. All right, now we're at 209. And if you're just now joining, unfortunately you're joining at a very boring part where we're just going through and OCR in every single page that we spend the past three hours um, manipulating to get in the right format. So this will be done probably, like I said, in the next five to 10 minutes or so. There's 468 pages in total or something around there. All right, let's see.
All right, I've decided while this bit runs, I'm going to take a quick break and I'll be back in probably about five to ten minutes.
Okay, and we're back. So we're almost done here. We got about another 90, maybe 60 something pages left to go. But I remembered something. Uh, so the next phase of this I'm gonna start thinking about now. And if I remember correctly from a Medium article I read a while back, there's actually a library that can actually assist with OCR output cleanup. So I thought I'd go ahead and see if I could find that now. Never used it. Uh, OCR cleanup Python. And it's a, I know about the regex one. Let's go ahead and see what this one has. So this is a good website, the programminghistorian.org. Uh, lots of good content here. I've not seen this article before though. Oh, this is about cleaning up a, it looks like a set of, so this is going to be just a series of rules. We're going to be doing something similar to this uh, for this problem. It look, uh, But there's actually a library for this library. Ted Underwood. Oh, Ted Underwood. A very famous uh, DH person. Someone you should be familiar with by name. Um, let's see. Let's go through and see what this repo is. This repo contains scripts, mostly in Python 3, for correcting OCR and wrangling metadata drawn from HathiTrust. So it's going to be more specifically for HathiTrust, but there is an actual library that, that specifically is designed for this. And I came across it just by happenstance. Um, let's see. Medium article, um, cleaning text. I do as a typo thing. If that's the case, then we're not going to really be able to do it because um, this probably is not going to be trained on the conventional spelling of Latin words. Yeah, not looking like this is going to be it either. I think we're going to have to do this all by by our own custom rules based on the output here. But we're going to be done here in just a second. We can start kind of writing these. This will be the lo only thing in this entire workflow that actually takes this long. The rest of the steps are going to be um, uh, a lot of heuristics and some machine learning and NLP. But a lot of the, the, the experiments on the data from here on out, once it's converted in the raw text, will not be that computationally expensive. And the reason why is that we don't really have to work with images anymore. Images are always going to be what take you a lot longer to process and analyze and do, uh, with any kind of methods, be it heuristic or, um, or machine learning based, because the data is just so much larger than that of texts. If you think about the data of text, every uh, character is represented by a number, but in the case of an image, every pixel is represented by a number. And if you're dealing with um, images that are in black and white, it's a fairly simple number, it's zero or one. If you're dealing with images that are in color, which we are, uh, the number is can be anything up to 255, I believe. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but then if the image is, let's say, 800 pixels by, by 2,000 pixels, which I think these are close to about that size, 800 times 2,000, that means that you've got each image being 1.6 million uh, different numbers. This is why images are a lot harder to, to analyze in anything from machine learning to, to heuristics than, uh, than text, which are much smaller in size. Even if you're using something like JPEG, which is a, a compression method on an image, if you've never really uh, understood or thought about what a JPEG is, I, uh, I encourage you to check out, there's a great computer file uh, video on YouTube on, uh, on JPEGs. Let me see if I can find it on this other screen and bring it over. Uh, computer file, JPEG. And it's, uh, it's this video right here on everything on JPEGs. I highly encourage checking it out. It's really good. And I'll, uh, I'll provide a link later on if someone's interested. Oh, thank you so much. Someone just said that they love the channel. And again, we're going to be done here in just a second. I think there's 468, maybe 480. I always forget now. 465 is what we have. So we're going to be there in just about 19 more. We can start doing the next part of this uh, part of this process.
and I did try to push all this uh, to GitHub, but it caused the stream uh, to radically decrease in quality. And so I've tried to keep, I'm going to keep the GitHub pushes until either the very end or when I do like a longer break. I don't think I'll be able to code for 48 hours straight. I'm going to give it a go. Uh, but if I can't, I'm probably going to have to sleep for at least uh, at least six hours, I would imagine. Somewhere between three and six and then pop back. I don't have anyone else who can take over my, my space. And so during that time, I'll do a GitHub, a GitHub push. So it doesn't affect the stream too bad since it'll just be a counter kind of ticking, ticking up to 48 hours. But after four hours, we already got our data now in raw text, which is going to be really, I think, a, a good time frame for having done all that. And the next thing we're going to do, once this is done, we're going to just go ahead, instead of printing it all out, we are going to wrap up this notebook by saving all of this output uh, to disk as a, a single individual um, text file. It's going to be quite large. If the text file is too large, the push to GitHub. So if it exceeds, I think the limit is uh, 25 megabytes. I could be wrong. Um, if it exceeds 25 megabytes, one of the things that I will do is I will simply... I break it up into smaller sizes when I when I do the push so that you can still have access to it. But this this text file is not going to be too important for anything because we're going to be uh, saving it all as one file so that we don't have to open up multiple files as we kind of go forward. We could if we wanted to, but as we're going to see in just a little bit, that's not going to be entirely necessary. Cool. And that's the last one. Let me just scroll up, make sure the cell is finished running. Uh, it's still probably waiting to load it all into the all pages list. Oh, no, it's still going. It must have been more than... Oh, there are more than that. Uh, let's see. This is all in the is it final images. 468. It's going up to 481. I'm not really sure why that is. Not that big of a deal, though. But we're going to go up to 481, so we got another uh, uh, 11 left to go. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm not too familiar with what Super Chat is. I don't do a lot of streaming. Um... Oh, hey, Clem. Clem's part of the CLTK team. Yeah, I'm not too familiar with what uh, Super Chat is. Um, if you let me know, I'll, I'll try to add it next time, if it's something that uh, that's good to add to these, uh, these streamings. I'm not sure how many times I'll do a 48-hour DH project live stream. <laughs> this, the main reason why I'm doing this is because I've wanted to have this project finished for a long time, and I've just never sat down to actually do it. Oh, that's so cool. Uh, no, I don't have that set up, but I do have a, a Patreon set up. Let me find my link, if that works for you. Hey, David. Thanks a lot. I actually just uh, messaged you the other day about, uh, about something for this I didn't know how to do, which was setting up a... Uh, a streamlit app on your own domain. I didn't know how to host it on a server, uh, but that's going to be for tomorrow's portion of this project, which is going to be the uh, actually setting up the final parts of the front end project. Hey, Clem. <laughs> Oops. Looks like I copied and pasted the LinkedIn correctly. There you go. That's the the Patreon one. Cool. So it looks like we're done. Let's scroll up and I will try to look at chat now as I, uh, as I continue writing everything out, but okay, we're done. We got all pages now saved as a list. Let's go ahead now. And we're going to be creating all pages into a continuous string where each page is separated by these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven line breaks. So we can execute that and it's already done. And now we can say with open, and we're going to drop this into our data subfolder. We're going to say all text.txt. It should all be encoded into um, UTF-8, but just to be sure, UTF-8 is a uh, Unicode. 
for those of you who don't know, there's two options for it. I think there's UTF-8 and UTF-16. Uh, so we're going to do f.write, and we're going to write out our entire uh, string right here. And again, like I said, if this, and it's already done. Um, so if this is too long, uh, what I will, if it's too large of a file, what I will do is I will break it up into individual ones when I do, when I do the push to GitHub at the very end. But as we notice, we've got the end of the page represented each time. So we know the page ends, we know where a page begins. And we've also included a little bit of metadata here. And this is just going to give us a little bit of guidance about uh, what page number we're actually on. And this is going to be really useful for instances like, like this, where the page number is, um, is not always very clear. So we don't have the page number preserved here at all for that case. In that case, that's page number 40, 41, sorry. This is page number uh, 40. But one of the things now we can start doing is coming up with a set of rules for keeping track uh, and start processing all of these files. So we've got like our original image, our original text file now here that we can start working with. And we're gonna start coming up with some rules that we kind of iterated or talked about a few moments ago. So this is gonna be much more post-processing now with text, which is kind of more of my wheelhouse. So we've got a couple different uh, problems here. We're gonna ignore the typographical errors. This is not gonna be perfectly clean um, data. It's gonna be, uh, there's gonna be typographical errors, but we can, we can do some rules to kind of clean it up and make it look a little nicer. And a lot of that's gonna have to probably be done manually for the typographical errors, but we can clean up some of these things like the uh, the examples I demonstrated before where we had the the footnotes were always off just a little bit. And that was th represented by things like a um, uh, like the circle with the R that looks similar to the trademark. And I'm not seeing it right now on the output, uh, but we see one right here. Oh, here we go, right here with the quem, with that R right there. So we, we can start making some rules. So whenever we see that, we can make a very safe guess that this is never going to be something that was actually used in a Latin text. Oh, looks so we had a couple other comments. Oh no, yeah, Streamlit apps, they do tend to crash if multiple users are using them all at once. Uh, that's something I've been having to, to figure out how to handle myself, I'm responding to, to uh, David in the chat. So let's start writing out some rules, but we're going to do this all now in a new notebook so we can keep all these steps kind of kind of sequential and better organized. So we're going to make a new notebook. Let's call this O2, and then we're going to call this post uh, text processing. How about that? Text processing. So this would be the, the text processing workflow. So I'm not entirely sure what we're going to need here. I suspect we're going to need to use regjax. So I'm going to go ahead and just import that now. I'll, I'll make sure that I do all the imports at the top, and I'll go back and kind of redo that cell or rerun that cell as I need to. So the first thing I need to do is I need to get the data. So with open uh, data all text.txt, I've already forgotten what I called it. I'm pretty sure that's right, all text.txt as f. So we're going to say um, data is equal f read. Now, I don't really want to split lines right here. I want to kind of preserve this data in this form. Oh. Unsupported operation, it's unreadable. All text, oh. Oops. Oh, no. Hopefully I didn't just overwrite everything. <laughs> and I did. That's all right. Luckily, I never closed this down. Uh, let's go ahead and rewrite all that. And now let's just check this out. So I'm going to have to change the encoding to UTF-8. And now I should be able to print data. Let's just check it out, make sure it's loaded in. And it is. So let's load up. Uh, the first, I don't know, 2,000, just to get a sense. That should give us a whole page, not even a whole page. So what we have here is a way of delineating where pages start and where pages end. So what we can do is we can use that information, and we can say something like uh, pages is going to be equal to uh, data.split. And remember at the end, I had that tag end of page, which I can now use to have a list of all my pages. And let's print len pages just to make sure and I got 465 that sounds right <laughs> so let's go ahead and print pages zero just to make sure and we've got our first page 
Cool, so we're able to separate all of the pages out now and actually have them represented individually. As we're going to see, that's going to be useful because if a user wants to cite one of these letters, they're, they're going to cite the letter itself, but they're also going to cite the page where it occurs in the MGA tradition. And that needs to be retained. So what we need to do now is to start thinking about some ways that we can kind of clean some things up. So let's come up with some rules. We're going to make a new cell. We're going to call this clean data. And it's going to be equal to uh, data dot replace. And we're going to start writing some rules out right now. Basically, there's nothing clean about this. It's a bunch of replace functions where you're trying to just replace characters that you know are never going to be a uh, an actual character that was in the text. So no one from the Middle Ages used that R with a circle around its symbol, and the asterisk is never uh, never occurs. These are bad OCRs of the actual footnotes, which works out well because um, you don't need to actually write code to find numbers that are embedded within texts. And so we've gotten two instances uh, uh, caught now. I imagine there's a lot more. Let's go ahead and print off pages one. And now what we're doing is we're just looking for mistakes, looking for typographical errors that are probably going to surface time and time again. Uh, right here, I don't believe that's going to be a correct character. I'm not sure what it's representing, so I don't want to just replace it with nothing. Okay, here's an occurrence of a question mark call, uh, followed by a period. So my suspicion is this is one of those punctuations over the other. And so we're going to have to work about work on that. Um, for right now, I'm going to leave this as is and add to this as I kind of go forward. So as I see more of these errors surface, I'm going to kind of go back and start cleaning the data more and more and adding some extra rules in. Unfortunately, it's not one of those things that you can just write all the rules out one time and be good. So what I want to do now is I'm going to do the same thing for pages. I call it cleaned pages. It's going to be equal to, I'm just going to copy and paste this down here. It's going to be equal to cleaned data dot split. And that's going to give us cleaned data. Oh, I've never actually created it. Cleaned data dot split. There we go. Now we can do cleaned pages zero. And we should see that those instances now removed. And we do. Um, so the R symbol, whatever that is, and the other symbol have now been removed. Now comes we want to start iterating over these pages. So for page and pages and cleaned pages, I need to start iterating over these things. And so I'm just going to start off with some rules for this first page, print page. So the first thing I want to do is I need to figure out uh, this very top section here. So I think I, I'd make a guess right now, and I'll, I'll figure out if this guess is right or not that every single page is going to start off with Alquini, Epistoli, something. And the reason why that's all existing up there is because that's kind of, let's pull up an image so you can see, that's always preserved up here in the very top header of the page. We left that in there for a very important reason. It's so that we can automate this process of finding letters. So what our goal is right now is to print off just the first string. So we're going to say uh, lines is going to be equal to page dot split lines, I think is how you do this, zero. Actually, let's do that. And then we're going to say print lines zero. Uh, we're going to print lines one, actually, because the start of the page is up there. Actually, we're going to print lines two because I've added in that metadata as well. So this is what it's going to look like. Now, when we iterate over everything, it's my goal, my hope, that this is all going to look the same. So if we did like up to five, you'd see something like that, and we have a problem. So what happened on any of those other pages is we probably have an extra space up there. Let's go ahead and try and figure out what's happening there. Let's do let's do this. This might be a part of the problem. Um, page is going to be equal to page dot strip. Let's see if that fixed it, and it did. So there was an extra line break at the top because end of page was followed by those seven line breaks. And so that's what's happening there. Dot strip removes leading white spaces and it removes those line breaks. So now what we have is that rule coming into play. What we can see are a few things. We see the odd number pages are handled differently than even number pages, where the page number is on the left, page number is on the right. So if this is going to be important, we need to know we need to know if it's an even page that we're working with or if it's an odd page. So again, we can pull out that handy dandy if um if I, we're going to iterate now, create a variable outside, set I equal to, actually we're going to set it equal to 18, because that's where we start in our index. 
if I divided by um, 2 is equal to 0, then we know it's going to be an even because this is going to give us the remainder. If there's no remainder and it's divisible by 2, always going to be even. So let's do this. Now we should just see. Oh, that helps. If you i equals i plus 1. And so we get just the, the even numbers. Now let's see how that looks compared to the odd numbers. So actually, no, let's just do this. I'm going to iterate up to 50 to see what our output looks like. And we've got some problems. Remember, this is one of those pages that was giving us uh, an issue before. Um, so that's expected. That's probably page 40. Uh, this page right here, it goes from 24. So this is going to be page 26. We've got some issues there with 26. It looks like... Um, Let's grab lines 0 to 2, see what's happening. 0 to 4. We can kind of get a sense of what's happening, so 0 to 5. My suspicion is it's now going to be on this next one, and it's not. We're not grabbing that header at all for some reason. So now that tells me I need to print off page 5 to figure out what's going on. So we're going to do 4 to 5. That should do it. And then we're going to print off page. Let's comment this out. And, oh, that's not right. It's on page 26, so 6 to 7. That might do it. Nope, one more. All right, so I had to go 8 to 9. And here, uh, so this is part of the problem. So this is one of those pages where we didn't weren't able to grab all of the of the scriptural notes and keep those separate. And so what that's ha what that's done for us is it's preserved all of those scriptural references, but it didn't actually OCR the thing as a straight body of text because that was thrown it off. So our header is going to be down here. I think we can work with that and still come up with a rule for it because I believe if I had to make a guess every single time that's going to be coming out as good OCR. So we can kind of test that theory out. So, oop. so what I'm going to do is I'm going to iterate over all these pages and say split lines for line and lines. If So I'm going to hope that one of these is right. So if that is in line or that is in the line, then we're going to be printing off that. Make sure that happens outside. Oh, nope. Then we need to print off the line that we're on. Hmm. Oh, still printing off the whole page. Cool. So that, that tended to do the trick, it looks like. So we can see that letter three goes on for quite a while. And I think we've grabbed it then. So we can go up to like 50 now. And we should be good grabbing just the even pages. So far, the even pages are looking promising. We're seeing that the uh, the page number is consistently on the left-hand side. The letters that are contained on the page are on the right-hand side. So what I want to know now is, are there any exceptions where this doesn't occur? So let's ignore this for right now. And we'll just add in uh, not... Again, I'm doing this quickly on the fly, so it's probably not the best of code, but it works. We're going to do print lines. Now we're curious if any line occurs without that. And why is it printing off the whole thing? Hmm. Hmm. Oh, that's why. Because every line... Um... So we want to find if there's any occurrence where that doesn't happen. Uh, we're going to make it outside equals tr false. And then if that does happen, then we're going to say found is equal to true. And we'll say if found is equal to false, then print. Um, we don't need to print the whole page. Uh, we'll print page. Print lines to two. And that'll give us a good sense of which page it is. So we know that this one is going to be a problem anyways, because it's an exception. So if we go to 64 except, it's a blank page. So we know that's not going to be the case. We're OK. We want to see that this is mainly the exception pages. And we see that it's worked for all of them except for 
one. So there's only one file that doesn't have that represented anywhere, and it's number 91. If we go down to 91, I suspect we've got a problem with the OCR, and if I had to guess, that's going to be coming out as an O in the OCR. So let's try this one other exception we're going to write. Let me close that one now. So we're going to make one other exception. And while I'm doing this, let me just go ahead and duplicate this so that I have a backup. I don't want to have to re-OCR everything. So uh, what we can do is we can also say or, and this is me just guessing. I didn't actually, or if that's in the line. And now it's gone. So that is what happened. The C was being OCR doesn't O. So now we know that we can access that header for every single letter with, with the exception of our four exceptions, which we're going to have to do manually. That's a big problem solved. It means we can go forward and make our life a lot easier. So if we can catch all the headers, that means we can have a lot of information. So let's go ahead and comment this out now. We don't really need that anymore. Uh, let's bring this back up. And we're going to make found now equal to that line. As opposed to just uh, false. So that's what it should look like when we go through and iterate over everything. Like I said, this is going to be a lot faster now that we actually have our, uh, our data in raw text. And every single time we do see both, we see everything preserved that we wanted to see preserved. So we've got a lot of metadata here that we can actually use to create some better heuristics. So one of the things I notice is that, um, let's go ahead and let's print off everything now, not just those. And what we're going to try to do is come up with a way to understand when a certain letter ends and where a new letter begins. So we know that one is referenced here. We know that two is referenced here, three there, and we keep on seeing three all the way down, 38. Not likely. But what we want to know now is when these page numbers change in the heading, because that's the page in which we have to actually um, isolate one letter from another. So it's going to be where we have to make up some rules. Let me demonstrate an example of that real fast. This is the classic one I keep on going back to. So page two, it happens very early. We want to make sure that we separate these two things out. Now, I mentioned earlier that we could have done this in the OCR portion. But if we can write the rules in for um, at this stage, it'll be a lot easier because it means we can do these through trial and error a lot more quickly. So let's go ahead and keep our rules for if that, then that, else. We're going to have to write other rules for this right now. So we're just going to put pass in. So it's just ignored. So what we want to do is we want to isolate this bit of information. So we want to take everything and split equals found dot split and we're going to change this from false to empty because that's going to return an error for us. Uh, we're going to split at the occurrence of a pistol eye. And then we're going to grab whatever is in position one. So let's print off line data and we have an error. So it's a list index out of range. So this is an occurrence where a pistol eye wasn't actually present. Hmm. So let's go ahead and see what's going on there. So this is, let's print. We'll print found right before, so we can kind of debug this problem. Okay, so This might be an occurrence where we had an exception. Let's figure it out. So I'll go into pistol eye, we're going to 1920. Hmm. We're gonna do this, unless there's an index error. And we'll be able to write an exception in. Except which case we need to print off the line because we're going to have to troubleshoot that. And we're going to 
print, in this case, line data. In this case, we're going to print off the found. So in this case, with letter 24, it's completely blank. So something's happened there with our rules that we're not grabbing something correctly. We'll figure that out in just a second and see how many blanks we actually have. For the evens, we only have a couple, and I think they are occurring mostly where the exceptions are happening. We'll figure out how to deal with those in just a second. For right now, though, let's figure out how to actually grab this bit of information right here. So it looks like a pistol eye is used consistently. The thing that's varied is going to be that information right there. So if it's a period followed, or if it's a period or a comma, so we can figure, and this is a case where it's a pistolac. So we can write that in as an exception, a pistolar. Okay, so we've got two things we can replace. A pistolar and a pistolac. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say um, found is going to be equal to, actually we can write this exception in a little earlier because we know that it's probably going to occur in the odds as well. So found is going to be equal to found.replace, uh, oops, epistolac, I think is what it was, with epistoli, and then we can do some replace, and I think it was epistolar. So this is just the result of bad OCR, perfectly normal, and this is an easy way to just write some custom rules in. If it's small rules, it's easy to do, like it is right here. And we should see no instances of a pistol or a pistol lack anymore. And we don't. So what we're left with after this is a sequence of information that is the specifically the letters that appear on the page. And so as we go through, we see that we, uh, we go from 1 to 3, and that's because the shift from 1 to 2 happens on an odd page. And then we go straight into 3, and then these shifts occur frequently probably on the other page. Actually, looking at that now, I'm going to make a, uh, a guess and say that that's not 8, that's actually 3. And so we have to think about some rules there. What do we do when the result is wrong? So we can kind of keep track of the order if we need to in a list. And then we would expect that the previous number to be less than the one less than what the new number is. We'll figure that out when we get to it. But for right now, we're extracting these numbers pretty well, it looks like, and they're coming out in somewhat of a sequential order with the exception of that eight right there. So let's go ahead and try and now grab and isolate uh, the number. So one of the things I'm looking at real fast is to see if consistently there is a space. So I'm not, I don't have to worry about the punctuation. I can just split this up and grab just the space and then remove punctuation. And what I should be left with is a raw number and consistently all the way down, at least for the evens, there's always a space. So what I can do, ooh, what I can do now, let's go back up, is I can say uh, dot split, get out of capital, dot split, and we're gonna grab the um, position of the index one. And now what you should see is just one right here, three, eight, all the way down, cool. So now we've got a good sense of when the letter numbers change. And let's do one more thing here for a little bit of cleaning. Um, we need to figure out when there's when there are two rep letters represented on a page. So let me find one of these cases now. Ah, so what I've done is I've grabbed just the first instance. The letters are always separated by two. So we need to print that off now as a list. And now we'll know when those are recognized individually. So if the length of our list is greater than one, then we know that there's two letters on a page. If it's less than one, we know that there's just one letter represented on the page. And in this case, there's actually three. Wow, that's pretty cool. Another case of three. So this, I'm, what I'm looking for right now is I'm looking to make sure that we don't have cases like this where there is some bad OCR that makes this rule not work because we want these rules to work. And it looks like if I just get rid of the, uh, the underscore with a blank space or with a uh, with nothing and replace it, I should be able to get this to work just fine. So let's go ahead and write that rule in right now as well. So we're going to uh, get rid of found and we're also going to replace oops, replace an occurrence of an underscore with nothing. And now that problem, I even forgot which number it was, should be gone. And it is. Cool. 
So the next thing that we need to do is we need to clean up these numbers a little bit because we want to store these. We might want to store, store them as numerical strings. We might want to store them as just raw numbers, in which case the period will throw things off. So we just need to remove things uh, that don't belong. So here's in the case, again, of bad OCR, a percent sign. We can delete that, and we should be all right. Let's go ahead and do that now. Actually, I think I can just use the classic, if it's a digit, keep it. So what we can do is say for um, D in line data. So D is going to be for our digit here. I always forget how to do this. Um, Python, <laughs> remove digits, or keep only digits in string. So you can use the is digit function. You essentially just loop over it. Here, this is kind of the standard solution. Um, I usually use it in the opposite way. Uh, so you use the from strings import digits, and then you're able to iterate over everything and keep the thing that's just a, let me scroll up to the top here and import it at the very beginning. This lets us use uh, a built-in uh, strings library for Python. Everyone has it off the shelf, and we can just copy and paste this in. We really don't need to, but we will anyway. So what we're going to do now is we're going to say uh, join for uh, C. In this case, in our in D, if C in digit. And then what we're going to do is make a new object here. New is going to be equal to that. And then we need this somewhere to append it. Make a new object, just a list called new data. And we're going to say new data append new, and now we should be able to print off, well, let's just store it out here the same way, line data equals new. Not the best practice, but it'll work. And it's not done what we needed it to do. Oh, that's why, new data, there we go. Now it should work. So now we've got everything stored as a cleaned up, cleaned up number. It's a numerical string, and that'll be fine. And everything looks good. Now we got to start working with the odd pages because like I said, we're going to have to have different heuristics for those because I think the page number comes on the other side. So now let's go. Now that we know we got the evens working, let's comment that out. Let's start working on a set of rules for the evens. And we, we're going to leave that exception in for right now. And else, this is where we're going to start working with the even. So if it's an even number, it's going to go down this and uh, be handled by all of these rules. If it's not, it's going to be handled by this new set of rules. So we have to kind of read everything uh, again. So we're going to print off found. Okay, and again, we're seeing a couple new mistakes here. So we got a pistol lob. We're going to see a few of these probably surface. Let's do, let's keep it consistent. Put this right here. And there's a cleaner way to do this where you can replace everything that's in a list. I'm only doing it this way because it's just faster. And what I'm looking for right now is to make sure that anything that comes after a pistol I is a, a punctuation followed by a space. And it is. This is good news. It means that I can follow kind of the same rules that I used earlier again, but What's going to be different here is how I handle the cases of twos. So this is going to be where our rules for the even numbers kind of are going to be a little bit more problematic. They're not going to apply here because what comes after this is always the page number. And I'm wondering if the OCR has maintained like a slash tab in here. And if it has, that might make it a little easier to do, but we'll figure that out in just a second. So let's go ahead now and try to do our same code that we used a second ago. So we're going to print off line data like this. And we should see, oh, there we go. OK, so things are looking better. We see another case with that 3 and the 8. So I'm thinking that we could probably come up with some simple rules. Uh, this is occurring. This is a common OCR mistake when the uh, the 3 looks like an 8 and 8 looks like a 3. If you think about our Arabic numerals, they do kind of look very similar. Uh, that's going to be something we need to think about going forward. And we see uh, two 8s here. That's going to be wrong. It's supposed to just be one 8. And we've got an index error. 
Okay, cool. So it's probably going to be one of those typographical error pages. We're going to write our exception in here as well. And, and we'll figure out what to do with it later. For right now, we're going to stick with bad practice. For right now, we're just going to pass. Actually, we're going to print off. Because those are going to be the ones that uh, are the exceptions, I'm pretty sure. So here we have an instance where it goes from 110 to 111, 112. And we can see the page numbers here on the right hand side. So what, what we can do is if we know what page number we're at, we can make a prediction that if the page number that's, if the last number matches that page number, then it's probably not a letter number, rather a page number. So that's one rule that we could actually work out. Another rule that we could work out is if, uh, if these are, I don't know, if they're not moving sequentially, we could try that. So what I want to do now is to start storing something outside. So we're going to make a uh, list letters. And we're going to start appending to this. And what we're going to append is what we find right in here. Uh, and I'm going to convert this at this stage to an entity, possibly, or to an integer, possibly. I'm trying to think right now what I want to do. So let's go ahead and do that. So it's going to be, and what int does is it allows for us to convert that into an integer. And actually, let's just go ahead and do list letters dot append. And then down here, we're going to do the same thing. And I think, oh no, we have to iterate over them. So let's repeat this code here too. Again, never good practice to copy and paste your code, but in this case, it's going to be all right. <laughs> uh, so we need to iterate now over that new data. And let's print off That needs to be stored outside of the loop. Yeah. Cool. So that's the sequence of letters. What we'd like to see, ideally, is a sequence that moves progressively upwards. And I'm thinking what we can do is we can keep track of where we are. And if we see something that's not the next number that one would expect, then what we can do is we can just ignore that number or pass. Our idea here is to have a sequence of numbers that moves up one tick each time, and we'll know on what page each of that each of those things occur. So what we have here should be a list that corresponds roughly to our, our page numbers. We'll have to preserve that in a dictionary once we get this working. But what we have now is a way to kind of tick up sequentially through all of our all of our letters. Again, I'm kind of just thinking out loud here. So let's go ahead and get rid of all this. So we can kind of read this a little bit better. OK, so what we want to do is we want to know our previous i. Ideally, our previous i should be 0 when we start off. And we want to find a way to tick up each time and do a check to see if the number that we're looking at currently, if it is equal to or just one less than i, so or one more than i. So for i in uh, list letters, if i equals previous i, pass. Else, um, elif i is equal to i plus 1. In that case, previous i should be equal to i. So ideally, what we'll have here is the ability to tick gradually upwards. And then in that case, we need to preserve the sequence as well. 
So new sequence is going to be equal to that. And ideally what we'll have, actually by default we'll have this. All right, let's try it. New sequence dot append. We're going to append i to it. I don't know if this will work. Let's see. And it didn't. All right, so what do we do wrong? Oh, we never actually iterated i up. Uh, so for i in list of letters, oh no, we don't need to. So if i is equal to previous i, then pass, then previous, let's just do this, equals i. Or, see, this should be already equal to that there. Um, new sequence to depend on. LF I, let's print I. Okay, get rid of that. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that these are working. So new sequence dot append. Did I spell that right? Yep. LF I is equal to, oh, previous I. I plus one. Now it should work. One, two, three. Fantastic. Cool. So now that that logic is somewhat secure, uh, let's get rid of that. We should see a tick up, and it works up until letter 52. So at 52, we have a break. Hmm. Ah, and here's a case where we've got 58 being 53. So what we'll do is write a rule in. Um, it works up until 57. This is probably not the cleanest way to do it. And we don't have a 58 registered. My suspicion is 58. Hmm. So we can get up to letter 57 this way without an issue. If i is equal to the previous i, We can figure this out. Maybe we need to do it outside of this whole problem. Let's get rid of that. Get rid of that. current letter is equal to uh, zero. Let's again look at our data, see what it looks like. So we're able to go one, two, three. Hmm. 
<laughs> this might be something we have to do by hand. Let's just problem off to the side just for right now. Uh, let's focus on the next steps that we need to think about, though, which are going to be how to handle the uh, the OCR output or the uh, extraction of the extra metadata up at the very top. I'm going to just comment these out for right now and move on to the next problem. And hopefully, we'll be able to figure that bit out when we move up to it. So we're going to iterate over those clean pages again. So for page and clean pages. We are going to be working with, let's print off just the first one, print page. So we have a tentative approach for grabbing uh, to figuring out which page number or which letter number that we're on. Another pr possible approach is going to be to grab uh, this occurrence of a one followed by a period whenever it's followed by some kind of other condition. I haven't figured that part out just yet. And again, if we have to, we might have to go back and restart this problem from the OCR part where we separate these letters out with that little bit of horizontal piece in the original PDF. So let's try not to do that though, but let's think about some other things. So what I wanna to try to do now is on the page, be able to grab or separate everything out by, uh, uh, by on a letter by letter basis. So I think we can still do that possibly without the this whole sequence of letters up above. So what we can look for is, hmm, actually no we can't, we do have to solve that problem first. We can help though, uh, typically a letter is going to start off with a new number and followed by uh, a double line break, double line break, and that new number is going to have a period after it. So we can use regex here. All right, let's write out a regex formula. So we're going to go to regex101.com. This is a great way to kind of just experiment with different uh, regex formulas to try to get it just right to solve your current problem. To, for capturing a string. So this is the string that we're working with. We are going to be looking for a regex equation in which we have a line break. I can't remember how to actually preserve line breaks in regex. I think it's a slash n slash r slash r slash n. Uh, let me see if I can remember how to do it. Um, oh, it is just a slash n. Okay, great. A slash n followed by a a digit of some sort, which can be anything from one to uh, three digits long, followed by some kind of a punctuation, let's just stick with period, followed by an N, another line break. And this sequence is always going to return for us a letter, that's our working theory at least. A double line break. Let's stick with that. So what we can do is we can iterate over all these pages and we can try to see where these numbers actually, the sequence of events occurs. Let's go ahead and back to our uh, regex or our uh, Jupyter lab here. And let's say uh, we're going to try to find, uh, we'll just do find all. Uh, so we're going to say matches is going to be equal to re.findall. And we're going to pass in that formula that we just wrote. And we're going to print off matches. Now, it should run, turn, oh, it helps if you actually pass the string to do the match on. Uh, so in this case, we found it. So we found the one there. Our goal is to hopefully find it on the next page as well. And it does, but there's two occurrences of that. This might be a good way to capture it and get a sense for when. So we know that letter three is long. So the fact that that's doing that is perfect. And uh, we want to see four captured as well, but we're not seeing four captured. So something's happening where number four is not being found. So let's go to where four starts. So we're still on three there, three and four. So the OCR on this page might be where it's not a double line break. That might be returning something really close. Let's change that double line break to just a single line break. And it grabbed it. Cool. All right, so this is working so far. Our goal is that this works for every letter. Let's try just 100 just to get a sense. Uh, so we're going up. We've missed letter 7. My guess is it occurs in this one. Uh, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Uh, we don't have 11 either. 
So we're going to have instances where we miss things with this approach. But I'm thinking right now, I'll get rid of that, that we can use this approach as a way to assist our earlier method. So we can use this method in tandem with this method. I'm not sure how yet, but I think we can. All right, let's go ahead and do this, iterate over everything. Uh, so if the length of matches is greater than uh, zero, print matches. And ideally what we'll see is it, it tick up individually all the way down. It's pretty good. This is a pretty good approach. And the good news is, is we're not getting any real false positives. And it even can account for, uh, this is actually, no, I just said we don't get any false positives. We have right here, but this is a lot less false positives, fewer false positives than we had a, a moment earlier. So this is a good way to actually kind of analyze this real quickly, 41, 42, excellent. Now let's find a way to, to get all these into sequential order to kind of figure out if we've missed anything. So here's a case where we don't have a punctuation here. So why is this being returned as a match? Oh, I got to comment that out. So I have it where it can be anything. So in regex, uh, the period actually stands for any character. Now that might be actually more problematic. So it can actually be a comma or or a period. So let's see. I think we can we can work with this output. So let's start keeping track of all these. So sequence. So for we'll do this for match and matches, we're going to um, let's do our same way of getting rid of all of our our digits. So for match and matches, match is going to be equal to that, and D is going to be replaced with match. And then we should be able to do sequence uh, pinned match print sequence. And what we want to see is a, is a tick up each time. And it's a lot better than what our last output looked like when we were trying to do this with, with the header data. And we can see that we've missed a couple. But we can write a simple rule for grabbing the places where that occurs and do some manual checks there. Again, we're going to have to do some manual validation. This is just saving me hours and hours of time so I don't have to always check every single thing. So let's go ahead and see if the previous i, previous i is going to be equal to 0. So if i is equal to previous i, plus one, print, uh, pass, else, print i. We can see where this breaks with this real fast. Uh, and it's not worked for me. <laughs> uh, so if previous, oh, that's because I have to actually change the previous i. So previous i is going to be equal to i. And now, Hmm. Oh. So that should be. If you're just now joining, we're trying to figure out a way to iterate over all of Alquin's letters from our OCR output to try to figure out where, on which pages a. Um, a letter changes or there's multiple change uh, multiple letters on a single page and so we've got a, a good rule for capturing uh, where these major changes occur and what we're trying to figure out now is where our rules-based approach missed something or something was uh, returned as an uh, as an error Oh, 
figured out the whole problem. <laughs> I don't have this actually saved as an integer. <laughs> that's uh, that's the issue. Uh, so Python was reading it as a string. I is equal to int i. Now we should be a lot better. It's going to have a couple errors for us. And we can see that we already have our first one occurring uh, with letter 6. And so what we can do now So the first error occurs with our sequence. Let's put the sequence up here. So we can see we have a jump here from 7 to 8. So we need to figure out that's going to be one thing. We know that we can iterate correctly from until we get to 7. And it's going to work again until we get to 12 because we're missing an 11. Twelve, thirteen. Hmm. <laughs> All right. So once we get past eleven, twelve. Oh, because it's stopping there. Okay. After that, it looks like. Hmm. Hang on. goes from 12 to 33. Oh, that's why. Zero. Might just be faster to do this part manually. All right, so we know that we're going to have exceptions. They're going to be uh, number 7. So it keeps on going correct. Uh, 8, 9, 10, 11 is missed. Uh, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 30, 32. So it goes from 97, 98, and then we can ignore that 697. Um, so we're going to have another one called skipped. It's going to be equal to that number. Where was I at? So we're going to skip that number. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine.
Again, I'm just making sure that these are following, ticking up in the proper sequence. Then once I know the exceptions to write in, we can run the script again, and it should be we should be able to uh, skip those places where those errors occur and know exactly when and where our letters change pages, which is going to be important for structuring them as individual pages in just a second. So we go from 79, that's looking good, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84. It looks like we got an error right there, so 18 has got to be an exception to skip. Um, I'll have to figure out a good way to skip it because that's going to be a real number as well. We'll figure that out when we get to it. Uh, so 84 is correct. Make a little mental note here for myself. After 184, right? No, after 183. So 800 is another one that we're going to be skipping. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 801. Looks like we're missing a uh, 40. So exceptions, we're going to have... 240 worked into that list. Okay, 802. I'm really wondering what's leading to these 802 or these 800 numbers now. Uh, so 802, we're going to be skipping. Seventy, seventy-one, seventy-two, seventy-three, seventy-four, five. Almost done. <laughs> eighty-one, eighty-two. Ninety-one, ninety-two, ninety-three, ninety-four, ninety-five. Okay, this is gonna be another one we have to write in because that's gonna be number five when it's preceded by when it comes after where was it at 295 296 789 all right cool 203 or 4 5 6 7 308 309 310 excellent so i think we've got only a few exceptions that we have to kind of think about and i don't think it's going to be too difficult we're going to have to figure out manually where where um, letter 11 begins and we're going to have to figure out manually actually we're going to figure out manually where each of these letters begin and we can do that. That's not an issue. It's only checking four things. But it means we don't have to actually manually type in all this data, which would be tedious. And then we can skip, make, we can get rid of all these. We're going to make a separate list for 18 and 5 because these occur later. I think we can work with that pretty easily, though. Okay. So I know that I can now grab figure out when these letters change. I know exactly the exceptions to work in. Let's see if we can write these exceptions now in. So we're going to say for I in sequence, we're going to do this all over again. I think it's going to work this time though. We're going to do the same thing, keep track of where we were. Just is just to make sure that we uh, that we didn't miss anything. Uh, so for I in sequence, if int if I I equals int I, so make sure we convert it to an integer first. So if I is then we're gonna make previous I equal to I. That's going to allow us to tick up, but we're going to hit the same exact problem that we hit the last time. Which was, it's going to stop. Oh, 
previous i. There we go. It's going to stop at, uh, what am I doing wrong now? Oh, there we go. It's going to stop at six, but we can make these exceptions. So if So if i is in exceptions, then we're going to say, oh, if i is not going to be in exceptions. So if previous i, i is, is equal to exceptions x, so we'll just remember where we are in that. If previous i is equal to minus one is equal to exception on x, then previous i is going to be equal to um, previous i plus one. And this way we can kind of tick up through this. So we're going to keep track of x equals zero out here. And anytime that happens, we'll do x equals x plus one, which means we'll tick through each of those. Now, if we run this, we still have the same problem. All right, so what's going on now? So we've gone up, we're looking through, it's getting to eight, and it's we have it go into this, if previous i minus one. So it's looking, no, we want to do if previous i plus one. Cool, that worked. That got us to 152 without any problems. And if I remember correctly, 152 is where this problem starts to kick in, or at least around there. Um, so 152, 151, 152. So we missed one. This is a great way. So we, we didn't realize that we skipped 153. So let's go ahead and put that in. And we get up to 176. So this is a great way to kind of troubleshoot and figure out where we missed things. We didn't have 177 in there. So this is where human eyes create lots of problems. Um, and what's happening now? And I think this is now where we're getting into these problems, the 796. So 796 is occurring up there. We're just pretty much skipping that, I think, for right now. So that's good. Uh, so it's getting to the 18. Maybe that's what's doing it. Let's find out what's happening. So we're going to be printing off i until we get to that error. So it's wherever 241 is at. It's happening before that. So it's happening before 241. That means there's probably one that comes after 241. So there's one other letter that we haven't thought about or haven't taken into account, 42344. 4. Well, we're going to do this then. Um, so the index error is occurring at that stage. So we can say try, try that, and if there's an index error, print i. Ah, oh, right there. So 240 is accounted for, so it's 241. Hmm. Thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, two forty, two forty-one.
Okay, so let's keep on trying to figure this out. Times by 7, 48, 49, 50. Okay, so we have the exceptions at the very least. I don't see another problem here. Oh, I see the problem. I don't have another one listed. Cool. No, so there wasn't a problem. So what was happening was it was going in through this loop and it was checking to see if there were anything, uh, anything ne like the next available one each time because X was being incremented upwards. And uh, even though there wasn't another error for the rest of this list, uh, it was still going back and doing that search and it was bouncing it back. So we've got a sense of all the ones that are our exceptions that we can kind of work into as into this as rules. And we can use the sequence that we just coded out here uh, and we can bring that into our script up here so that as we go through and find all of these current uh, these pages where the current letters are, we can also kind of use these rules to understand not only what the current letter is, uh, but also uh, where that current letter changes. And you'll see why how I can do that in just a second. So we've got all this information. I have to go back and kind of think about how I did it. This one didn't work, so we can get rid of that. Let's go ahead and just delete that entirely. Uh, so we know how our sequence works, so we can find the sequence this way. All right, cool. So if we can find the sequence in this manner, and we know that the exceptions are right here, we can work these exceptions now, as we just did, into our initial search. Let's make a dictionary now. Uh, so let's call it a seek dict. It's going to be equal to a dictionary. And for this, we're going to preserve, if this occurs, then what we want to do is we want to make the sick dict and we're gonna do the page. We're gonna do I. Let's do a new number. Page num. Uh, equals 18, because we started 18, right? So our goal here is to know where these changes kind of occur. So we're going to keep track of where we start and where we end. So our ideal sequence data will be the page number. So we're going to keep track of that. And we're also going to keep track of the match. Make a temporary So hits.append match, and then we're going to make that equal to hits. And so we'll know where these changes occur now by page number. So we can do sequence dict, print that off. And so we know that at page 18, we've got letter 1. At page 19, we've got letters 2 and 3. And 3 continues on all the way until we get to letter 29, where 4 starts five, six, all the way on down the list. And now we don't really need to, to guess where seven starts. We can make a presumption that it's on page 32, I would think, in this scenario. So seven is on page 32, but it starts at the end of page, uh, at page 31, which contains letters five, six, and seven. So for whatever reason, the seven is not getting OCR'd correctly. Let me look at page number 32 now, just to get a sense of why that's occurring. Okay. Oh, ignore that. Let's 
that's about the right page. Oh, that's why. So page 32 is actually 18. <laughs> I'm not going to do the math here. Let's do 10 just to kind of find it real fast. Okay. Thirty-one. Cool. Okay, so what's happening here with letter seven? So in this case, there's a space there, but we know that it occurs on the page prior. So let's go to thirteen again. And then fourteen. In this case, there's no punctuation following seven. So this could be part of the problem. I'm kind of nervous now at this point to work into a rule that doesn't require that. But just to see how it works, let's get rid of this punctuation. So let's just delete that entirely. It's not going to be an issue. And let's see what happens now if I run it on just that page. It catches it. Now my concern is that I just figured out all these rules to not have to deal with that. And let me do this. And as I suspected, um, so what we can do is we can do slash n and make it where it's possible that it's there. It could be there and it could not be there. I'm kind of happy that all these are zero. It means I can write the exception in for seven pretty easily. So I do that. Mm, that should be right. Let me just copy and paste this in one more time to our regex over here. For whatever reason, this is not working. Okay. All right. So we can just probably do it like this then. Not sure why that regex command isn't working, but for whatever reason it's not. So we, we know that seven's not gonna actually be found. And so th what this'll do is it'll return anything that matches either one of these categories. So let's do in parentheses, it can be that, or it can be that. And in regex, the lineup is or and again that's not working what is going on here okay well we know where at least generally where seven will be plotted so we'll have to make a um, a deduction or figure out how to add these exceptions in now all right so if the length of hits is less than zero we need to keep track of where we previously were so we're going to take this is the previous i that we just figured out a second ago so we need to take this code that we just kind of worked out and we're going to actually copy and paste all of it up here for right now and then kind of translate this code down into our initial loop so that we can actually uh, run uh, follow these rules as we kind of go through now. So we know what the exceptions are going to be. And so what we want to do is we want to keep track of the previous i. Let's go ahead and get rid of that one there. And then we're going to go through and uh, say if hit and hits. Let's go ahead and convert this to an int right now at this stage. And... There we go. Uh, what we want to know is we want to iterate over each of these. Okay, so it's at this stage. So if the previous i is equal to our exceptions x plus 1, So we're trying to tick up i with each of these as well. 
I think this is going to work. So let's just try this and see if it works that easily. No, it does not. All right. So in this case, we need to make sure. Oh, it's the match. We need to check to see if it match if previous i is equal to exceptions x. OK, that's fine. And then we're going to have that if match equals previous i plus 1. Previous i is going to be ticked up 1. Hmm. Well, you know what? This actually doesn't matter that much because we can actually manually kind of go in and put where these five exceptions actually are going to be. So we've only got a few things to manually input. So we're going to go ahead and just comment those out. Actually, we're going to use those. The um, If it's going to be in the skipped category, we're going to skip it because those are not going to be correct. Uh, so let's go through and find an example of one of those. So I think 800 was one. Okay, cool. So that's going to be on page 341. Again, I don't know why. So what we're going to say is if um, if match is not in skipped, and I misspelled skipped, actually let's just call these the ones to skip because they not in skip, then that. And we are going to keep track of the previous I. because okay and the reason for that is we don't need to keep that there we can keep track of where we're at in the sequence to know if we're above or below 18 so let's go ahead and do that as well See. Okay, so if we are at that stage, uh, which that what do they call that in others? If it's in others, then what we want to do is we want to make sure that it's still if match is less than previous i. So if it's, no, if it's uh, greater than. Hmm. That didn't work. Might just ignore that one for right now. And we'll just manually clean these up. So let's go ahead and try to get this saved as a JSON file. So we've got a good understanding of where our data is going to be changing on which page numbers. And then what we're going to do with that is we're going to just do some manual cleaning right now. So we know where these letters begin, where they end. So let's go ahead and save our, uh, we're gonna import JSON. Let's go ahead and import it up at the very top. And we're gonna say uh, with open data, see letter changes.json w for write 
Uh, I don't think we're going to worry about encoding here. It's all numbers. Uh, JSON.dump. I always forget the order here. I think this is the right one, but it might be wrong. Uh, I'm going to do equals to four, and I did it backwards. Yeah. So I'm going to see connect F. There we go. And what JSON let us, lets us do is just kind of store this data real easily outside of Python. So we should have all that now in our data subfolder. Go back and letter changes. So what we have are the places where our letters change. And then what we're going to do now is we're going to pull up Atom because there's not a real easy way to do this in uh, within a Jupyter lab. And we're going to edit that file. And we're going to actually do the manual annotations so we know where the changes actually occur. Let's go ahead and open it back up. And Atom. All right. Here we are. So this is our file in Atom. And so I know that on page 18, that's right, that's right. Uh, the thing that was different was where uh, 7 starts. And 7, we discovered, does start on on that page, on page 31. Let me pull this over to the other side for a second so I can look at my other exceptions that I have to write in. So the next thing I need to look for is where does 11 start. So if I look at my other list, it's probably going to be on page uh, 36. So we pull Adam back over. Uh, we see that uh, 10 happens on 35. So it's going to happen somewhere in that range. So now I can pull that up into my final images. And let's go, what was the range? It was 36-ish, somewhere in there. And again, I'm making these manual annotations right now. So it claims that 11 starts here, but we don't actually see it until page 37. So on page 37, that's where 11 and 12 both are. Let me close some of these windows. It's not really a big need to have them all open. And again, you're getting to see kind of the, the mistakes that happen through this whole process and how you kind of fix them. So the next one we have to figure out is 32. So if I scroll down through my Atom sheet, which I have on the other screen right now, I can see that 32 probably starts on page 73 or thereabouts. Let's open up page 73. 32 does in fact start on 73. So I'm gonna manually annotate that. And then the next thing I have to figure out is 153. Let's scroll all the way down to my Atom sheet. And 248, somewhere in that range. I'm going to go down to page 248. Ah, this is an exception. So we're going to have... Uh, so what was the one I'm looking for? Is it 143? So it doesn't appear on that page, and it doesn't appear on this page. So it does appear on 248. So that's kind of good news. The reason why that one didn't come out was because it was... It's one of our exception pages. So that's not really an issue with the rules that we wrote. It's more of an issue with the page that was fed into it. So the next one is 177. And on my Atom sheet, I'm looking, and it's going to be somewhere around 292 to 294. So 292 to 294. Let's pull that up. And was it 177? It was. That occurs on 292. Excellent. I'm happy with that. And then my next exception and my final one, because we would just put that in there uh, to keep our rules from breaking, is 240. So now we have to figure out where 240 is at. So scrolling on the way down. Page 385. It's probably going to be on that page or thereabouts. And again, it's one of those exception pages. That's good means we only had a few things that we weren't able to catch with our rules. So this is the end of lever 240, letter 240. And I can safely assume that it's on page 385 now. So 385 is 240. And now all I have to do in the uh, JSON file is I just need to get rid of these things and these things. So I'm going to go through. So let's do the 18 and 5 first. So we're going to look for 18. So that's correct. That's correct. Uh, that's correct because it's right before or after 17 and before 19. Uh, that's fine. That's fine. Oh, no. <laughs> All 
Oh, there we go. That's it right there. So that's the problematic number, 18. Save this just to be safe. And then five, uh, we're going to have five followed by a bracket. I don't think it's going to register it that way. Nope. All right, where did five occur in our sequence? Let me go ahead and print this off and look for five followed by a bracket. And we'll be able to find it really easily. It's under page 452. So 452. Saving that. And then uh, the last thing I need to work out are these three in correct numbers. These would be a lot easier to five, seven, nine, six isn't in there. Oh, and I think I actually wrote the rule so that it doesn't include them. Just do a double check, 801, not in there, and 802, it's not in there. Fantastic. So now what I have is a manually cleaned JSON file of every letter. I didn't have to do this by hand. This would have taken a lot longer to do by hand, but I not only know every letter, I, uh, I know on which page every letter starts. So now I have a set of data, a data set, that I can use to get a good indication of how I need to split up all of my pages. So if I want to grab page or letter one, I know that I need to grab everything on pages 18 and possibly 19. Possibly. That's not a, a definite. Um, but I know I need to grab everything from at least uh, on 18 no matter what. If I'm looking to grab everything for letter two, it's only ever going to be on page 19 because page two has both 19 and Two. And now I can write a rule. If I want to grab letter three, I'm going to grab three until a page number corresponds to, uh, to four. So that's how we're going to kind of grab all this data and get letters organized or get the entire data set, the, the raw text of all 400 pages, now organized not by page number, but by letter number. Oh, hi. So let's go ahead and start tackling that problem now. I'm going to push Adam over to the side. All right. And we've got that bit of code now worked out. We've got it saved as a JSON file. I'm going to comment this out so I don't accidentally overwrite that file. Um, and I'm actually going to make another little change. We're going to duplicate it. And we're going to call this... Um, validated. So now that we've got that figured out, we can go ahead and probably start working with a, a new notebook because now we can separate these letters out by, oh, helps if I keep the dot JSON. Now we can separate the letters out by, uh, or all the pages out by individual letters and start tackling problems on a letter by letter basis, which is going to be a little bit easier to manage since there's only going to be uh, 310 letters. We can do this pretty quickly. So let's make a new notebook now. Ooh, cancel. And we're going to call this one um, letter collection or letter separator. There we go. So again, we're going to import JSON. Uh, we're going to import RE just in case we need to. I don't know if we'll have to work with it, uh, but that should be all we need here. So we're going to open up two things. The first thing we need to open up is our JSON data. So we're going to say with open, I think I have it under data, um, validated letter changes, validated.json, and that's in my data subfolder. What we're going to do with that is we're just going to read it real fast. Open it up as F. We're going to say uh, letter letter sequence equals uh, json.read. And we're going to just read in F. And oh, json.load, I think is how it goes. There we go. Uh, now we're going to print off letter sequence just to make sure our data is loaded in correctly. And it is. Cool. So we can iterate over this, right? So we can say for i and letter uh, sequence print i. And then we can also now do print 
so we can get not only uh, what the key is, but also the value, which is going to be important. So now we can kind of go through and use this information to find where these new pages end and where these new pages begin. And we're going to also need to therefore open up all of our text files. So we're going to say, or all of our, our whole text files, we're going to say with open and let's call, let's grab, we're going to call this just backup instead of copy one. So in case we make some kind of bad mistake with it and overwrite it, all text.txt, we're going to read it. And this is in the data subfolder as well. As F. And I think I had it encoded as UTF-8. So let's do that as well. And text is going to be equal to, uh, let's do letters actually, or pages. Pages is going to be equal to text.read. And we're going to do dot split. And we're going to split by, uh, I think, end of page is what I used. So that way we get all the different pages. And we should have, let's print that off. Uh, text is not defined. Oh, f.read. There we go. Yeah, cool. Great. So now as we iterate over this, we need to grab uh, everything in that list. So let's go ahead and we're going to start off. So we're going to say um, page index is going to be equal to i minus 18. So let's print off page index, or sorry, um, pages, page index. So you can kind of see how this is going to work. So we're only going to iterate over the first thing here. Oh, yeah. Oh. Oh. Hey, thank you so much for that. That was bothering me. I didn't know um, didn't know what I was doing wrong there. So someone just gave a great comment on what we what we got wrong. Uh, looks like they're following. They're about fifty minutes behind uh, on the chat. So thank you for that. Actually, I'm gonna um, thank him for that in the chat. So um, let's go ahead and uh, and think about what's going on here. So if we get uh, if we're gonna iterate over each of these. And we're going to try and, let's see, print letter sequence just to make sure we got what's going on here correct. And this is the problem. It's a, um, it's not an integer, so let's do that. Cool. So we're able to actually um, go through now and grab the pages that actually correspond to it. So if we know where it begins, we need to next know where it ends. Let me just comment this out because this is going to get quite tedious. So if we know where the page begins, so that's going to be where the index is. What we need to do is we need to look up forward and figure out the letter sequence where it kind of ends. So we know that 18 is going to be, is going to end with 19. So what we want to do is we want to look forward and see if the index of the next highest integer, if that has a list. And if it does, then that means that we want to index, we want to iterate over that list. So let's do um, next page. Let's do the next page lookup. Or do we want to iterate over that letter sequence again? Let's try that. Uh, it's going to be a better way to do this. We'll figure it out later. So we're going to say for T and letter sequence, again, bad practice here, but we're just going to do this. It'll be faster. Uh, we're going to say, uh, what do we want to say? If letter sequence T, add something else up here first. Uh, we're going to say if the length Current letter. Let's make a so all these. So we're going to iterate over if okay. So if letter sequence uh, i if the length of that 
length of that is greater than zero, that means that there's a letter within it. So if it's greater than zero, let's kind of start working with this problem. So if it's greater than zero, then what we want to do is we want to say that current letter is equal to, let's say if it's equal to one for right now, we'll see why in just a second. If it's equal to one, then we want to say current letter is equal to current letter is equal to actually um, letter sequence I zero. And so that's going to allow us to do is to tick up. But we're going to have some instances where it's going to be equal to two because there's going to be two letters on a page. And I think there's a couple with three. So we're going to need to think about how we handle that problem in just a second. But for right now, we're trying to solve how to kind of keep track of where we are and the, the length. So from beginning to actual end. Hey, Clum. So right now we've just figured out how to extract automatically the sequence length. And so we found where every single letter begins on each page and also uh, more importantly, where the next letter starts. So now we're trying to figure out a good way to iterate over everything and figure out the length of a page. So if a letter starts on page 18, when is there a next occurrence of a letter? And then if there is a next occurrence, finding the difference between those two. So we know where to start and where to end when we start to kind of grab all of our letters. So we're going to do another forward check. Actually, we could be. Let's get rid of that. So if the length is one, we know that there's going to be a new occurrence. So we're going to keep order of letters. So letter pages is going to be that. Empty dictionary. So we're going to try to keep track of the pages for each letter. So we know that a letter will begin consistent, will consistently have a place as long as we keep ticking up and there's not a length. So if the length of the next one is greater than zero, then we know we're a letter likely the latest possible place for a letter. So let's go ahead and so sequence. So temp sequence is going to be equal to that. Sequence.append. So, so long as that is less than that, we're going to temp sequence dot append So this is going to let us look forward one occurrence. Let's make i equal to and i here. It's going to make life a lot easier for us. Let's see how that works. Might do it. Uh, letter pages. We're just gonna go up. And we got a problem. 483. Uh, because there's no key. Yeah. Um
less than 483. Don't do that. Cool. All right. So now we need to make sure that that's appended. So we're going to else temp sequence is going to be terminated. It's going to be equal to an empty list again. But before we do that, we need to letter pages i is going to be equal to so in this case we're looking for the first letter is equal to the temp sequence Well, that didn't work. <laughs> All right, so if it's less than 43, we need to figure out the sequence now. Um, if we look forward and the length is less than zero, oh, it's less than, it's equal to zero. So one's gonna be equal to that. All right, that's wrong. We're on the right track though, at the very least. Um, letter equals letter num plus one, cool. So this is never getting actually triggered. Letter pages. Oh, that's why. Cool. So I got to just make a couple corrections because this is not right. I've got it start at zero. There we go. Hmm. So I'm off by one page, but everything else is looking right. So I got to figure out now how to fix this just a little bit so that, oh no, it's right. Letter one's on that page, but two and three are on the same page. Oh, it's because that length is not equal to we got multiple ones in this case. So two and three both appear on the same letter. So I have to work that rule in. Otherwise it's working pretty well. So if the sequence is equal to zero, that rule is going to work. L if the length is equal to, is greater than, is equal to, it's greater than one then we need to do something a little different. If it's greater than one, then we need to do something like that. Yeah, that's not right. It's greater than one, that means that there's going to be two pages on the same page. So if there's two pages on the same page, then what we need to do is we need to let's see, if there's two pages on the same page we need to have a special condition where we So it's going to be on the same page, which means it's going to be I. So we need to iterate over each of these. So for L on actually, we need to check that condition right here a little higher. So if the length of letter sequence
i is greater than one, this is where we have to have the conditions. Because it means that the letter So we need to iterate over each of the letters. So for letter n, and letter sequence i, the page number needs to tick up. I and we need to say letter sequence I is equal to temp seek and then we need to clear it once again uh, what did I do wrong letter sequence is not defined oh letter pages Okay, well that's wrong. Hmm. And this would work perfectly if we didn't have a case where there were uh, two letters on the same page. So if there's two letters on the pain, same page, or more than one, let's go back through the logic. If there's more than one letter on the page, then we need to do something a little differently. We need to say that letter sequence letter num is equal to just that one i. And then we need to make sure that we tick up the letter number. And then we need to write this exception right here, but not with plus one, rather with one. If that's equal to a zero, then this set of rules kicks in. Get rid of that. And what are we doing wrong? I have for I in letter sequence. The dictionary size changed. Oh, whoops. Means I have to reload this back in. Okay, cool. The length of All these should be lists.
With the length of the letter sequence. the problem here. How am I iterating over each of those? Well, this is a particularly annoying problem. If anyone does have a suggestion for how to figure this out, I'm all ears. Essentially, we're trying to figure out the span of pages based on when a letter gets uh, when a letter changes. So we've got the data for where each letter is or starts on each page, and some pages have got two, and so that's kind of been the problem: is what do you do with these pages that are that have an individual or have two letters on them? I can tick through each one and find the span for. Uh, pages that have no, uh, no letters in between. So we go from three all the way down to page uh, 28, which is going to be when four starts on page 29. But I can't figure out for the life of me uh, how to actually structure uh, the data in between. So figuring out, looking ahead in the dictionary to figure out when page number 19 is introduced, if that has a length So let's go ahead and try to figure this out. All right, let's start from scratch. So we're gonna iterate over each letter sequence. Okay, everything's working fine. So what we can do is we know at which point in this chain a new number is introduced. So we know this is always going to be a list. So we can say Okay. Cool. Hey, thank you so much. Once we figure out this problem, the rest should go a lot more easily. All right, so if we know what letter number it is, we can tick up. Uh, so let's do that. Let's go through. So if 
the length of letter sequence i is greater than zero, then we know that a change occurs. So we need to figure out what change that might be. All right, cool. Let's go ahead and do this then. I think I can figure it out. All right. So this is gonna be the current page. It's 18. So current page. So we want to iterate up with each current page as we kind of go through. We're going to keep this out here. We'll start off on 18 and work our way up. So as we work our way up, so we can make a letter pages x equal to we need to know where it starts and where it ends so if we know that it starts there it's always going to start on that page so x we can set up x Let's see if this works. We're going to print off. That'll give us at least always the start. Cool. No, nope, didn't really. Oh, no, hang on. Oh, we're going to have letter page X. That's going to be equal to uh, I, actually. So we know that letter one starts in 18, two on 19, three on 19. There we go. All right, that's looking a lot better. So now we know where they start. Now all we gotta do is figure out where they end. That should be a little bit easier to figure out now. Uh, so if we know where each letter starts, actually, uh, now we can iterate through this as well. Uh, so now we can say for, actually, let's just save that now. It's, that's one piece of the problem figured out. Uh, so let's go ahead, make sure that's right. Great. So now what we can do is we can iterate over our letter pages for letter and letter pages. We can say, um, look ahead one letter and whatever that next page ends on, that's gonna be where we end. So we're gonna, and we're gonna have to make an exception for the last one, but we, we can worry about that in a second. So what we wanna say is start is going to be equal to letter pages letter and let's make the start let's make that an end make a life a little bit easier and the end is going to be equal to letter going to make this an end letter pages letter plus one And so we should be able to print off start and end, and it's going to throw an error when we get to the very end because it's not going to be a, a key error, probably. Yep, for 311. Awesome. So we got the start and the end of each letter now. Cool, that problem solved. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, letter data is going to be equal to uh, empty dictionary. And then we're going to say uh, letter data letter is going to be equal to start end and then we don't really have to worry about this if letter is uh, less than 310 do that 
else? What's the last page that we have? It's 481. Cool. So 481. So that should work. And we got a return error. Letters less than 310. Hmm, not sure why that's not working. Oh, it's still doing the lookup. There we go. Now we should be able to print off our letter data, and we've got the start and the end of every single letter now. I know that didn't look like a, a lot of information for that much work, but that would have been very tedious to have to do. And again, I'm trying to set up a workflow where this can be replicated for other collections of letters, letters down the road. And there's many, many collections of letters. Uh, many, many uh, hundreds and thousands, or just thousands of pages of, of letters in the MGH. So now we know where each letter starts and where each letter ends, or at least approximately. Um, it's pretty good. Uh, we're going to probably have a couple that we have to manually validate because a letter might go up until a certain point. It might grab, actually, no, every single time, if, if there is a case of that happening, it's going to have duplicate pages for six and five, for example. So if we look, double, I want to kind of validate this. Letter five should begin, the beginning should always be correct. It should begin on page 30, and in fact it does, and it should go until 31, and it does. So it begins and ends. That's, that's a very good sign when you see that being validated. So we got the letter sequence, we got the letter data. I'm going to take a quick break because that took a lot of mental capacity, and I'll be coming back to this in uh, just a few minutes. Uh, if you want to, feel free to post questions, and I'll try to answer them as best I can. Uh, but I'll be back in about five to ten minutes.
Okay, I'm back. Let's see. So where we just left off was we were able to figure out where every letter starts on every single page and where they end. So now let's make a new notebook that's actually, actually first let's save this data. So we need to do um, JSON with open uh, data and we can do something like uh, letter sequences. Make sure that's not what I named the previous file letter changes so letter uh, page spans let's do that letter page spans dot json and we're gonna make that right as f and we're gonna now uh, do json dot dump and we're gonna do letter data uh, f and indent is gonna be equal to what indent is gonna be equal to four and that should give us everything we need and we should have this as a data file now. Page spans, wonderful. So letter one begins on 18, ends on 19. Two begins on 19, ends on 19, etc. on down the list. Now we are gonna sometimes have a case where the letter end page is gonna be maybe one less. And that's gonna be something we're gonna work on later on when we do some manual kind of cleaning. And while this looks like a long a mistake that's actually accurate, Letter three is very long. If you've been on this stream since the beginning, you'll know that letter three is actually that council. So let's go ahead and close these pages. We don't really need this anymore. So that was our next big hurdle kind of done, was separating out, separating out the, the letters, or at least finding the page spans for them. So now we're gonna make a new notebook, and again, trying to keep these things as compartmentalized as we can. We're gonna call this 04, and this is gonna be where we try to use the um, the page spans to reconstruct our letters. So construct letters, let's call it something like that. And again, we're gonna be using JSON. I think we might be using regex here. I'm not entirely sure. We'll figure it out as we go. So like in the last time, I'm gonna have to open up two sets of data. Uh, the first is going to be my pages. Let's close that. And um, let's execute that, make sure that's right, good. And then the next thing I need to have, I'm gonna call this my page spans. So what we need to do now is we need to start reconstructing these pages based on these page spans. So I think I call this letter, oh gosh, I already forgot. Letter page spans, all right. So page underscore spans, and I have my page spans. Let me print off page spans just to make sure it's precisely what I want, excellent. So we should be able to iterate through this and have the start of each new letter be the new page. So let's comment that out. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say for um, span and page spans, we're going to grab the end or the start and the end is gonna be equal to page spans span. And we didn't get an error, so that's good. We know that that works. Now what we need to do is we need to construct it. So if we know that the start and the end are going to be the beginning of the, so we can do pages, pages, start. Mm, actually, let's just do this. If start does not equal end, so this is a case where it doesn't occur on the same page, then we are going to say that uh, the letter pages the letter text is going to be equal to pages uh, start to end. So if it's on page uh, 19, it'll go up to 19 at plus 1, I think is what we need to do. We'll see in just a second. Else, so this is the case where the, the start and the end are the exact same. So if the start and the end are the same, we know that the pages, the letter text is just going to be wherever the start is. And that's just going to be the page. So what we can do now, all letter texts are going to be equal to that. And we're going to do letter text equals, mm, how should we separate this out? Let's do, let's just separate and join it together like this. So we're just going to join with the space dot join uh, letter text. 
and then what we're going to do all letter text uh, append letter text so if we execute this three ten and there's that many letters so this is a good a good way to manually validate that everything we've just done was right fantastic all right, let's move forward now. All right, so now we need to iterate over each of these letters. So we can say for letter and all letter texts, and we need to just validate real fast that we did, in fact, index this correctly. I'm having a little bit of a blank. Uh, letter, sh this should just be page one. And we've got a problem because it's giving me uh, page one and page 37. What? Uh, let's see. <laughs> okay, so let's print off span. One, two, three, four. Okay. Let's make this a dictionary then, just to figure out what's going on. And we're going to call that span. equals letter text. Was it a string? It was a string. And this is showing up as that. So that's odd. Let's print off page spans again. Ah, that's why. Okay, cool. Oh, this is this is a good problem. It was because I was indexing not the right way. So you have to do uh, start minus 17, which is going to put us on the correct index. So uh, remember, the page index is off because they start the letters start on page 18. And I wasn't taking that into account. No problem. Uh, this should solve it. No problem there. OK, so the start minus 17. No, no, start minus 18. Uh, start minus 18. And then we need to do n plus 1 minus 18. I guess I could just do plus 17. Yeah, let's just do that. OK, now, now. Our world should be a lot better. <laughs> so epistoli 1, and it's grabbed 1, and 2, and 3. Hmm. Am I iterating over everything here? Oh. Uh, no, I did that wrong. So it needs to be minus 17. There we go. Again, just verifying everything. Cool. That works. And it needs to be minus 18, so I index it correctly as well. There we go. Now, index is out of range. Hmm. Oh, wait, no. Minus 17. That was right. Uh, this needs to be... Hmm. So 18 does go to, or 1 does go from 8 to 19 in our list. This is one of those cases where it bleeds over just marginally. It's enough where it causes it to have that. So we can, we're going to include that for right now and just not worry about it and come up with a rule where if one of these regex catches happens at the very top of the page right after this, then what we're going to do is we're going to presume that that's actually not where it should be. So let's go ahead and write that right now. So if that is the case, 
uh, then what we want to do is we're going to want to look at the the last page. So we're going to want to look at this page right here. All right, so last page is going to be equal to pages uh, that. And so what we want to say, let's comment this out for right now. Actually, let's leave it. Um, if it's probably going to be always 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. It's probably always going to be the fourth position. Hmm. It's not split lines. Uh, so if last page, make sure 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 equals, uh, let's say if it equals that regex expression that we came up a while back with, let's go back and find it. It was a good one. Where did it go? All right, now we're going to go here. Cool. So what we're going to do now is we're going to say that if if we find a hit like this in the fourth line, then what we want to do is we want to presume that the end should be a different, should be, um, it should just be a single page or it should be the prior page. So let's go ahead and, and try this out. So if that's going to be equal to that, so if now if the length of matches is going to be greater than zero. Uh, now we're going to know that it's going to have been found. Let's just print off matches so we can kind of see this happening. Um, so cool, 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 cool. All right. So these are all instances where that last page is going to have that occurrence that happen on the fourth line. Hmm. Seems pretty consistent all the way down. Oh, oh, oh there we go. Printing off the wrong thing. So last page four, uh, we got an index error. All right, so if it doesn't have, that's gonna be one of those blank exception pages that we have to figure out how to work through each time. Try uh, that, uh, accept index error, and then we're gonna say matches, um, and matches will be equal to empty list. So what we wanna see is for the fourth line to grab that for us and I'm not seeing it right now and we know that it happens in this case on uh, on the very first one so let's go ahead and maybe it wasn't the fourth line one two three let's print hmm Ah, I know why. Uh, we gotta strip out the whole last page first. All right, so looks like we have been able to grab a couple of those instances. And what we're looking for is if it actually just doesn't even need to have a line break and it won't have a line break. So these are the pages in which that does happen in that fourth line, which is a good indication that it's going to be one of these exceptions. What has me a bit concerned though, is it's not coming up with that for our, um,
Let's do this. There we go. So I'm going to be printing off. I'm going to be printing off page spans. Page spans one. Actually, I need to print off pages. All right, so zero, one, two, three, four. That should be returning a hit. Let's find out why it's not. Hmm. Oh well, we'll just uh, handle those on a case-by-case -case basis, I think. Again, that's an easy thing to manually validate, and it's taken me a little bit of long time to figure out uh, where it's actually happening. So let's go ahead and just ignore that for right now. And what we're going to do is, well, we don't need that either, All right? Cool. And then, yeah, so we've got the ability now to kind of go through and find the text for all of our letters. So letter three is going to naturally be quite long because it is long um, and it's going to have a little bit of the next page on there as well. And we're just going to have to make peace with that. We'll figure out a way to separate it out later. So if we go to four, four should be quite short it looks like. Um, yep, right there to that point. And we can figure out a way if we know what letter it is to end, end it at that occurrence. Maybe that could be how we do it. Ah, we'll figure it out. So. That's what we know. Uh, that's how we can go ahead and now get all of these things into their own their own format. So what we can do now is we can write this to a JSON file. So so we're gonna just call this letters because this is now our official uh, letters dot JSON. It's not gonna be our final one, but we're gonna write it with an encoding equal to UTF-8 as F uh, JSON dot dump and we're going to dump the all letter texts right uh yep and then it's going to be equal to four so that's the next task done so letters.json it's again not our final letter but it's it's going to be a good chunk of it a good chunk of our problem done uh we see everything in this json file now all the way down so each letter we've got the whole span and now what we can do is we can start going through and figuring out not only where each individual page ends, but we can start writing some rules out for uh, kind of reconstructing those letters and breaking out some of the extra metadata. So this will be fun. This is where it actually gets to be good and we start to see actual results coming from all of our tasks and things should start to pick up a little bit now. We're gonna make a new notebook, again, trying to compartmentalize and keep these different stages documented. So extract metadata. So th at this stage, we're interested in import JSON. We're going to import RE because we're definitely going to need that at this point. Uh, so letters.json. These are not our final letters. We're going to store those separately. But for right now, we're getting pretty close. So uh, we're going to do letters is equal to that. Cool. So now we can print off letters uh, zero and oh, oh, that's right. Uh, I think they're strings. Yeah. Okay, cool. So we're going to print off letters one with a string. 
Cool, 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 cool. All right, now we can start doing some cleaning. And this is the fun part, I think, at least. So I want to be able to now extract some significant metadata from this. I am no longer interested or in need of any of, of that information right there. So I can, I can write uh, regex to find this line and kind of get rid of it. It's done its purpose. I want to find now uh, a few different pieces of metadata within this text. So this text now is showing me a couple different things. We've got the MGH description. We've got the MGH date or date range. We've got the manuscripts in which it appears. And we've got the editions in which it appeared prior to this current edition. We don't care about these. If I can grab them, I'll store them. If it proves to be problematic, I'm just going to entirely ignore them and not deal with them at all. What I want to do though now is start doing some, some cleaning. One of the main things that I need to do is I need to get these quotation marks standardized. So let's go down here and just start writing out some, some rules. So we're going to say for letter in letters, uh, what we want to do is we want to letter equals letter dot replace. In fact, I am just going to, for right now, letter one is going to be equal to letters. This will be a little easier to call later on. So we're going to say letter one is going to be equal to letter one dot replace. We're going to replace that. Actually, let's print this off. So again, I have to write this in. I, for whatever reason, didn't save the uh, the result like that. So we're going to do replace on that. We're going to replace the instances of that. And actually, at this point, we're going to make a list of these, of these band characters, these ones that we always know are always going to be instances of, of bad OCR. And that's two of them right off the bat. So we can say for character and band characters, letter one equals letter one dot replace uh, character and replace it with nothing. So now we can print off our letter if we want it to and kind of see the before and after uh, letter one. There we go. And we now see that those aspects cleaned up. Some other things I need to do is I need to get rid of these quotation marks this is going to be different. This is going to be a separate replacement. So I want to handle these individually because this is kind of particular. I'm going to make sure that these are replaced with proper quotation marks uh, that are easier to work with on a consistent basis. This is a very common problem when you're trying to clean OCR text is that your uh, apostrophes or your commas or things like this, they're going to be a little different and not the correct encoding that you want. And uh, we see that I was able to get, oh, yeah, do this. And it's not replacing these quotation marks for whatever reason. Maybe this is a feature of uh, Jupyter Lab where those quotation marks are shown in that way. I'm not entirely sure, that should have worked. I need to actually comment it out. Or, uh, hmm. Figured that out in a second. So that's one thing. Uh, now I can do some some pretty cool some pretty cool rules. All right, let's um let's first try and grab this bit of information here. So we need to understand where this letter number uh, starts and what comes after it. So we need to know what letter we're actually on for this to work. That shouldn't be a problem. But let's try and, and find where there are uh, a sequence or a collection of parts of the letter where it's all capitalized. So, yeah, let's start there. And that'll give us a good indication of where the header data is and where the actual letter itself is. So let's do that first. So... Uh, let's have another thing called letter lines is equal to letter one dot split lines. And so we can say for uh, letter, letter lines, if letter 
dot is upper print or for line if line is upper then print the line cool so that's going to give us a good indication of where oh this would be another good way to actually catch where the next um where the next letter begins yeah we can work with this so uh, we're going to ignore this second bit right now. So if we know what, where it begins, we know what it is. So uh, cap lines are going to be equal to that. Uh, cap lines, lines dot append. We can figure out where the capitalized lines are. And what we can do now is we can say the letter equals letter dot split cap. And we're going to split it where cap lines uh, minus one is that so the most recent occurrence that's always going to be where we split off the the header is at the last instance of this and we need to make sure that we don't um, we don't grab the second one now hmm we'll split it at the instance of the first occurrence hmm So these cap lines are going to be our salutation. Let's just change that from cap lines to salutation. All right. <clears throat> so I don't think salutations ever stretch on from multiple pages. So I think we can actually use that feature and come up with a way to actually separate the, the fake salutation, the one for letter two. So we can say a salutation is equal to salutation. We're gonna join with a line break. And then we can split this at the instance of start of page. And that's always going to be in the first index because the, the zero index is going to be prior to this. This will be the first index, and then this will be the last index. And then what we can do is we can get, essentially get rid of, let's say if epistoli not in line, then we're going to do that. And so let's print off the salutation. Cool, we got it. And let's let's go ahead and now that we've got this actually um, figured out, we can do um, header data is going to be equal to uh, the letter one dot split, and we're going to split it at the salutation. And it doesn't matter if we lose the salutation here because we've got it stored outside of this. So header data is going to be, oh, we got to split it and we grab it zero index. So there we go. And so now we've grabbed all the header data. Cool. Let's comment that out. So now that we've grabbed the header data, this is the kind of the header of the, of the letter. We can start kind of grabbing some, some of these pieces of information that are important. So let's first try to identify a date range. Now, we need to go back through and look at how these date range are typically structured. Are they an individual year? Are they uh, always a, a dash with two triple digits? Uh, we can write some rules to kind of grab a date pretty easily this way, but we might be able to do it a little differently too. So let's think about this. So if we know what letter number we're on, we can presume that it's going to be kind of like this, this format, with the exception of those five exceptions that we had. I think it was like 7, 240, and some other numbers like that. So if the line begins with cod, let's first split where the addition is. So let's grab uh, the addition data. It's going to be equal to uh, header 
data.split, and we're going to split at EDD. So that's going to be the line that has all of our addition data. Let's do prior and the addition. And we should be able to print off EDD. And we've got that. Excellent. Okay. We don't really care about the EDD. And like I said, if we if it ends up presenting us some problems, we're, we're just going to kind of not worry about it right now. So let's grab the prior stuff. That's what we're really interested in. So prior is going to tell us a lot of information. It's going to be the codices that this is found in, so the manuscript. It's going to be the date and the uh, brief description. So I want to have all of these as separate pieces of information. I need to figure out a way to kind of grab whatever happens after COD. So I can separate the prior out. So COD data, or I'm just going to say MSS. This stands for manuscripts. That's going to be uh, prior.split, and we're going to split it at COD. And I think that fairly consistently is going to be grabbed by our OCR. Uh, and so what we're going to do is say date um, other <laughs> MSS. There we go. And COD. Too many values expected that. Ah, it's probably. We're always going to grab the last occurrence of it, so let's do that. Cool. And so we'll do some reassembly here. Cool, there we go. So that's gonna be how I kind of reconstruct the, the code, uh, the co uh, codices. Now that we've got the codices, we can... <laughs> no problem, just saw the comments. Uh, so now that we've got the, the codices, what we can do is we can do a few different things. We can now know that whatever comes prior to this line is probably going to be, let's do dot strip just to make sure. Cool, there we go. Uh, so what we can do now is we can say uh, earlier stuff is going to be equal to prior dot split, and we're going to split at MSS. Print earlier. This is going to be our other stuff, like our our um, start of page all the way down to these earlier line breaks. Uh, what I want to grab is essentially zero here. So grab all of that. Hmm. Oh, that's why. And now I can use some regex to, to try to capture uh, the date. So I think this is always going to be three digits. Something like uh, in the 700s. So I can always, if I always know that it's going to be 700s, I can write out some rules. Let's see if we can try and grab at least this one, and we're going to modify it a little bit. So. Yeah, this will work, but when we get to letters that are in the three digits, it's going to present a problem. So we're always going to know that it's a seven followed by two digits, and then it's going to be... Uh, actually, if we get these two pieces, we'll know uh, the two different dates referenced. It could capture one date. It could capture two. And let's see if there's a date range we can always capture. And I think this is going to need to be commented out.
Cool. All right. So again, I don't think this is going to work as neatly for every single letter, but we can try to grab that. So we're going to say that the date is equal to uh, earlier, or we got to find the match for it first. That's going to be equal to, let's do re date is going to be equal to, or date range is going to be equal to uh, re dot find all. And we're going to do a find all on, uh, what was that? R. earlier and don't get excited about this working right now because it's not going to for all letters it's going to present a huge problem in a, in a few minutes actually so that's going to be how we grab a date range and then once we have the date range we can presume that anything is not that's not the date range is going to be we can just replace it so earlier Um, there's nothing. I'd like to preserve as much of this metadata as I can. That's why I'm spending so much time doing it, doing all this, I'm trying to come up with some ways to preserve it. And then I can do, uh, Cool. So now I've been able to grab all this, and then I can make a presumption that a sequence, that whatever number I'm on, I can do, I can split it up between lines maybe. I'll, I'll figure that out in a little bit. But for right now, I was able to capture a lot of this metadata pretty much automatically. It is going to break. The date range especially is going to break as we move forward. So I'm going to have to make some changes to all that. It's a good start. It's a good start, though. So let's go ahead and start figuring out how to actually edit this up so that it looks a little bit nicer. So we're going to just kind of not really worry about all of this right now. We are going to worry about what comes after that salutation. So let's do letter body. It's going to be equal to letter dot split or letter one dot split salutation and that's going to be the first index print letter body cool so now what we need to do is we need to figure out where this next letter begins and just get rid of everything that comes after that I think we can do it <clears throat> it shouldn't be that much of an issue like I said, we're gonna to have to worry about those three those three exceptions, and those we're just gonna manually manually validate. But if we know which letter that we're on, and we look for the the next sequence up, then we should be able to figure this out. So we need to keep track of which letter that we're on, and it's not gonna matter right now while we're just working with this. X is equal to uh, one. But what we're gonna look for is. An occurrence of a line break between, and perhaps this should come earlier. Yeah, I think this should come up here. Letter one is going to be equal to letter one dot uh, split, and we're looking for an occurrence of, uh, let's do f string of a line break followed by x plus 1, followed by a period, followed by a line break. And we're going to grab everything prior to that. Let's comment these sections out. That worked. So. We're able to get rid of all of that. That's fantastic. All right, now we got the letter body. 
And now we get to the fun part of cleaning up the letter. So here's where we can write, start writing some rules. So I want to make sure that I retain paragraph breaks. So we're going to have, par uh, let's clean up something else first. Um, any occurrence of a dash followed by a line break, we can presume is the occurrence of a single word, All right? So you'll see what I mean now in just a second letter body and so we've got uh, that line break convincia is now recognized as a complete word that's good and the other thing that we need to do is we need to separate paragraphs out so paragraphs are always going to be delineated this hasn't split but by my salutation figure out why oh that's why because Because the salutation is a string and it needs to be as a long string as opposed to a, a list. So my salutation looks like that with two line breaks. So, hmm. There we go. Cool. OK, now we've got letter one pretty well represented here. We'll have to figure out how to get rid of these bottom things that, that trail on. We can figure that out, though. So now that we got it cleaned up, we can separate our, our paragraphs. So these are going to be equal to double line breaks equals letter body dot split we can separate this out between double line breaks and then we can say for p and pair p p and paragraphs let's go ahead and do p is equal to p dot replace line break with a space this should be good and then let's try to rejoin this entire thing together. Let's print off P so we can kind of see what this looks like. It should look like continuous text now, and it does. This is what you want to see for anything like machine learning or NLP. Uh, this is what you're looking for, some cleaned up text kind of like this. So let's go ahead now and start doing some uh, other steps. So we're going to try and reassemble this now. Let's call it text. Uh, I think I've used text as a variable. So uh, text dot append p. And what we can do now is say text body is going to be equal to text dot join or dot join text print body. Cool, and there we go. We've got all of our paragraphs now delineated and separated out by by a single line break. And they're all cleaned. You could do a double line break to make it look a little nicer. There we go. And that's how you clean up a letter real fast with using Python. Now that we've got that stored, we've got our data kind of cleaned. We're gonna have to do some manual validation on some of these things here. But for right now, we can move on to kind of the next step and start figuring out how to automate this process 
for uh, for all the letters. We've got some general ideas now about what's possible, what's not possible, and how to get rid of certain things. So this line is clearly problematic. We might just have to do some manual deletion here. Let's see if we can figure out a way to automate this though. So we've done this successfully for letter one. So what we're gonna do now is say for letter one and um, what's the name of this? And the letters. Store this outside of that, bam, characters. And we are absolutely going to have an error coming up very soon. So let's do letter one. It's going to be equal to letters. And it wasn't very long. So we already got a problem. It's going to be with the prior splitting with the ed. I thought that was going to be an issue. Let's go ahead and just get rid of these things right now. We're just going to worry about the salutation for right now. We're not even going to worry about the date or the description. We'll save all that data separately. All right, letter body, letter one dot split, salutation. Okay, it looks like we're able to grab letter two with our same rules, but we ran into an error with letter three. Letter three is a weird one, and so it might just be an exception that we write in. Uh, letter three begins on page 19, and this is a problem uh, because the description doesn't start, the salutation doesn't start there. It starts way over here. And I think I'm going to just skip letter three for right now because it is going to present a numerous amount of problems that we, do, we can just address on its own. So let's skip letter three for right now. We can make a mental note of that. And uh, we'll say if So it works up until uh, seven and it starts to break. What's going on here? An empty separator. Hmm. So that means the salutation wasn't actually grabbed there. So let's print off the salutation. All right. So that's what's happening there. So we have to figure out a way to grab these salutations in a, a little bit better of a way. Oh, and I have to iterate X up also. Cool, that's still gonna give me an issue. Okay. I'll save all this just kind of down here. Maybe we can separate the pages out first. Okay. 
Yeah, so this method's not going to work for grabbing that salutation because it's always going to be the first one. If there's uh, two salutations on the same page, it's going to give primacy uh, to the top one. We may need to come up with a better way to separate these letters out if they're on the same page. Actually, we're not too concerned about that. We can use regex, actually. To grab anything that is a sequence of capitalized characters or line breaks. So let's think about this and just put this on hold for a second. Pretty much everything we just did put on hold. Okay. So if it's not, all right, so if we got the letter, all right, that doesn't matter. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to grab. All right, for letter and letters, for L and letters, uh, letter is going to be equal to letters L. OK, well, that's not going to work. Let's work with one again. Okay, so we're just going to work with letter one for right now once again and return to this idea. A salutation is always going to be a sequence of capitalized letters that functions on at the top of a letter. So we need to find a case where there is a digit. So in these scenarios, that will always be the next page.
All right, I think that's gonna work. That occurs a lot, apparently. What if it has a line break? Okay, that might work. That was a more accurate way to get rid of anything that comes after. And we can also do dot strip. Copy and paste this stuff down. Might use it later. Don't know. Okay, so we've been able to get the letter now separated out and cleaned up and separate it from its the one that comes after it. Now, if we can grab a sequence of capitalized letters or line breaks that concludes, does it consistently conclude with a period? I think it consistently should end with a salutem. Hmm, that might be really useful. Okay, okay. So if salutem is in a letter, then uh, header data and body data are going to be equal to letter dot split at salutem. So we can print body. And we should have just the body of the text. Cool. I'm hoping that it captures the period every single time. Okay. So we don't really need any of this information here anymore. So we can get rid of any line that has the Alquini epistoli, probably. All right, cool. So that's done, and that's all ready then. So we can go ahead and get this structured in with those other rules that we just wrote. Let's copy and paste them up here. So it went a little something like this, paragraphs. It's gonna be a letter body dot split, or in this case, it's just going to be letter body. 
and then body dot stripe. Cool. All right. Now that worked. Now uh, we're going to have raw cleaned text. It's going to be equal to that. All right, well, we'll have to figure out how to get rid of that stuff later. But that's looking good. Let's try it with two. With two, it looks good. Three is gonna give us a huge problem, I'm almost certain. Yeah, I'm okay with that though. This proves possible for everything except for a handful of exceptions. That'll be great. Um, all right, I say we just try it then. Um, so if that's not equal to, we know that three is going to be a problem. List index out of range. So we'll, we'll use these to catch everything that we can. So we'll just do try. And then this is bad practice again, but it's okay, except exception because I'm only trying to get the ones that I know follow these rules, and then I'll write new rules for the other ones. So uh, let me comment that out. Go down here. Actually, let's just do it right here. Print for letter N. What do I call it for text? N claimed texts. Print text. This worked for a really large number of letters. Um, it looks like nearly all of them. 310 gave us that error uh, because it was looking ahead. I think that's why. And it never found found all. So we can do if L, uh, if letter does not equal 309. Eh, I'll just leave it. Do that one manually. So we were able to get a lot of texts done manually um, or done automatically. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, iterate over these and save them each into individual text files so we can start analyzing the results. So I'm going to put this into temp for right now because I'm not sure these are what I really want to look at. We'll find out in just a second. Um, test uh, text. So we're going to say for a letter and cleaned texts uh, with open and we'll do something like uh, temp test text and we'll just gonna uh, we'll do the leading zero as well why not so we know that we've got uh, everything from zero all the way up to uh, 300 with the or uh, yeah, 310 with these letters. So what we need to do is we need to go back to that. I think it was in one of these earlier notebooks. I already wrote it out. We can just kind of reuse this bit of code. Oh, there we go. Discard. If it's less than 10, then it'll look like that. Elif. I is less than 100 and greater and greater and i is greater than uh, 9 then it's going to have two or sorry two zeros one zero else uh, new i is equal to i 
ui.txt w encoding again i'm going to stick with utf8 i'm going to have to clean these up a little bit still because i haven't done any of my real good cleaning on them yet we're going to do f dot write and now we're going to be able to write in a letter or cleaned texts Go, cleaned texts and we're going to say a uh, letter that should work oh all right let's go into temp a test.txt hmm oh that's why oh no put them all in here well, that's annoying. Uh, we'll be able to fix that in a little bit. But they're looking pretty good, if I do say so myself. We're going to have to figure out how to handle these exceptions. We can do that. This is when um, there was a page break in the middle of a paragraph. That's all right. Not too bad, though. Let me go ahead and move all these into the right uh, domain or directory. So open that up. into temp and let's not how many files we've gotten here I was able to get 164 letters with these rules. So that's over half of the letters we were able to capture uh, with the rules we just wrote out. So that's pretty good. I think that's a good basis to start off with. And then what we'll kind of do is kind of figure out some extra rules kind of going backwards and how to handle them. So now that we've got those all saved into our temp text, let's start now working with the ones that we were able to use rules for and start trying to, to figure out how to kind of clean these up a little bit more especially instances, oh, that's going to be a problem. We have to delete these and, and resave them because, um, oh, wait, no, no, we don't. No, it, it captured the letter number. Cool. So we actually have these now divided by letter number. So this is letter 37. So it's the start of it all the way down to the end of it. And, you know, let's just be a little safe on the safe side. So this is 38. So it starts on page 80. Let's go and look and make sure that our rules that we wrote out are, in fact, working. So we should be able to go to page 80. Cool. And what was I looking at? Letter 38. So letter 38 starts there. Solet caritas. Solet caritas. Perfect. Uh, so that's going to be that. Now the next thing I need to do is I can replace these lines with a simple page change. So a simple uh, page change tag. And uh, I'll just keep the page number that's right here there. That'll make that look a lot cleaner. And I can kind of use these massive um, breaks as a way to clean this up one bit more. So let's go ahead and start working with a, a new script that's going to be for cleaning the text. So let's do a new Python uh, Jupyter file. We're going to do 06 clean text. So we were able to get 164. I'm going to make a little note of that, 164. Great. So we're going to import JSON, import RE. I don't think we're going to need JSON or RE right now, but just in case we do, I've got them already loaded up. And ready to go. So the next thing I need to do is I need, oh, I need to import glob as well. Import glob. So we're going to call our files and that's going to be equal to glob.glob. .glob. And we're going to grab all of the text files in temp backslash test underscore text backslash dot txt. Cool. So for file and files with open 
file, read it, encoding is going to be equal to UTF-8 as F. Text is going to be equal to F.read. So now we've got the data in there. Uh, and let's go through and actually read lines. Uh, so we're going to do that split uh, lines. And then what we're going to say is I'll do lines here for line in lines. We want to see any instance of uh, start of page. So if start of page is in line, cool. Now what we can do is we can grab Page number is going to be equal to line dot split. We're going to split at that, and then we're going to grab the set first index, and then we're going to split again at dot jpg, and that's going to allow us to. And we're going to grab it at the zero index, so that'll grab anything that happens when you dot jpg. So we'll grab essentially that bit of information right there, which is what we really want. So let's go ahead and do that. Oh, I did have .jpg. We're going to print off page number. And that's what we want to see. It is interesting that we have something duplicated there on page 19. Oh, that's because letter 1 and letter 2 both have page 19 in them. So that is, in fact, uh, normal. So then what we're going to do is we're going to say, um, we're also going to open this up. I'm going to open this up. Text is equal to f dot read. Open it up first. And then what we're going to say is um, text is going to be equal to line dot replace. And we're going to get rid of all that start of page nonsense. And we're going to replace the line with. Um, a new thing, just a page number. Um, page with page number in there. And I think what we'll end up having is a nicer looking text. Now let's do this with just the first one. And that did not work the way I wanted it to. Let's do that. Hmm. Oh, that's why. It was text.replace line. And now we've got just the start of that page. Now what we can do is we can make an argument. If if the last thing that we see in um and the text is our page number. If it's this, we can do, um, hmm, how do we do it? Uh, let's do text lines is equal to text dot split lines. Do that one more time. If text lines minus one is equal to our is equal to that then text equals text dot split at that and we're going to grab everything that came before it. So we should see that completely removed now, and 19 is no longer associated with it. We'll do text.strip. And now we've got our raw text as we want to see it. And now that we have the raw text as we want to see it, 
There you go. Now that we have the raw text as we want to see it, we can go ahead and start creating a new text file where this information is stored separately. But if a page, let's see what it looks like when we do it with page two. Actually, page two is a bad example. We'll do it with page, uh, we'll do it with the fourth one, which will be now on the third index here. We see where the page 34 is preserved and this information is not actually removed. So now we know where our pages are within the letter which is gonna be important for later on. But for right now, this is gonna be useful for just kind of delineating more simply where pages change for these uh, for these files. So what we can do now is we can start doing some cleaning with all this. So we're gonna, again, apply those rules, which I keep on forgetting to implement and keep in. Uh, so TM, that R symbol. So we're gonna say, now that we've got the text, we're gonna say text is gonna be equal to text.replace we're going to replace that with nothing because um, that symbol did not exist in the Middle Ages. We're also going to replace this with that so that we don't have that in there. And there were a couple other ones. I remember the asterisk being a problematic one. I don't think the degree symbol is something that was ever used. Again, this is a really good way to just get rid of these poorly formatted footnotes. So we can do dot replace and we can do an asterisk. Replace it with that. And now let me print this off. We should have that. And we can also do an elimination of one, two, three, four, five, six, dot replace six line breaks with nothing. Uh, let's actually move it back so we can preserve more easily, kind of see where that page number, the page change is at. And now that we've done that, we've gotten everything pr looking pretty good. Obviously there's still some cleanup necessary. Um, Vester Kolkum is I believe, what uh, that's or Kolkus is going to be uh, right there. Uh, but for the most part, this is looking like better, better textual data that we can actually work with. And again, we're going to do dot strip, which is going to remove the leading white spaces before and after. And now we've got some really good looking raw text. So I think this is worth putting into our into our actual data file or data subfolder now. So let's do a new folder called cleaned pages or maybe cleaned letters. And we're gonna try to preserve the uh, the file name. So let's go ahead and see what the file name looks like when we do this and we can see it there. So we're going to grab everything after that. So a uh, new file equals file.split or we could just do uh, temp uh, temp dot replace with data and dot replace that's going to be a problem. There we go. Uh, test text with uh, cleaned letters. And um, then we're going to do with open new file. Uh, we're going to write it. Coding is going to be equal to UTF-8. These should look a lot cleaner now. Uh, so now what we're going to do is we are going to um, open up as f, f dot write, and we're going to write in our text. And this should preserve the structure that we have. Oh, and it helps if you actually get rid of that. And it should go quite quickly, but let's make sure that's looking right. Letter 8. Uh, 34 that's where it's going to be let's just do a double check kind of nice to do these manual validations all the way through um, this process Ooh. so data final images and we're gonna look for page 34 cool that's looking good that is in fact what we want to see so half of letter 8 right there which is what this is it's letter 8 um, good so I'm happy with that and again, this is a case where we've gone through and been able to write these rules for half of our letters. Now that we know what we can do with this with half the letters, we can write some rules in a little bit to do with the remaining ones. But let's go ahead and just get all that data written in. And we've got it now all under cleaned letters. And what we're going to be doing is as we get some more letters kind of cleaned up, we're going to be adding them to this. But I'm happy enough with having 165 with kind of moving forward. 
a lot of times digital humanities projects will work in batches. And so let's consider this our first batch of letters. Uh, they're looking a lot better. We can get rid of some of these things here, I think. Uh, for example, uh, instances of a six line break were not cleaned up there. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the same thing, go back and kind of repeat this process. And I'm gonna add in not only an instance of four line breaks, but I'm also gonna replace instances of maybe three is what that is that what that was? Oh, uh, one, two, three, four. Oh, look, there's a. Looks like there was some text on that line, and that's why it's returning that. So we'll also clean it up a little bit like that on a line by line basis. Uh, actually, we'll just leave it for right now. We can do some manual cleaning later. I don't suspect that's going to occur that frequently. Cool, this looks like a short letter, number 64. Um, one of the things I don't like, though, is I haven't really preserved uh, the page numbers here. And that's not too much of a concern to me because I already have that data stored outside of this. So I can like kind of reconstruct where the, uh, where the letter starts and where the letter ends with, with just this. So I'm going to go ahead and move forward with this project, having now seen the results and being kind of happy with them. So now that we've got essentially uh, 164 of the 310 letters finished, we can start now applying some NLP work to them. And that's going to be kind of the fun part of the project. We're going to start using some NLP to figure out which individuals are referenced within these letters, and then we can start developing at that point uh, some kind of robust ways of identifying uh, other entities such as groups and places and dates and things like that. That's going to be what we start working on coming up, but for right now I am going to take a brief break because my voice is starting to get a little hoarse, so I'll be right back in probably about uh, five to ten minutes again.
All right, we're back. Now, at this stage, we've already gotten our data somewhat cleaned up. We've got 164 of our letters now in text files. I think it's at this point that we start kind of turning to start working a little bit on the front end of the project. It'll give me a break from doing the, the data cleaning. And this is one of the unfortunate truths of any kind of project like this is that 90% of the work looks like stuff like this. It's sitting through and doing tedious data analysis, data extraction, and data cleaning. And data cleaning is where you're gonna spend most of your time. Let's go ahead though. I'm gonna be working in Atom now alongside um, alongside a browser. Because at this stage, I'm now gonna start doing some app development, some rudimentary app development. And it'll be fun because I'm gonna push the app to, um, I'll push the app actually to the repo. Uh, I might wanna do the app in a separate repo. Haven't decided yet. But we're gonna push the app and the app is gonna be able to be used on Streamlit. So as you kind of follow along, you can start kind of using the, the earlier parts of the app that we have developed. So what I need to have for this app is a few different things. I need to import Streamlit as ST. And I'm gonna be using Spacey and a lot of other things, but for right now, I'm not too concerned about them. I'm just really gonna be working with Streamlit right now and doing some basic kind of layout. I know that there's going to be a sidebar. It's gonna be equal to ST dots. Sidebar. Sidebar. And let me go ahead now and get this app up and running in, on my local environment or my local machine. So we're gonna do streamlet run app.py. And we'll worry about making things look cool uh, at a later date. So now we're gonna put this on one side and we'll put, oh, not that. I'll put this on the other. There we are. Um, cool. So I've got a wrong syntax here. I got to look that up real fast. Uh, on the correct syntax for streamlet sidebar. I always have a hard time remembering sidebar for some reason. Okay, it looks like I had it right. Ah, I know why. There we go. Uh, st.sidebar.title. We're going to call this, or let's call this, give it a header. Header, that's going to be um, parameters, params. Let's just call that params for right now. Rerun, that should work just fine now. Uh, title. Uh, the digital Alquin project. Wonderful. Now we actually have a name and starting to look like a, a possibly, possibly a decent app. So for right now, I'm not going to worry about the sidebar, actually. It's just going to get in my way for doing the, the split screen. What I am going to be doing is I'm going to be using uh, one of the newer features called uh, the columns. So on the main page, I'm going to have uh, column one. Um, column two equals st dot beta and this just recently got upgraded to uh, to the main repo so if we save this execute that uh, good so in column one let's just do text uh, it's a text box We're going to be displaying, uh, at least on the left-hand column, we're going to be displaying our raw text. And that's going to be displayed on the right-hand side with the actual images of that raw text. So you can kind of see the original MGH editions alongside the raw text. And um, I'm just trying to figure out the right way to actually display the text. I'll figure that out in just a second. Uh, so one of the things I want the user to be able to do is to kind of navigate between uh, these different columns. We're just going to write column one for right now um, through st. Write uh, test run has not st one. Oh, there we go. 
cool. Test, and we'll see column two. Rerun. Cool, column two is going to be there. That's a good layout. So one of the things that I want the user to be able to do is the user to be able to automatically select which letter that they want to look at. And so it'll kind of display up here, both as the uh, the original raw or the original images on the right and the raw text on the left. So we need to allow for the user to select which letter that they actually want. So let's go ahead and do a select box. I'm trying to remember right now off the top of my head, and I can't, the best way to actually implement this. So we're going to give the user the ability to input something, uh, input a range or, uh, hmm. Maybe a drop down menu. I see my problem with the drop down menu might get it might get a little too uh, large because you're going to have at the end of the day 310 letters to pick from, and so I'm thinking of a different way to actually have a user uh, drop in data, and I'm trying to explore the best possible the best possible way to to do that from a um, just from a you know a stylistic point of view, but also from a user interface point of view. Let's see. I guess we could have the user input the data as raw text. Let's, see, let's try the select box. I think it's going to be actually just way too, way too large. And we need to separate each of these out as a tuple. So we need the question, which letters do, which letter do, so, or maybe just select letter. And then we need to know how many letters that we actually have. So these are all going to be in our uh, data on, under cleaned letters. We got 01, 02, all the way down. We need to know which ones we actually have. So let's go ahead and import glob. And we're going to set up a way to actually grab all these and store them in a cache. So we're going to say glob.glob. .glob, and we're going to grab data backslash cleaned letters. Um, that should do it. Cool. Uh, backslash dot txt. So what we want to do now is we want to, let's look at the app, we want to be able to iterate through all these. So depending on which one of these letters the user selects, that's going to be the letter that we populate. So what we can do is we can now pass this. This is going to be a little conjumbled, I think. Um, so they can select anything in this long list like that. Let's make this a little cleaner and get rid of all of that extra stuff. So we're going to say for file and files, uh, let's go through and separate this out. Uh, so we'll say um, letter nums can be equal to that. So we're going to go through and say for file and files, uh, file.split, file.split. We're going to split it at the instance of a line, backwards line break, and we're going to grab the, the first index, which will be the uh, the cleaned letters. Actually, we're going to split it at cleaned letters underscore. And what we'll do is we'll say uh, ep is equal to, which stands for epistle. That's going to be equal to that file. And we're going to say ep ep. And uh, yeah, then we're going to do letter nums.append ep. And we can load all this in as a separate file so that every time it runs, it doesn't have to do this every single time. So let's go ahead and uh, redo that. Letter nums is going to be what we pass now to uh, the user here in the sidebar. Clean letters one. Oh, got to save it. There we go. Rerun it. Cool. So now you can select f1.txt, f2, and we're going to have to now use that input data to, to send it on over. We're going to replace uh, .txt with nothing so that it's empty. Let's rerun this. 
And now we got F1, F2, all the way down. Let's go ahead and just get rid of that space. That looks really techy, and we don't want that. It doesn't look too nice. So now we've got F1. Fantastic. So what we can do now is we can use this input data. So let's say they select that. We want it to now show in test what they've selected. So let's do that. So what we want to do is we want to read that input data. And so what do we want to do? Let's think about this for a second. And let's maybe remove the sidebar right now as well. So we can just kind of see everything in one place. Rerun, you can select the letter now up here. So when you select the letter, you want it to populate over here on the left column. So what we need to do is we need to do um, with open, uh, with open, Uh, all right, so if you select that with open, add select box. Let's do st.write, add select box, just to kind of see what the output's looking like. Oh, and comment that out. There we go. So it's looking like that. Okay, so what we can do is we can take that input. So we're going to say... Uh, we're we're going to have to reconstruct the letter number now from, from this output. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, um, where do we have it right here? So file is going to be equal to, or grab file is going to be equal to, uh, let's make it equal to add data cleaned letters and kind of reverse engineer what we just did and we're going to do a backslash and then it's going to be equal to let's grab the app name file is going to be equal to uh, whatever the add select box is dot split at the period so now we can do the app file and then we should be able to do dot txt Let's test that out. And then we can say with open, let's first do uh, st.write grab file. Again, we're just doing some quick, some quick testing here. It's grabbed, <laughs> hasn't grabbed exactly what we want it yet. Oh, this is a good point because we can select multiple things, can't we? We'll come to that in a second. Uh, for now, we can just go ahead and do this. Uh, we're gonna grab zero and that should work just fine now. Uh, we want it to split, oh, we wanna grab one. There we go. And now we've got, is that a space there? It is dot strip. Cool. And uh, we need to add in also uh, cleaned letters and then that. Let's rerun that again. That looks good. Okay, cool. So now at this stage, we're going to open up the grab file. We're going to read it. Coding, again, going to be equal to um, UTF-8. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit because it's looking a little hard for me to write as F. And then we're going to say uh, text is going to, we're going to say letter is going to be equal to F dot read. And now that we've got that, we can go ahead and populate that in column one. Error, no such thing exists. Lies. We have to do the underscore there. Rerun that. Cool. And there's our letter. And we see where the page break actually occurs as well. All right, we can get rid of our uh, st write grab file. We don't need that anymore. So now a user can kind of go through and see the individual letter. They can go through and see letter one, letter two, letter four, and we can do some other cool stuff. Let's do a uh, call one dot header. And we're going to do um, letter and we're gonna do this. And that's going to be equal to our ebb file. Did I grab that right? I think so. Cool. Letter 004. And let's go ahead and replace zeros here. Just because that looks a little nicer. Yeah, I didn't think I could do that. And 
and we're gonna just insert the clean app into here. And letter one, cool, that looks great. Uh, and let's go ahead and maybe we should consider doing that for this drop down menu too. We can go through, we can see letter 32, we can see letter 59. Now the user can start to actually get some real benefit out of this because right now you can't copy and paste letters from the DMGH. Now the next thing I have to do is I need to use my data that I've already acquired, uh, I need an, I, which tells me where a letter starts and where it ends. I want that to be displayed over here in the right hand column. So for night, right now, um, let's do text. So it kind of sees that where the text is at. And we're going to do over here, uh, column two dot header. That's going to be equal to letter. We're going to do clean EP image. This way you can kind of see uh, the image side by side with the text. And I hope this is going to work but I haven't tried it yet. Now, where is my data file that actually contains all my information on where letters begin and end? We're gonna need to import JSON. And uh, let's go ahead and get that data imported, imported right here. We're gonna say with open and the letter sequence file, which one is it? Letter changes validation. That wasn't it. Letter spans, I think this is it. Excellent, so we got letter spans. We know the images that we need to pull. So we need to pull these images. So we're gonna grab data letter page spans dot JSON. We're gonna be reading it as F. And so now we got these letter spans loaded in. We're gonna say uh, spans is gonna be equal to, actually I think spans might be used as a variable by Streamlit, so let's do um, page spans is going to be equal to uh, json.load f. Cool. And now that we know the page spans, it means that we can go into these uh, Adobe images and grab that for the user to see side by side with our raw text. So let's do that. So we are going to do a lookup in our page spans and see which page that we're on. So if this is letter 59, we're going to look into our letter spans, find 59. And then we're going to know which of the images to actually grab. So let's do that now. So uh, how is the best way to do that? So we're going to, let's st dot, right? Uh, clean app. Now we're going to want to use the app file. Let me just make sure what that is first. We run. Again, I'm just troubleshooting right now. Where is it? Where, so 059. Cool. So we can use that app data to then do uh, open up our images. So let's do that. So image list is going to be equal to how are these structured? Image list is going to be equal to um, page spans app file. I think that's what the thing was. It's getting a little difficult to read. Okay, app file. There we are. Fantastic. So if we've got that, let's do st.write. Now let's do uh, column2.write, and we're going to write in the image list just to make sure and troubleshoot this, make sure we got it right. Rerun. And we're not printing things. Column2.write image list. Why is that not working? Oh. Image list equals page spans app file. Ah, it's because it does need to be the cleaned one. So let's use the clean, where do I have it? Get rid of those zeros at clean. Maybe that'll be better. Hmm. The same problem here. Hmm. 
Let's see why this might be. So I'm going to do uh, column two dot write. The first thing we're going to write is page spans. All right, app file. Clean app. Oh, that's why. There we go. Okay, that should be the problem solved now. Rerun. Cool. And we've got our list of letter images, so we know that that works. So now we can get rid of this st.write, and we can do column. Uh, now we got to figure out something I don't know how to do just yet, which is how do we, how do we show two images where a user could kind of flip back and forth, or do we want them to just be cascaded? Uh, let's do images like that. There we go. All right, so let's do that. So we need to grab pages 18 and 19. Now we know that 19 is a false positive, but we're not going to worry about that right now. We can make those corrections later on. So now that we got this app up and running, we'll be able to kind of add in these this data as we clean it and make some cool changes later on. So we got that working. So let's do image. How do you show an image in Streamlit again? API reference image. Uh, it's just dot image. So we gotta open up the image to like open CV, I think though. Maybe not. Cool. No, I don't think we have to. Uh, so what we can do is for image and image list. We need to get the image data, so we're going to go into Adobe Images. That's a horrible naming convention, but we're gonna we're gonna work with it. All right. Okay, so what we want to change here is going to be this number right here, the clean ep, which is going to be the ep without any of the uh, the letters or the the leading zeros and then what we need to do is we should be able to say image name and we need to specify that this is in data and it's in adobe images backslash cool uh, i think that'll work i think that it won't <laughs> all right uh with open rb as f no file or directory with that name because there wasn't one for 01 because we deleted it. Ah, okay, so that means that we're gonna have to go up 18. So page one, if I remember correctly, is going to be 18. So we need to go minus 17. Minus 17. That should get us where we need to be. Uh, but it needs to be an integer. Oh, no, it needs to be indexed by the page number, not the clean app. So we don't need the, we need the image. This is going to be the image minus 17. will bring us to the correct thing there, I think. Let's rerun it and try. And uh, the same problem, it looks like. We got two zeros there. Why is that? Um, that's t dot right new. We'll figure out why. Zero, zero. No, we got the page right there, zero, zero, one. Oh, because zero, zero, one doesn't exist. So we need to do minus 16. Cool. That worked. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so we don't need to write that anymore. So now we've got the pages in which this item is found. Let's go ahead and maximize it now and kind of see what it looks like. So you can read the letter side by side with the actual pages in which they occur. And there's not, I can get rid of those two and three down at the bottom too. But now it's starting to actually look halfway decent. You can zoom in, it looks like as well. Um, I'm trying to think of a good way to render it where you could. Uh, I'm not really sure yet, but now let's test it out. We'll go to ep2, 
Yep, two starts right there. Fantastic. This is cool. Actually getting to see it kind of come together and it breaks. What happened now? Page 13 doesn't exist. That's impossible. How does page 13? Oh, because it's got that. Okay. Okay, cool. That's easy to debug. So we're going to do... We're going to get rid of these leading zeros and we're going to have to write in that same rule that we wrote up a while back. It's an annoying one, but it makes everything flow a lot more easily. Uh, where's that? I thought I copied and pasted it in here somewhere. There we are. Uh, let's go ahead and. Uh oh. There we go. That should not have been that difficult. All right, we're going to go back into our Streamlit app, and we're going to use these rules to come up with a new version of new. So it's going to look like this. And then and that should work just fine. Now let's refresh it. Cool. That's what we want to see. Uh, letter four starts right there. You can kind of see where it ends right there. So you got the two pages. This is why we spent all of that time uh, doing this is because, yeah, eight hours strong now. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, this is why we spent all that time for the past eight hours doing all that data cleaning, figuring out where pages started, figuring out where pages stopped. We're at eight hours, and now we've got an app that you can actually use that actually does something useful. Keep in mind, none of this data is possible to extract right now from raw PDFs. This is an entirely useful app already in and of itself, and it, we're not even at the, we're at the eight hour mark, but we have a lot more left to do. You can read the raw text here. Let's look at it what it look like for a typical user. And I know this looks kind of kind of clunky because uh, uh, first of all, it's zoomed in a lot because I have it zoomed in so that we can see it. There's a lot of open space here on the left. I want to leave that there. I'm going to be using the open space on the left to actually do some um, some parameters so that we can have different phases of this app uh, functioning in different ways. We can have the, the social network analysis part of the app kick in with a parameter. We can have the letter portion here. That's why I'm saving that space on the left right now and not doing the adjustments to make this take up the, the width of the actual uh, user's browser. So that's cool. If we keep on going down, we can do some quick troubleshooting as well. Uh, oh, we have a we have a great problem. Fun, fun. We found a bug. Uh, this is great. So we've deleted the uh, the zeros. <laughs> I didn't think about the zeros that would occur in the tens place, which is quite foolish. So if we were to go to any of the tens place letters, keep in mind we only have 164 of them. It's going to always grab that one. So uh, we can we can fix that. Don't worry. That's easy. So what we need to do is move that there. And so we're working with uh, the different letters. So where did I make this horrible, horrible mistake? <laughs> right here. So we need to replace the zero if the zero comes prior to uh, a number, but not if it comes after. So we can, we can fix this. We can fix this. Um, so the F file place zero like that and it's not even necessary to really do that I was doing it so that it would look cleaner here um, this shouldn't break anything and it did cool uh, cleanup we're just gonna make cleanup equal to app file And it broke that too because I was reliant upon cleanup having those uh, zeros there, I think, for later on. So where does it break for me? The image list. Uh, so image and image list. We're looking for a cleanup. So we need we need to do is we need to convert this cleanup into something without the leading zero. So we kind of need to reverse engineer this essentially. And since I have to do it anyways, I'm going to go ahead and do it up here. So we're going to have to create the cleanup with this bit of code. So we're going to do the opposite. 
if it's greater than 10, it's going to have that. If it's greater than 100 and less than that, it's going to have that. Uh, or it's going to have that. Hmm, let me think about this again now. So we need to iterate over these things and kind of reverse the hanging, the leading zero. Let me see if there's an easy, there's got to be a way to delete leading zeros in Python. Uh, we don't remove the trailing ones, we just remove the leading ones. So that's not going to work for us. There's got to be a way to strip and pass a keyword argument. How do I, uh, deleting, just leading zeros. L strip, excellent. Okay, cool. So we don't even need any of that fun stuff. We can do ep file dot L strip. And like magic, this should work. Fingers crossed. Uh, L strip, and it helps if you spell things correctly. L strip. And L strip doesn't work. Hmm. Oh, misspelled it. There we go. Cool. What's the problem now? Clean app. We're going to go back to that wherever I introduced it before. So clean app is used there. And I had it somewhere in here. So the, the problem is now occurring because of image list clean app. Hmm. This should be letter 70, though. So that's good. Okay. So where do I have image list? Let's do st dot right clean app. Just try to get a sense of what the clean app is actually looking like. Okay, it's looking like 0, 070. That should have gotten, oh, I know why. Does this only work for integers? No, it works for strings. Um, hmm. <laughs> so we've got the clean app at file strip. Okay. The problem is when we go and look for image list, let me look at the error one more time. When we go to get the page spans of clean app, it still is showing the leading zero. Oh, I just saw that. Sorry about that. Oh, you're right. You're right. That's exactly it. I got to pass the zero to the L strip. Thank you so much. That was good. And it works like a charm. <laughs> Thank you. It's one of those things that if you're looking at it for too long, it starts to, your brain starts to break on the problem. Thank you very, very much. Now everything is working as it should. Uh, letter 70 is coming out as it should. So now we see letter 70 corresponding to the correct thing. This is fantastic. I'm happy. Um, yeah, and uh, so someone in, in the chat pointed out that I needed to actually pass in what I needed to strip. In this case, it was the it was the zeros. So it was actually just stripping blank space, which wasn't there. So uh, now that that works, it looks like we've got an app that can actually function and serve some kind of purpose already. And we've maintained within here where the page breaks occur. This way you can kind of go through as a reader and line it up. And if you look over here, ut repellus actually occurs right here. There is now a line break. And uh, we have a, a new start of uh, a new line on the next page, uh, precisely as we wanted to see. Now, is the OCR here going to be perfect? 
no, there are still going to be some mistakes that we need to account for, but I think it's cool that we got the start of an app already at eight hours in, and uh, we're gonna add now some more features to it, and I'm gonna go ahead and post this for bragging rights onto um, Twitter. So just give me one second. Digital Alcuin live stream. And I'm going to give the link to our fun little project here. Let's go ahead and do that. Give me just one second, people. And if you want to tweet about it, I say we just start using the hashtag digital alkaline. Cool. Well, the app's now actually doing something that I would consider to be quite useful for the general public that looks to study at least Carolingian letters or Carolingian history. Uh, and I can't express to you how important this is because if you were to be working with this data set and you wanted to quote something large, you would always have to manually type out all of this information. So now you can actually um, now you can actually just copy and paste it straight from the app. Again, with the rules that we came up with, we were only able to get about 164 letters out of the 310, but we can already see that at least this first beta push is actually going to be useful out of the gate. Now let's start doing some fun stuff. This is where NLP is going to come in, and we're not going to worry about cleaning the letters right now. Let's focus on trying to grab entities like this guy right here, Benedictus. So we are in a particularly advantageous position because a lot of Alcuin's letters uh, have been worked on by numerous people. And that means that we can actually use this to go ahead and start grabbing. Um... Uh-oh, looks like I've got a problem. Letters one and two appear to have the same text. Hmm. I will have to address that somehow. I th think what might be happening is I'm not too sure. I think it's just because they're appearing on the same page. I'll address it later. I'll figure it out. Um, but looks like everything else is working just fine. So let's go ahead and slide this over. Let's start now working on some NLP to go ahead and make this app a wee bit more useful and start doing some named entity recognition and extracting entities from it. So let's go ahead and minimize this for right now, open up our Jupyter uh, notebook, and we need to start working with uh, essentially uh, Spacey. So if you're not familiar with Spacey, I have quite a bit of tutorials on it, but we're going to be working with uh, no prior no prior OS or no prior NLP for Latin. We're going to presume that the CLTK doesn't exist. I'm going to pretend like my actual model for um, medieval Latin doesn't exist. And we're going to work from scratch because I view that as cheating. Normally, you would not have that advantage in the situation. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, so we need to grab entities. We're going to, that's what we're going to call it. Oh, uh, not pi. Oops. Uh, let me delete that. Or just make a. There we go. We're going to do O name O seven. Grab ints. And I misspelled that. Let's go ahead and rename it. Cool. Awesome. So let's go ahead and import Spacey. I know we're going to be working with Spacey a lot throughout this script. We're going to be working also with, I think, regex. I might get a little creative in how we solve this problem. I haven't decided yet exactly. And I think I'm also going to have to use the entity ruler from Spacey. But I'm going to put that off. I'm going to have a sip of my tea, which has honey. Oh, that was my coffee. That was a weird taste. There we go. My tea is back here because my voice is starting to go out and I have a lot longer to do this. All right. <clears throat> so let's start grabbing our entities. So there's a couple different ways we can do this. We, we want to essentially figure out a way to open up all of our files and start finding things that might be potential entities. So we can always presume that a word that appears in the middle of a sentence that is capitalized is going to be an entity of some sort. 
we can work under that assumption pretty easily. So what we can do is let's go into our cleaned letters just to kind of grab an example. So we can start writing out some rules to do this. Now we're not going to know what kind of entity it is, but as you see, we start working through this problem, we're going to be able to solve it a little bit more easily by coming up with rules or entity rulers to just kind of automate this process for us. So let's go ahead and let's just say, let's make, let's use glob as well. Why not? We're going to bring in glob into the equation. Uh, oh, helps if you actually import it, import glob. And we're going to say files is going to be equal to files or glob dot glob. And we're going to say data cleaned letters. And we're going to grab anything that is a dot txt, which is actually everything in there. Cool. And print length files. 164. So we got 164 of the letters that we can work with. So for file and files, and for right now, we're just going to work with file one. So the first letter, we're going to open it up. And I wanted to actually look at this right now. And I'm not entirely sure why my rules didn't work on this, but we'll deal with that later. So what I need to do is I need to say for file and files, I'm going to do uh, with open file read encoding is going to be equal to txt. Oh, encoding is going to be equal to utf8. There we go. As f, we're going to do uh, text is going to be equal to f dot read. Now we've got our raw text. And now that we've got our raw text, we can start to kind of uh, do some stuff with this now. So let's go ahead and try to grab every capitalized word that appears in the middle of a sentence. How can we do that? Well, we have to kind of write out the rules for that because we're going to pretend that a sentence tokenizer doesn't exist for right now. I might cheat if I have to and, and do that later, uh, add, in, add in one. But for right now, let's presume that it doesn't. And a, a really good tokenizer or sentence tokenizer off the, gate, uh, off the shelf is going to be spacey. Even if you're working with uh, Latin, you're still going to be able to probably pull it off with the Let's just go ahead and do it. Equals spacey dot load in core web SM. So we're going to use the small model and then we're going to run the uh, doc object, create it over the text, NLP dot text or text. And then we're going to say for sent in doc dot sense, print sent. And it's not going to be the best, but it's going to be good enough, I think, to get us by here. Uh, and so it's printed off everything. It's separated everything out into sentences. And as we can tell from this, um, it didn't do it perfectly. And that's not its fault. It's the result of bad OCR that had that exclamation in the middle of a sentence. Again, we'll get to cleaning that up in a little bit. We're not going to worry about it too much right now, though. So let's go ahead now and make an argument We're gonna, or make a, make a condition. We're going to say sent is equal to sent. And we're going to... We're gonna just ignore that first letter. And then we're gonna say words is equal to sent dot split because we can never trust that the capitalized word at the beginning of a sentence is in fact an entity. Now in some cases it might be, but we're gonna ignore that for right now. And then we're gonna say if the word can't remember how to check and see if something is capitalized. Uh, there's, a, there's a capitalize uh, method you can run. We can also do this, that is upper. Uh, we're gonna print off word. We're gonna print off the correct word. Cool. And I would argue that all of these, except for Omnia, uh, is in fact a an entity of some sort. Benedicto, Benedicto is Benedictus, same entity there, Deum, Arrow, what's going on with that? Let's print off. Um, let's print off the scent, so we can kind of see what these are. And this is how you can pretty quickly uh, find entities within a text. So if we keep on going down, arrow. Ah, this is a good. This is a good problem. So we are going to have some instances where. Uh, where scripture is going to be quoted within a sentence. And in those instances, the next word is going to be capitalized in a lot of cases. I'm curious if that's what's happening here.
All right, well, we can figure that out. For right now, let's ignore that and uh, not worry about it. We'll see why in just a second. So I'm going to now create a list of possible ints. And then I'm going to say, if word not in possible ints, so I don't want to have a list with a lot of duplicates. So if it's not in there, then we're going to do a possible ints dot append word. And we're just going to let this run over every single thing. Uh, it's going to take it a second because it's creating a doc object for each one of these files. And it's having to go through and do this on a sentence by sentence tokenized basis. But we'll have a good list of possible ends that we can kind of start weeding through pretty easily. And in fact, I probably should have done a quick thing, which was uh, eliminate punctuation because we're going to have a lot of punctuation held on um, to this. And actually, I shouldn't even iterate it over the words. I should have iterated over the, the individual tokens. That was my that was a that was a simple mistake there. But nevertheless, let's see what our let's first of all, let's see how long our list is. See if it's even manageable. 1530, and you're going to see why that's not that big of a deal in just a second. Print uh, possible ints. Cool. Qual prop there is definitely not. Odds, definitely not. All right, so we're going to have to write in some extra rules to ensure that these things that we're grabbing are filtered out. But you can see that we've already got quite a few that are looking like very clearly entities. So what we can do now is let's start tokenizing everything instead of just grabbing the words. Uh, so we're going to say for uh, word and, and doc, so we're going to iterate over the tokens now. If word.text, zero is that, that, dot text, add that there, uh, and then add that there. And now this will work a little bit better. Uh, this is going to get rid of a lot of those punctuations. I think it'll get rid of that that we see there with Benedicto. Uh, I could be wrong. Let's try it one more time. It took only a few minutes to run. And again, we're using the small model. There is a faster way to do this, and you can disable everything, and you can only load in the sentence, the sentenceizer uh, here, but we're not too concerned about it because we're working with a minimal amount of textual data. If I were working with uh, a million sentences, I would not do it in this manner. Cool, and it's done. So, and that somehow increased our list of entities. Uh, but notice that Benedicto now has now has that removed. I'm very happy with that. Um, and we can see some of the bad OCR output here as well. So we can quickly kind of assemble a list. We can make another, another thing now. We can make another presumption. If the entity's length is less than, let's say, three characters, because I don't know of a Latin person who has a name that's smaller than three characters, or smaller than, let's say, smaller than four characters. All right, so we're going to iterate over these for int and possible ints. If int, if the length of the int is less than, let's say less than five, uh, it's going to get into the problems with the Deus and some of those, uh, some of the biblical names. But I think this is going to work for a lot of these new revised ints. Let's see how much that got rid of for us. Print revised ints. Oh, <laughs> helps if you actually write things correctly. Uh, and these are instances where our manuscripts are being grabbed. So that's good. I don't see a lot on here that is that's wrong. Uh, so let's go ahead and try and do it. Let's actually let's just keep on doing it this way. Let's say less than five. And while we're here, um. I'm going to write a list of exceptions. Um, and these are going to be the things that I know are short, like Deo, Dei, Deus. Um, that's a scriptural reference. This one could be a person, Job, but it's most likely a scriptural reference to Job if I had to guess, out of the gate. So I'm going to ignore that for right now and just move on. Uh, day, the only ones I'm seeing that mat that, match that pattern are that and not an int accepts. 
and uh, int not in that. If I run this again, now we've got a longer list because I've upped it to five. But now I can go through and kind of weed out these. Bead is definitely going to be a person, so I want to add that in. Bead is a, um, a 7th century exegete from Britain, a person who commented on the Bible. And I'm going through and looking through these just really quickly, trying to find anything that looks like it might be a person. And I'm not seeing any. So how long is our revised int list now? Cool. Let's do that. So now what we're going to do is say if it's greater than 5 or 4. Let's do that. If it's greater than 4, print that. It should get it a little bit smaller. Definitely some mistakes still in here. Um, but it's looking a lot less messy. A lot less messy. So we know that that's not going to be it. So let's do something fun right now, and let's just sort this all out. Let's actually let's see how long it is now. How many were we able to get rid of? We got rid of quite a bit. We're able to get rid of that many. Uh, so we've got a lot less that we're working with. Let's go ahead and sort everything. So we're going to do revised ints.sort, and now we can do print revised ints. This is beneficial because we can organize it alphabetically and go through and delete things. So I'm not really concerned about anything that's uppercase. So let me add this other rule in. And if int, um, and the reason why I don't care is because these are the salutations. We're going to write different rules for finding uh, words in those. So um, we want to exclude that. And if the entity uh, dot is upper equals false. I think that should bring us down a little lower and yeah, not much but something now we've got a good list so now we got a, a nice list of looks like um, a combination of true positives that are and also some false positives I believe auxilium can be a, a classical Latin name and I think it does pop up in the Middle Ages some but most likely here it's the word being used at the start of a quotation so what we can do is we can come up with a clever way to kind of get rid of some of these false positives and then start sorting things out between three different entity types. And that's going to be uh, people, places, and groups that appear in these letters. So, for example, uh, I know that a lot of these names are going to be bi bi biblical. So looking at this problem from scratch, I can, I can make a guess that... A biblical name in Latin will not decline and so if it's a name of a person in the Bible I can safely kind of write some rules out or if they do decline they decline in very special ways uh, so Aaron for example Ab Abatsuk I think that sounds biblical Abrahai, uh, Abraham these are both gonna be uh, Abraham in the uh, nominative and uh, and the genitive so we can write some rules out to kind of capture those and we also got some clearly things that um, are tied to places and groups, so the Egyptians or the uh, Egypt, depending on context there. Cool. So what we can do now with these with this output is start writing up some rules to kind of go through and start automating the process of finding and identifying some entities. So like I said, I'm not going to really rely too much on what I've done in the past. Start kind of from scratch. So I know that... Uh, if a word starts with a series of characters, it'll be a person. So let's write out some different ways we can recognize people. So I'm going to make a list of list people, list groups, list places. So I know that I saw Benedict a second ago. And this is going to go a lot faster once we start weeding some of these things out. You'll see in just a second. So we saw Benedict up here. Let's grab all of these because I'm pretty sure these are all names of people. And it might be easier to do this kind of higher up for right now. So I don't have to scroll down a whole bunch. And we're going to go through and just kind of start cultivating this list real fast. So we've got... These guys are all going to be biblical people. Cool. That was easy. 
uh, abyss. That's a false positive. Make a false positive list. Uh, so absque, absentia, these are all false positives. Um, a kefti, a kef, kefimos, these are verbs, a kefit, Adalbert, that's going to be, why is that not working correctly? Oh, there we go. Um, so I keep it Al Albertum, Adelwin, Adelwinus, uh, these are all people. Cool. Um, if we keep on going down this list. I dare eat, I don't think that's going to be, it's going to be those two. So let's do these false positives. And I could be wrong on a couple of these. Again, I'm trying to just get a quick list together that's going to make this a lot more manageable for me in the future. And I'll start making these lists longer like that. OK, where was that? And unfortunately, this part is a little boring. <laughs> so we got another one, Aldracum. More false positives. Nevertheless, we're halfway through the A's, and this will get a little easier as we kind of move forward. All right, where is that? Adrian, Adriatic key. I believe Adriatic is going to refer to a place. So let's go ahead and add this into people. And uh, we'll add this into our first list of places. I'll go back and check that. I'm not entirely certain there. Um, so if we got Adriatic E, that sends. So more false positives. Find where we just were. Cool. And again, we're kind of going through, if you're just now joining, we're trying to go through and create a way to annotate quickly all of the uh, entities that we have in this without any really prior uh, existing model for, in this case, Latin. We obviously have one because I did one. But again, I'm kind of going through and just pretending that it doesn't exist because in the real world, if you're doing this, it won't exist. Uh, so in this case, I got to go with people here, and we're going to be pending that down. And then I got to make a quick Google on this because I can't remember if that is the uh, form for. I looked it up in the past. So it is Agitzius, which is going to be Egyptian. So it's going to be the plural, most likely. So it's going to refer to a group of people in all contexts. So this is our first instance of a group. A group here in this, in this case is going to be anything that is identified as uh, kind of a NORP, if you would use it in um, a traditional uh, modern NLP. So in, um, a national or religious political entity. Uh, we refer to them as group in the ancient world because the idea of nationalism is something that's kind of new in the modern world. And it's kind of a faux pas to apply it to the ancient or medieval world where that didn't exist. So we've now got... Uh, Anidias, I think this might be Aeneas, like a weird spelling. Let's find out real fast. It is. Okay, cool. So uh, this is going to be a person, person, uh, person, all the way down. There we go. And now we've got, where's this at? These are all false positives. So not actually going to be something we consider a person. Find out where we were get again. Ethiopia, that's going to be Ethiopia. So that's a place. Uh, Aganda, Agricola. Agricola is going to be a person. Let me get rid of these first. Agnoske, these are false positives. Um, and then we're going to be going with Agricola. Aiguil. This is a tricky one. I'll have to Google that one as well. 
And uh, let's go with Wiktionary. Helps if you spell it correctly. There we go. And it's not coming up. So this is either a weird typo. I'm going to put this into a list of lookups. Or it's uh, a name that I'm just not familiar with off the top of my head. Uh, so Augustinus is going to be Augustine, Albino, Albinus, Alcuin. These are all the different names of Alcuin. Uh, so you'll see that we can get large, large sums pretty quickly uh, and start cultivating a fairly good list. And we're almost all the way through the A's already. Uh, so weird to be stopped off at Alquinus like that. Uh, Ilianus. Levinus. I don't think that's a person. Let's just double check to make sure. And if anyone does have Latin and wants to correct me as we're going through, please do feel free to. All right, so it's going to be an entity. I'm going to add that into my um, not sure and need to look up later list. Alexis is going to be a person. Alien is not. It's going to be a foreigner. I believe in all contexts it's a foreigner. Oh, cool. We got the Alps. So the Alpes, the Alpina, the Alpinos, Alpium, Alterus, it's not going to be anything, but the Alps are. Let's go ahead and make that good. Um, Alpinos, Alterus, just another, another. Amelicites, I believe that's a group. Amelicites, I believe so. Let me go ahead and do this. And anyways, so let's kind of just end right there for just a second. Actually, let me get to the end of the A's. We're almost through those. Hmm. All right, so Amalekites, this is going to be referring to that individual sorcerers. So they are groups. So they are going to be into the group category, list of groups. And it looks like I copied my Alps into the person. Let's fix that. Cool. So you can see we're starting to get a, a good sense of rules fairly quickly. And this is how a good way to kind of cultivate a list of entities just by if it's a language that doesn't have a model yet, you can kind of go through and get a, a fairly large list really fast. It, it's a little tedious, but it, it works. Uh, so I'm Elijarius, And we're not going to worry about these Aprils for right now because I do have a way of grabbing all of those. Aprilis, Aprilum, all these. We're going to grab deal with those separately. Algerius feels like a name. So Amaljar was a Burgundy. Oh, okay, yeah, that is a person. Great. All right. So I'm starting to get a sense of how this works. Now, if I wanted to, to speed this process up, uh, I can do something a little different at this point. I can go through and check to see if any of these names appear in what we know as the index, the index of names, which occurs at the end of this edition. Now I'm going to also, I should probably just assume that we don't actually have that right now and just keep on going through with this tedious, tedious process. Um, but we'll be done quite shortly, I'm sure. So what I'm gonna do now is, um, create a list of remaining names Hmm. We'll get tour. We might have a way to kind of figure out some rules to automate this up a little bit faster. So a lot of these are going to be some verbs, and uh, we can write some rules to capture, identify if something is a verb, and uh, maybe delete some of them automatically. Or we can do a lookup in a dictionary and see if the word appears in the dictionary. 
that actually might work. Let's give that a try. So uh, Latin dictionary. Uh, this might work. So let's try and take up uh, Majorius. Yeah, that's not going to work. Hmm. Let's do this one more way. You know what? I do actually have this data that I can use. So I've got a list from this database of all the different entities. If you don't know about the prosopography of Anglo-Saxon England, it's really quite amazing. And I believe we can automate the grabbing based on source. So we can grab anyone referenced and any of Alcuin's letters. And it looks like we can. Cool. So accept, 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 go away. There we go. So we've got a lot of anonymous people referenced in Alcuin's letters. Let's skip past the anonymous. Okay. Let's see if that's in our list. So if we got that in our list, this might be possible. It is. Okay. I might take an easy way out. I think we have a way to automate the process of using PACE to grab all different uh, entities based on anyone who's referenced in any of Alcuin's letters. So we've got that many of them. How do we kind of go through this more quickly? Okay, there's 23 of these results. Uh, Aldricus. Penda, Oswald, Edwin. Let me just make sure before I move on in this direction. So recorded name. I think this might just be a list of all persons with that field refined. Indeed it is. <laughs> so I'm not going to web scrape paste, but I am just going to copy and paste. We've got a whole list of all these different names that are referenced within Alcuin's letters. Now it's not going to be the English spelling of the, or it's not going to be the Latin spelling of the name, but we can just grab the the first thing and then say, does it start with this? And if it does, uh, then we're going to be good. So Boniface, yeah, see, so Boniface is going to be spelt that way. Fantastic. Let's go ahead and get rid of that parameter. And let's just copy all these in. So it's going to be, instead of copying, typing all these names out, we can just grab all of it this way. So let's start making a notepad. So I'm going to just copy and paste them over here. And then we're going to use some regex just to separate these things out. Um, we'll have to probably change AE like that, the ash, into something else. Probably an A and an E. E. C. So Charles is going to be Corollus. That's going to be an issue. But this will give us a great way to kind of grab a dodo yep of course 
grab all of these names pretty quickly. And then once we have all the people separated, then it's just a matter of figuring out who the, uh, the remaining people are, the re remaining entities, that is, which means they're probably going to be biblical places or things of that nature. So let's go ahead and grab G. H. I. L. Lydrod. Great. This is looking accurate so far based on what I know. Anna. N. Ninian. So I mean Ninios or something like that. All right. Oh. And not all these individuals are going to be appearing in Alcuin's letters. Some of them appear in other works of his, but we'd rather have too many than too few. Um, Rado. R, S. And some of them are going to have variant spellings, and so we're going to look for anything that starts with maybe the first five letters of these names or something like that, or half the letters. We'll figure it out. Either way, this is going to make our life a lot easier. I don't feel like tediously going through a list of names and annotating them right now. I don't think people on this channel want to watch that anyway. So let's go ahead and do this. All right. Uh, so we're going to save this into our digital alkaline repo. And we're going to save it into the data. And we're going to call this pace names.txt. Cool. Now if we go into data, I've got a uh, pace should be somewhere. Oh, there it is. All these names now copied and pasted in. And we'll just read them in as a list of names. And then we will separate them out based on uh, separate them out with the uh, parentheses that occurs. So with open data backlash pace underscore names dot txt, we're going to read that in. And we're going to, it should be encoding, should be fine, as f. And we're going to say names equals f dot read dot split lines. And uh, then we're going to say for name and names, uh, name equals name dot split at the parentheses. And then we're just going to grab the first instance of that. And we're going to do dot strip. And then we're going to have final names. And again, I'm not a huge fan of, uh, I'm a big fan of actually writing the code out. It makes it a little easier to read, even if it's not as uh, tight. Final names dot append. Cool. And now we can print off final names down here. So let's do that. And we've got a long list of names now known people who appear in these files. So let's go through and just see uh, for name and final n names, uh, if name appears in revised ints, print. If name, oh. see if that works at all. And we got a couple of them. So let's now do if name, we're gonna grab up until the first three characters. Um, is in hmm. we need to iterate over this now so let's do that um, for int and revised ints if name three and int this might be too few. It's catching a lot though. Cool. All right, now let's go ahead and try this. We're gonna print off the entity instead. Um, 
<laughs> not looking too bad actually. Uh, some obvious mistakes, Beata, uh, Beata which is going to be uh, just blessed, uh, but pretty good. Uh, we were able to grab a lot of the items uh, in that list with with this trick. Awesome. So that's that's going to make our life a lot easier. We can uh, eliminate some of these that we know are wrong, which is a lot easier than trying to sift through everything that might be possible. So let's go ahead and do that now. So what we're going to do is we're going to come up with this list of uh, people. Uh, ints, and it's going to be equal to an empty list. And we're just going to go through and append. Now, let's see how many we have. I'm, I'm going to do uh, people ints dot append. And we're going to do the entity. Cool. Uh, and again, you can already see some problems in Jelly and Jelly Coos, but we're going to filter those out in just a second. So print people ends. Uh, print what length people ends. How many did we get? We got 266 that way. That's not too bad. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, list people dot append. I'm trying to debate if I want to just add them in like that right now or kind of keep on going through. Uh, so if it's not there, so how many other ends? Whoa. What? Oh, that's why. Uh, so else um, I'm going to say match is equal to true. And then we can add a condition if we made a match. Match still is equal to false. Hmm. Yeah, that's not right. Um, let's see. Let's iterate the other way and be able to see that way. So for define extents, and let's say Cool, there we go. So now we've gotten our list down to just 1471. We can print off other ints. And we can say, uh, we can also kind of get rid of some of these as well. Uh, so if people ints is going to be equal to, uh, let's go ahead. Uh, people ints is going to be that. List, list people. Should add a few more. Cool. And now we can print off the other ends, and we should be good. Uh, and also, we can make a determination if it's not an FP. Which is their false positive list. We can go ahead and add that in. And now we've gotten that down pretty, pretty good. So Abyss shouldn't be there anymore. Um, and uh, list groups and and not in list places. Cool. Yeah, 
I just made that mistake. Let's go ahead and do that. Cool, there we go. All right, so that's good. Now we actually have uh, a way to actually extract or at least automate a lot of those uh, those entities that we already had. Uh, we were up to, it looked like, I thought I had Agricola actually placed correctly, but apparently not. So whatever, we were able to get through a good deal and now we have a lot less to actually sort out. So another thing that we can do is we can kind of automate the, uh, the finding of places here. So one of the things that I've noticed is that uh, a lot of these place names are going to be probably found um, on the web if we look at Orbis Latina. And I've extracted the, all that from the uh, Latin Orbis Latina. So if you go to Orbis Latina, we've got a couple different um, resources for all these different Latin places. And I've extracted them already in the past, and I actually might copy and paste that in here. Uh, to kind of just generate a way if we can automatically exclude different things. But for right now, I'm going to leave this alone and see what it looks like when we take our person rules that we've already created uh, and start applying them to our letters to see where people actually appear. So Syria, that's going to be a place. I can go ahead and put that in. Turonica is going to be somewhere. Uh, that's going to actually probably supposed to be Judith, not Tudith. Um, let's go ahead and pull up. Now, uh, there are also all these biblical names. I have another list available of all of these biblical names. I am going to go ahead and I am actually going to use that because that is not cheating. I found them all on the web. I forget where, but let's go ahead and pull that out. So, it's in their Latin multi word token. All right, let's pull this over here so I can kind of keep you all in suspense, I guess. But what we're going to do is we're going to try to grab all biblical names using regex. And I don't think it's going to be too difficult. Oh, it looks like I got an expression for medieval people as well. I might use that. So it's all, all the different pace individuals all in one place. Looks like I got a list of medieval cities as well here. Let's find biblical first, biblical. And so here, let me show you what I'm looking at. I've got a list of all different potential biblical names. Uh, and I can make a component in Spacey that'll go through and find them. So let me go ahead and just make that right now. I'm going to copy and paste that over. And it's essentially a massive, massive rules-based approach to finding um, uh, people in a text. And I had it just a second ago. But cool, where are we at? copy that over. And I might use some of these pipes I developed earlier on uh, because a lot of it's just stuff I gathered off the web. So let's block out other ends for right now. And let's do this. So I've got um, some spacey now that we can work with. And what I want to do is I want to go ahead and I'm going to import all of these other special components up here. Filter spans. Okay. And what this pipe does is it's part of a prototype I've been working on for finding biblical people in a text. And I think this might work for us right now without an issue. Um, so one of the things I need to do is I need to check and see if any of the, uh, the people in this list match anything in this long list. So if, if it'll return something. So I can do that without any of this fancy stuff just yet. Let's just see how well it works. Um, so we're going to do for person in biblical expression dot split. 
gonna split vertical right there. And let's go all the way to the end of the cell. Hmm. Yeah, that'll work. So what we're going to do now is we're going to iterate over that list and see if they appear anywhere in our biblical expression. So for uh, int and revised ints, actually, let's add this. right here so biblical persons is going to be equal to that and let's go ahead and rerun this again so we have that cleaned up list so if it's in that match is going to be equal to true. Another thing we can do is we can iterate over our for name in bib purse. That's going to be each of my biblical people. And we're going to do again this little rule. And let's see. Let's go ahead and just clear all this out. We don't really need that right now. Oops. Oh, there we go. Cool. That got us up to uh, 1,200 entities already annotated. And now what we can do is we can print off other ints. And it's looking a lot more manageable. We got through half the list this way. So we can now presume that a lot of these things that remain are going to be the remaining people that we got to uh, account for, the remaining groups, and the remaining places that we haven't thought about. Uh, so we can add some of these real quickly now to the li to lists. So let's go ahead uh, and put all of these into the category of uh, false positives. We're going to put Ambrose into the category of person. And anything that starts off with creased is going to be anything that starts off with Yesu is going to be Jesus. Uh, anything that starts off with uh, what, what else can we come Bide. Write out some of these rules pretty quickly. Okay, that was good. Now let's write out if freeduce freeduce is a common construction. I'm gonna probably get rid of a lot of these with by adding in a rule. Um, freed in int, then we can say people Append int and match. Equal true. Actually, I got to go back through and rewrite, rerun all these, I think. Comment this out. Or just get rid of it entirely. Um, so now we can go through and run that. And we're getting through these a lot more quickly now. Um, all right. Udber. So a BERT is another common construction that's going to be almost always uh, a person, BERT. So we'll add BERT and BERT. Um, so we're to have these rules written out. If freed an int, um, Bert an int, or Bert an int, 
or Bert. And, and then we can make a presumption that's going to be a person. Let's go ahead and rerun these just to make sure we got it right. Cool. So now we're actually really quickly kind of getting through all these things. Belgica, uh, we can kind of grab these. So these are always going to, this is going to be a place. Uh, the Belgi are going to be the people and the Bell guy referenced and Julius Caesar. But we're getting what looks like a lot more, uh, a, a much more manageable list now. Uh, so Timothy, we can add that in. Titus. So I'm just kind of picking out these names right now, the ones that just pop out to me. So the ones that are the easiest ones to just assign, I'm grabbing them. So these are always going to be results that are false positives. I mean, there, Flocky. Flocky's going to be alkaline. So let's go ahead and add these things in. Um, cool. Kukulus, Kukul, that's going to always be. Someone of importance. So let's keep on going through David. I'm surprised David didn't come out with our, our biblical one, but we'll add it in no matter what. So Hild is always going to be an instance of a person. So we can add this one in or uh, Hild. And, and let's go ahead and now rerun all of this and see how good we're doing. All right, we're getting, we're getting there. We're adding some names. But what I'm seeing are a lot more, a lot more false, false positives. So we've got Podtrim here. I'm going to count Podtrim and uh, any of these forms as a person. I think um, a lot of these names are going to be in the Bible without even having to look. Zakayo, Zab Zabadi. Cool. All right, this is a place. This is York. Let's go ahead and append this to our places. Oh, oops, I had the David in the wrong spot. Let's separate these out some. These are always going to be an instance of a person. It's Jerome. Same thing with these Kais. All right, cool. Let's go ahead and rerun this now and see where we're sitting. Should have a lot more grabbed. All right, so Britannia. Britonum. Oh, Britannia, these are all, ah, there we go. I think Britonum is gonna be uh, the, a person, so the genitive plural. So list of places just got a little longer. That's good. Oh, we can add that in, that construct of Bert. Um, or Bert and Ent. Uh, cool, so that's good. Aquilae. 
That means eagle, but it's a common name that Alcuin uses for his friend named Arn. So we're going to add this in. If you're just now joining, we're uh, doing some named entity recognition, some quick annotation of names to, to get an entity ruler up and running pretty quickly. Uh, so we're going to add these names in, even though they're uh, just an eagle in general. In Alcuin's letters, they refer to a very specific person. So uh, any case of doming is going to be referring to the Lord, so we're going to be able to add that in here as well. Dominus. It's always going to be a person, at least almost always. Cool. Martini. So Martin, Martha. I'm not too concerned about all the different forms because we're just looking for something that matches. Oh, oops. Wrong place. Dominus up here. Cool. Now let's see how that looks. Let's go ahead and rerun this. This. So we were at 1262. Looks like I have, there we go. And just to be safe, let's go back and rerun these. So we were at 1262, now we're at 1370. So we're starting to get on the other side of things. Uh, so CHL, this is almost always going to be a person. Claudicus, there's only one though, so let's go ahead and just add him. Okay, so anything that ends in orum, we can also make a presumption that's going to be a group. So if it's not in place, it's having those things. Let's go ahead and now say, um, if the final minus four to that equals orum, this is always going to be a group. Uh, let's print off group int.pend and that's going to be the entity and then we're also going to say match is going to be equal to true because in this case we know what it is and make sure that it's not disagreeing with anything there and let's see now what that gets us to oh helps if you actually specify what the thing is so if uh, int to that degree is that way. Let's go ahead and refresh this. 1374. Let's see if we got any. We've got 25. That's good. So our list just got a little smaller. And we're probably starting to get to a lot more false positives that we can just kind of select in mass. Uh, Hippocrates, it's going to be a person. Zoimer, I would imagine so as well. You can see how you can pretty quickly in just an hour have a lot of annotations for a lot of different entity entities automatically mocked up. Uh, Homer is always going to be a person here. Um, Homer is hominem. All entities that we know. It's my goal to get to the point quite soon. Let's go ahead and just add Agricola into our list of people. Now, it could be just the farmer in general. We're going to take a gambit and uh, guess that it means Agricola, the, the Roman author here. I'm just going to make a guess right now and hope for the best. So let's go ahead and take a look. We got Clemens. Now, this can mean, uh, this can be a couple different things here. This could be a little tricky. Uh, we can ignore it for right now and not worry about it and start making some better work on this in a second. So we've got a lot of Carolis. Um, so these are all going to be different names for Charlemagne or just Charles in general. 
And we got a couple of little typos caught out in that as well. So that's good. Or oh, bad OCR, I should say, not typos. Let's go ahead and rerun all this and see where we're at with everything. Cool. So now we've got uh, 1,400 entities annotated now. So that's good. Uh, 1,400 different people. Why is Agricola still popping? Oh, I had to hit. There we go. Babylon. Baco. Baco is going to be a person. Babylon's going to be a place. The Bretonis are going to be a people. Oh, a place. Let's go ahead and do this. So we got Cyprian, Cyril. Oh, both are people. Cool. Talia. Places. All right. So Johan, all of these are going to be person. Joseph, Jovis, Ipsum is obviously not. I saw Isaac as well, so I'm going to go ahead and write that one in. Let's go ahead now and rerun this and see where we're at. We're getting closer to all these things being... Um, just false positives now. All right. And now we can start just grabbing large chunks of these things, I think. Um, Amone. I'm not sure if that can ever mean a person's name. I'm going to just consider that it's not. And I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to... Apostolo, I should probably keep in there. But again, now I can just start making huge swaths of copying and paste. And this is now going to go a lot faster. Uh, so I've got that. I'm going to call Apostolo a person here because it's always going to be referring to Paul. Apostolus. Almost always, at least. Uh, so what we can do now, if we ever see like a wolf in a name, that's another one that we can always assume is a person. Uh, wolf and Ent. Or, there we go. Now that should get us a lot more names. These are Anglo-Saxon names, so they typically do have these kinds of things in there. Cool. So now we're looking a lot better. Uh, let's go ahead and do some large copying. Arian. Not Quay. Avaria. I don't think that's ever going to be a person. I could be wrong. Babylonia is going to be a place. Let's add these to the false positives now. sure that I end it with a comma before. Cool. And I saw Babylonia, list of places. I thought I already had that one in here. Babo. I had Babylon. Babylonia. These are going to be places. Belgica. Cool. All right, so we were at 1504. Oh, we're still at 1504. What is going on? Hmm. It's not considering Babylon in my list of places for some reason. List of underscore places. Babylon. I'm not really sure what's going on there. Um, oh, or, there we go, this is going to help us out a lot. All right, let's go ahead and rerun this. 
1293. Or not in. So if int's not in FP or the entity's not in list groups, why is it throwing it in there? All these are kepits. Hmm. If it's not in FP, oh, it does need to be and, and. And there we go. Let me make sure here all that stuff is loaded. 1180. It's going to be Bavaria. Baco is going to be a person for Bacchus. Baco. I'm pretty sure this is Bavaria. 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 I'm not sure about Barala. To figure that out. Belgica, Belgicai, Belgici. I'm pretty sure these are the places, and the, that's the the noun of the group of people. Let me just look it up to be safe. Belgica. Proper noun, Belgium. Oh, it's not in the Latin language. Belgica, Belgium. Cool. So the other noun that I have, Belgica, is going to be from Belgium, is Belgi. She with is going to be, I'm pretty sure, the group of Belgians. Belgicus. It's going to be either, it can either be a group or a person. So we're going to just put that into the category of person for right now. Don't worry about that later. Actually, we'll put it into group because there's fewer of those be easier to identify it. Excellent. Bethlehem uh, is going to be a place. So we can also do Ulfus. Uh, this would be good. Ulf, not just uh, wolf. Uh, or Ulf and end. So that's always going to be a person as well. Clement, if you're still watching, we got Clemens here. Uh, let's see, what was I working with a second ago? Bethlehem. Always going to be a place. Cool. All right, let's see where we're at now with our new rules in. We should be getting a lot closer to just copying and pasting everything. Desiderius is always going to be a person. This might be of the city of York. Let me check and see. Yeah, so that is going to be a person, maybe. Uh, could be of the city of York. Uh, let's add that. We'll add that to place. We'll figure that one out later. Yes, it's going to be Jews. Oh, it's UBS. Judea is going to be Judea. That's going to present us with some issues. Lupus is going to be a person, in this case, the individual Lupus. I don't remember him being referenced in the letters, but it looks like he is. It's the older Lupus, not the Carolingian Lupus, I think. The Anglo Saxon Lupus, that is. Okay, I think we got enough now that we can start. Oh, Jakob. We can get all of those Jakobs in there. Why not? We got enough now, or we can start working with our entities that we know. So let's add these into 
Uh, cool. Great. So now we've got a couple really good lists of entities. We're going to do that. We're going to do that. Then we're going to just not worry about this anymore. Oop. So what we are going to do is we're going to combine all groups. So all people is going to be equal to, uh, we'll make it equal to people ints. Um, all groups is going to be equal to group ints. Uh, plus, just in case for whatever reason I didn't grab these final names, or plus uh, list people, list groups, and um, we're not going to worry about that. And then all places is just going to be our list of places. So let's see how much we have of each of these. So all people looks pretty good. Let's go ahead and do a list. When? It's cool. So we've got six, 1,615 different entities that we know are going to be uh, people. We're going to have to do some manual validation here, but this is a quick way to kind of gather a, a very large list very quickly. Now that we have this, we can make a spacey entity ruler. So uh, let's go ahead and minimize some of these articles. We don't really need them all anymore. I'm going to leave that one up. I might still use that. I'm going to keep my app up right now, the one that we're working on for the front end of this project. Um, and we're now going to be able to do this a little bit more quickly. So we need to create an entity ruler in spacey. When we get back, I'm going to take a quick break. I need to get a glass of water. My throat's getting a little dry. I'll be back in about five to 10 minutes. When we get back, we're going to pick up with these lists. We're going to save them uh, to a JSON file and then use them as patterns in an entity ruler that is then going to sit in our app in the back end so that a user can expand. We're going to use the spacey streamlit library. The user will be able to expand uh, like a section, maybe it's at the top, maybe it's at the bottom, maybe it'll be an option they can tick uh, that's going to have this output be not only appear like this, but also appear with annotations where entities are labeled with our simple rules that we've already generated. We're going to improve upon those rules as we move forward. For right now, though, I do need to take a quick break. I'll be right back in five to ten minutes.
All right, now the last thing I wanna do is I wanna save all this data as a, a very specific data structure uh, that's gonna be used by Spacey. So and when we start making this next notebook, we're gonna actually start implementing an entity ruler, which is gonna be a really easy way that we can use these rules that we've just come up with to grab known entities. And then we can start kind of seeing the entity ruler on the actual app, and we'll start seeing the things that we need to add into the entity ruler kind of one by one and make some corrections. So let's go ahead and start doing that right now. And if there's an interest for me to go ahead and push this app to a repo, so you can kind of start using it as we go through, uh, let me know in the chat and I'll, I'll do that. It'll take me just a few minutes. I'm not sure if that'll be useful, but if it is, I'll, I'll do that for y'all. So let's go ahead now though, and just for the time being, get these uh, entities structured in the way we want them to be. We're going to do this in Python or in spacey terms by creating a set of patterns. Now, a spacey pattern needs to look like this. It needs to have a key of a label, which corresponds to um, the type of entity that it's going to be. So it could be like person, uh, and then it needs to have a text or a str or, uh, sorry a pattern or a string of characters that represents what that thing would be. So it would be the person as we iterate over all people. So let's go ahead and do this. So we're gonna say for person in, person in all people, all patterns dot append, we're gonna append this dictionary. And then we're gonna do the same thing It'd be better to have a function that does this, but again, we're writing really quick scripts just to, to achieve kind of a larger goal. So we're going to iterate over all the groups, and that's going to be um, for all groups, and that's going to be for group oh, in all groups. And we'll do the same thing with places, iterate over all places, place. And this is why you don't copy and paste, because it'd be really easy to make a mistake here and end up with a bad set of patterns. So let's do that. And we can print off all patterns. And this is gonna be quite large, uh, but this is uh, a quick print off. This is what we wanna see. So we got a label, Alduino, Alduino, and it's going on down the list. It'll also grab person and place. And we can, like I said, we're gonna be improving this as we move forward. So let's go ahead now and write all of this to a JSON file. I believe I've imported it. I have not. So we are going to import JSON right now. Where am I at? There we go. Import JSON. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say with open, uh, we're going to drop this into data backslash. Uh, we're going to call this patterns.json. W for write as F. And I don't think we're going to have any encoding issues, but just to be safe, always better safe than sorry. Now we're going to do json.dump, and we're going to dump in um, all patterns into the f file with an indent of equal to 4. I always like to do indent equals 4. It just makes it look nicer, in my opinion. Definitely not mandatory. And if we go over here, we'll notice that we've got all of our json, all of our patterns now loaded up, exactly as it should be, a list of dictionaries. This is what Spacey is going to expect. This is what Spacey wants. So now that we've got that data kind of stored out, now we can start making a, a new file. And this is good to compartmentalize all of these steps because if we find that we made an error at some point, we can kind of go back and easily kind of correct our steps moving forward. So um, we're just gonna call this the spacey entity ruler. All we need here is going to be spacey. That's gonna be it. And it's not gonna be too difficult to do. We're gonna create a, uh, a blank spacey model spacey dot blank and unfortunately since latin doesn't exist a spoiler alert it will hopefully in the near future we plan on doing a push at cltk for a uh, latin model or latin a blank entity latin model which i don't believe currently is supported i could be wrong somebody let me know if i am please uh, but we're going to be making a push for that that's going to have a tokenizer as well as all of uh, the other stuff hey clem welcome back and you missed the, the full app development. So we actually got the first push on the uh, on the app up and running, Clem. Uh, so we're going to be making a push with CLTK for our Latin pipeline in the near future onto Spacey. That's a, a little bit of a spoiler of what's coming up in the next few weeks. So now that we've got 
our NLP up and running, uh, we need to actually append to it an entity ruler. So we're going to do nlp.add underscore pipe, and we're going to add an entity ruler. This is a known component to, ent uh, to Spacey, and we notice that we see this output, and that's a very good sign that we have actually done everything correctly. So now comes the fun time of loading in our uh, patterns. I probably should import JSON right here. We are going to be doing uh, with open. Hey, thanks, Bob. Uh, we're going to be doing with open, and we're going to grab in all those patterns that we just created. So in this case, patterns.json, data patterns dot patterns dot JSON, and we're reading them in right now. And again, I don't think encoding is an issue here, but I just want to be extra safe do as utf8 as f and then we're going to say uh, patterns it's going to be equal to json dot load f which is going to be the file cool so now that we've got our patterns let's just kind of print off patterns zero just to make sure it looks right so we've got aaron who is a person so that looks good to me now that we've got that let's go ahead and start injecting those patterns into our entity ruler well, how can we do that? Well, we can do it by <laughs> fixing what I just did up here. This needs to say ruler is equal to that. And let's go ahead and just rerun all of this just to make sure it's all cleared out correctly. Um, so now that we've got that, we're going to say ruler.add, I believe it's add patterns. Fingers crossed. Hey, cool, it is. And now that we've got that saved, we've got a blank English model, which can tokenize a sentence with an English tokenizer. Um, it's not going to be great at tokenizing Latin, but it doesn't really matter for our purposes. And now we can save this to disk. So uh, let's just call this Latin ruler. We're going to drop it. Oh, we probably need a new folder here. Let's call this models. We're going to have a machine learning model, I think, at some point if we have time in these 48 hours. So let's do that. And to disk. And we should have our model in there now. Great, we do. So what we have here is, uh, I'm not a fan of that. Let's fix this. Um, let's have let's give some panache to this. We can call into our our meta. I believe it's as a dictionary. Um, and I think we can adjust all these things. So like the name of the pipeline, let's call it uh, digital alkaline, or right, let's just call it medieval. Why not? Uh, we're gonna make that equal to, or no, sorry, pipe line. We're gonna make that equal to medieval. Helps if you do this right. And I think I'm wrong here. I could be, yeah, it's not. So it's dot meta to call into it. Cool, that's it now. Now we should have a different, hmm. Well, I'm not really sure why that's changed. I believe you, I thought you could do it this way. I could be wrong. Let me look at the documentation real fast. It's just a nice way to kind of automatically go through and add features to the pipeline that reflect kind of you as the creator who made it and different things like that. So I'm pulling up the docs, it'll take me just two seconds. Uh, meta. Uh, is it? Ah, that's why. Uh, it's the name. I was trying to do that. That was my fault. So it's going to be name here. And thanks, Clem, who's kindly pointed out that I've misspelled medieval. So that's going to be fixed. And so now we can do some other things. We can adjust also uh, things like author. So let's just make that equal to. Uh, digital Alcuin project. Why not? Uh, description. Yeah, we're not gonna worry about any of that stuff. So let's go ahead and just do that. And English does not have that. Again, I gotta get, to, I get into meta. Cool. Now when we open up our our meta JSON, we have this. So the author is the Digital Alcuin project. That looks pretty cool. All right, so now comes the fun time of actually implementing this in our app. So we're going to go back to Adam now and start working with the app.
<laughs> so what I want to do now with this app is I would like for this output, for the user to have an option. I want the user to be able to determine, do they want to look at raw text, because that's useful, or do they want to look at text that has been uh, annotated by an NER model, or in this case, an entity ruler. So they're going to have two options for doing that. So to do that, we need to do a few things. We're going to have to import uh import streamlit spacey i think it's with it no, it's with the underscore underscore um and i have to pull up some old an old th thing i worked on that actually used this for my ner app open in a new rubber render and recover state sure why not how i did this i can't remember off the top of my head So what we want to do is we want to say models is going to be equal to, and I'm going to go ahead and put this on the side so we can see that. The models is going to be equal to just our entity ruler that we just made. So it's going to be a list, but you'll see why this is important in just a second. So models is going to be um, data, no, models backslash Latin. Where did I put it? Models Latin ruler underscore ruler. So now we've got our uh, our app where it can actually load in. Yeah, exactly, Clem. You can check out to see if it was collect, uh, correctly scanned. Um, this is the OCR. You missed kind of the first few hours, which was kind of tediously writing the rules. And it'll be in the GitHub repo for actually being able to correctly OCR it. So notice that our OCR is just of the letter and nothing that comes, comes before and none of the footer data either. It's just the raw OCR of the main body of the text. So yeah, you can kind of go back and check if the OCR isn't that great. In some cases, it might not be. So that's our ruler. And now what we need to do is we need to actually use that ruler to, uh, to visualize some uh, data. So let's come up with visualizers. And this is going to be a list of the components in Spacey that we want to use. In this case, it's just going to be the entity ruler. And then we can kind of come down here and we're just going to test out this feature right now and then uh, add in an option to actually do it. So what we want to do is at this stage, at this stage, we've got the image. No, we don't want the image messed up. We want to work right here. So what we want to do is we want to create a doc object, essentially. Actually, column one dot um, streamlet. I think this can work this way. Let's try it out. Spacey streamlet. We might have to make this as a separate column. I'm not entirely sure. We'll find out in just a second. Visualize. And we're going to visualize models. And we're going to do the, uh, we're going to do the text. So in this case, it's going to be the letter. And we want to also have visualizers equal visualizers. So let's go ahead and save this and rerun it. Uh, yeah, I thought we were going to get an error like that. Uh, import streamlet spacey didn't work. Streamlet underscore spacey. I'm pretty sure that's the correct syntax. Let's find out. Oh, it's spacey underscore streamlet. Cool. Spacey underscore streamlit. And now let's rerun that. And it's my goal that the entity ruler is going to be sitting back there right now and allowing us to go through. And it doesn't let us put it into a special column. This means that we got to get a little creative in how we uh, visualize the streamlit data. I believe that spacey streamlit has an option to turn off a whole bunch of features. And if that's the case, I think we can control the output and populate a window. So I'm going to go to Streamlit Spacey's website because they've got some really good documentation of examples. Uh, custom. I think it's custom.py. Yeah, this is a case where you can just only visualize a very small set of data. Let me go back and make sure. Uh, so custom by use individual components in your existing app. That's what we want. We want to just use an individual component. So this is going to be what we want. This is where the magic is going to happen. If you don't know about Streamlit Spacey, it's you're going to see why I'm spending the time figuring this out right now. 
because it makes life just so much easier. Uh, so in this case, we're going to just only work with one model. We're going to add in another model later. Um, let me stick with her syntax here. And this is, oh, so spacey underscore model. Um, we don't care about the title, the text. Oh, we're not going to worry about that maybe just yet. We do want to make the doc object. So let's make it down here where we're going to be calling it. So I'm going to just delete everything I did there because that was clearly wrong. Um, so the next thing that we need to do is we need to have this because we only want to visualize that NER component. And I'll make this look a lot cleaner. And then under column one right, we are going to write, uh, what? Let's see what this looks like. I'm not sure I've done this correctly. Uh, let's go into our app rerun. Yeah. Um, oh, I got to not do the text. Where is it at? Letter. So we've opened it up at this stage, right? Yep, we have. OK, cool. Uh, so you see why I spent that time doing it. So I think I can make this work. I think I can just drop this into column one, maybe. Let's see. I can't. Hmm. So let's stick with this right here. I don't know if I can do column one at this stage. We've got a problem there. Magna is not obviously a person, but we've got Benedicto, Dominu, Dominus. Things are being flagged correctly with our entity ruler. Now when we're looking at this, we can make some rules, or we can just go back and delete some of these things. So Temete, Temor, these are not people, obviously. Um, so let's go back and, and change some of that in just a second. But for right now, I need to figure out how to get uh, this loaded up into an actual column. Person, dates, location. Uh, we also need group and place. Uh, rerun. All right, there's no group or place referenced in here. All right, so how do we get this visualize spacey.streamlet process? Okay, let's see if I got rid of that. Oh, that might be where I can drop it. Um, into column column one. If not, I can probably get the output of it and just load it into column one. Yeah. Streamlit spacey. We can get hacky with it if we have to, to visualize this better. But for right now, I'm not going to try that. I think there is a way that we can do this. Um, what if I control the output? Um, I wonder if I could do this. Fingers crossed. I've never tried to do this before, so this is kind of fun. Uh, we've got none. Hmm. So it's always going to want to put it out that way. If anyone has a suggestion that's on right now and knows how to actually get Streamlit Spacey to populate into a column. I'd be very interested to hear about it right now. And that's what I'm currently trying to figure out. Um, so tables equals false. Yeah. 
title. I don't want the title. I mean, we could just put it at the very bottom and a user could just read through it that way. It's a little clunky. Let's try that though. Uh, we're gonna drop all that there. We're gonna leave that as letter. And then we can just kind of put this down at the bottom. I'm not a huge fan of that. Yeah, that doesn't look good. Let's see if it works though, if we switch to letter four. So it's working. working that's that's the good thing and we do see that our annotations are actually working the way we want them to again like I said Galileo we're gonna have to add in we're gonna add in some of these extra things that, it, that it's missing but for right now the results are looking quite nice Let's do 22 Tommen obviously not a person Deus here is a person or at least we want it flagged as a person Boita uh, cool Ruberti Clemens, that's obviously not a person in this context, but um, we can fix that. All right, so let's try to figure out and debug our app issue. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit so it's easier to read. All right. So if we've got the doc object, it can be analyzed You know what, we can do some hacky HTML if we need to. It's not gonna be that difficult, I don't think. <laughs> I thought you'd like that, Clem. Okay, so I don't wanna have to do hacky HTML. There's gotta be a way to put that result into a column. Okay, so we can show the config. I don't care about that. Uh, JSON doc, that'd be nice to give people. Hmm. <laughs> I really don't think that's going to work. I think I already tried that. Yep. I think we're going to have to do this a little hacky. So one of the things we can do is we can edit the HTML of the text so that when an entity is found, it'd just be nice if this was done all out of the box. You know what we could do? We could have the a sidebar now at this stage so a user can do... Uh, see the raw text yeah let's do that that might be even easier um so let's create a sidebar now 
and we're going to do um, sidebar.title uh, dot header choose app objective app task and we can give people a couple different options they can pick from so they can pick from uh, let's do a select drop down menu and so we can give people the option to pick from I don't know a few different not things uh, so um, options is going to be equal to st dot select box and uh, select mode we're gonna have a few different options here um, I want people to have uh, letter mode NER letter and for right now those are gonna be your only two options and so if all this stuff is going to be the same until we get to this stage here if uh, if the options equals letter mode that's going to be the default uh, then we're going to do all of this fun stuff uh, where did it go where's my condition there we go uh, if it's not if options equals what they call it NER mode then we're gonna do this this is gonna make it a little cleaner it's not ideal we'll figure out how to make it better later on all right let's rerun that now we're gonna have an options tab and I don't have it st dot sidebar uh, where are you sidebar dot select box oh nope not there st dot sidebar all right cool now we've got this option over here switch to NER mode okay we've done something wrong <laughs> all right so it's created the doc object where why isn't it printing out Switch to letter mode. All right, letter mode works. We're happy with that. NER mode. Oh, NER letter. Let's change that to NER mode. Switch to NER mode. Now this should work. And now we got the, the error that we had before. We're okay with that. Um, we can do a lot of this stuff. I have to repeat a lot of this code. Zoom out a little bit. Um, I'm going to grab the file with open letter. So we might be all right now. We'll just copy and paste that. I think that should do it. Uh, cool. We run. Need to add that in there as well. Cool. Now we've got the app where it works. So it's not ideal, but we're getting there. So now a user can switch between different modes. They can go into letter mode where they'll be able to look at the letter side by side. Maybe we could have a different mode where it's just the raw text of the letter and they don't have to worry about this images thing. Um, so I'm going to switch over to that, add, or I'm going to switch it up a little bit and add an extra mode. So. We've got that. Uh, let's give another mode called um, letter mode, NER mode, uh, side by side mode. And then we can say if it's side by side, we're gonna all this is gonna be for side by side. So if that's side by side, then do that. And then we're gonna say now if LF options equal letter mode then we're gonna do just a letter so we're not gonna worry about columns we are 
going to just do this. Uh, we'll do the header that way, st.header. And then we're also going to have to grab that. I already grabbed that. And then the next thing we want to do is we want to do st.write header or st.write letter. And I think that'll be it. So now the user can switch between the raw text of the letter. We've got some parameters they can go into. They can go into any R mode, in which case it'll be the named entity recognition popping out. And they can also go into side by side mode. And I think we should be able to navigate any of these modes really easily because that state is going to be previously saved. So we've got uh, letter 18, which starts right here. And it looks like it's only one page long. Or is it? It looks like it might be longer. Why isn't that showing up now? Ah, oh, here we go. Because we had a problem. Uh, so I've got to adjust that code a little bit. Looks like I have my page set up incorrectly. All right, let's go back. No problem. So in dual mode, the problem is occurring right here. It's going and trying to grab 00-15 for some reason. My suspicion is I haven't cleaned something correctly. And I think it should be 00 Let's go into our files and see what that's supposed to be. Yeah, it's just supposed to be 0, 015. Why is there a dash being inserted there? Underscore 0, 0, 0015. It shouldn't even be 0, 0. It should just be 0, 015. Hmm. Also, I'm not sure that's right for that letter. The start and the end position. So it starts at the correct number, but it doesn't end at the right number. It's ending at 15. So something's wrong with my JSON file. Let's go and check and see where that's at and look up letter number 18. Something's clearly wrong there. So where's my JSON file at? It has all this data. Letter spans. Letter page spans. So letter 18 starts at 49. Ah, this is our problem. And it ends at 1. That's clearly wrong. Um, and this is also wrong. About 19 starting on that page. So they're both clearly starting on the same page. Let's see if we can figure this out real fast. Uh, we can make a quick correction. This is good. We're debugging things as we go through. So we need to figure out letter 18. What was the page it started it with? So it starts with 49. So we're going to find Adobe Images. Let's go down to 49. And it looked like it was quite long. Make sure it starts on the right page. So we got a problem there now. Oh, that's right. It's 49 minus 18 or plus 18, so 49 minus 18, that's going to put us around 32, 33, cool. Okay, so now we got to go up how many pages to figure out where 18 ends? We're still on 18, still on 18, and we're on page 40, uh, 56. So at 56, that happens. So the transition occurs on 56. We go back to my data. So we know that this happens on 56 and 56. Oops, numlox was off. 56. And this happens on 56. Let's save that. All right, let's refresh our app. I could have just done it that way. Oh well. Uh, so let's go down to 16 or 18 and do side by side mode. And we should have our images now. Cool.
but we're not getting all the images. Ah, we're only getting the first and the last. So this is now the next thing I have to debug for this. So we gotta change the code up a little bit because it's just grabbing the first and the last image. That's my fault for not writing that correctly. So if we know where it starts and we know where it ends, we need to iterate through everything. Where do we grab the start and the end for the letter? Uh, page spans, where is this at? Right, let's ignore that for right now. Uh, so we've got page spans, page spans. So our image list, our image list should be everything. Okay, it's just the end to beginning, so we need to iterate over them a little differently than I have I have done. So we need to grab all those pages. So if we got the image list, okay. So we need to tick up. So for I and range, starting with image list. Okay, so we need a minus 16. No, we don't have to worry about that. So we're gonna say for I in range of image list, that's where it starts, and where it ends is gonna be um, for that range, let's just do column two dot right. I, just to troubleshoot this, I think this might work now. All right, so we've got from pages 49 to 55, so we're going to do that plus one. And that'll get us our list. Let's just troubleshoot this one more time, make sure that it's correct. 56, okay. So image, all images is going to be equal to this new list. So all images dot append I and we're going to run that across all images. Now I think this is going to work. Yay. And it does. So we've got all the pages now of letter 18. So that problem is now troubleshot. Hello. Welcome. I just saw that someone said hello. Sorry if I missed it and it's been there for a while. Uh, we've been going for 10 and a half hours and we started, we've now got an app that's actually up and running. Um, this is for the Digital Alcuin project, which presents all of the, uh, all of the uh, letters of Alcuin uh, to the public, where they can be copied and pasted, as well as their, uh, a photocopy of the MGA tradition, which is out of copyright on the right hand side. And the raw text can now be copied and pasted and uh, actually use that way instead of having to be tediously handwritten out every time you want to cite one of the letters. And now uh, we're also working on the NER and the different components of the app. So let's go ahead and now switch over to the NER side and take a look at how this is working. All right, it's looking great. Uh, Quonium, not a person. I can get rid of that. Uh, definitely got some issues. Elorum. Uh, this is not a group. Uh, technically it is, but it's not a, a named group. It's just of those. We can fix that. Legimus, again, we can fix that. Magnum, fix that. Similitaire. So one of the things we need to start going through now is through our patterns file and start correcting it because this is clearly not producing the results that we want to see. Uh, for example, Ecclesia is not a person. Neither is Timite. Episcoporum, mm, still not a, a group. Cool, this is an example of where our one of our rules actually came in to, into play. This is bad OCR with the percent sign, and yet we were able to grab it with our OCR, or with our um, NER. So let's start going through now and just deleting some of these absurd things that are never going to be names. So we can start off with the Elorum. So the best way to do this, I think, is going to be to, let's go into our 
our atom now because we can't really edit JSON files easily in Jupyter Lab. And we're going to go and we're going to uh, let's take a look at our models and we're going to just make a duplicate as a backup. We're going to call this backup in case we accidentally override it for some reason. Uh, and that's where going to be what we actually go in and edit. So what we can do is we can go into the entity ruler and we can go into the patterns. And we can actually just quickly go through these and delete the things that are, we don't care about duplicates so much, but we can delete quickly uh, the things that uh, that are definitely not pos uh, gonna be positives. So these two are definitely not people. And like I said, it's a lot easier to delete things from a list than it is to add things to a list. So Agricola is going to always be a person. Albim, Albim, we can get rid of these because they're just duplicates. It's gonna slow it down, not by a lot, but it will. Um, and what we're looking at right here is something known as a JSON-L file or a line-segmented JSON file. Uh, the Athenae, uh, that's going to be a place probably, Athenae. Let me just triple check. I've never actually seen uh, Athens referenced I don't know if that's the the person form or the the locative or the uh, the place form. So it's going to be of Athens. So it's going to be a place in that context most likely. Wait, well, no, maybe not. No, it is. Cool. So this is going to be a place. Okay, yeah, definitely never a thing. Bonus bonum. Binas, not a thing. Uh, Bethlehem, this is going to be a place. Caritas, never going to be a thing. Carissimo, never going to be a thing. Carnelis, same thing. And we have these duplicates in there because um, these entities appear quite frequently, and I didn't make this uh, so that the duplicates were removed. I probably should have, but we've come too far. I'm just gonna do it this way. We can fix it later. Uh, none of these are ever going to be. Contra, Corday. Columbum is going to be. Even though that means just dub, it's a name that's oftentimes given to a couple of this guy's uh, friends, uh, specifically a woman. I can't remember who Columba is off the top of my head. Corpus is never going to be one. Credat Corvi, that can be a name. I can't remember. He has a lot of friends with nicknames that have uh, names. So Corvi is the genitive of Corvus, which is going to be the raven. And I can't remember, or a crow. I can't remember who has that off the top of my head. It's, it's Rabanus, I'm pretty sure, but I don't remember him being referred to as Corvus by Alcuin. Credulum. And we're going through and just kind of quickly deleting these. So Kiprianus, it's going to be a person, custody, definitely not. All right, now we're into the Ds. Domino, Dominus. Um... All of those are looking all right to me. Ecclesia is not going to be a person. Um, cool. Felicium, that can be. We're going to leave it for right now. That's not a person. Esne is not a person. Estote, I don't believe is. Etunuit. Pretty sure that's not. Goliath, notice that this is the uh, preserving the typo. That's going to be important. Uh, Gildiv, that must be. I don't know what non-nominal word that would be. Uh, Gundulfulvum. If you're just now joining, we're kind of going through and, and cleaning up an entity ruler in Spacey. To find names. Let's kind of save this right now. And we're going to find that Elorum, I think, soon. 
Unless we already had it past it. There we are. I did miss it. Uh, Laocorum. I'm not going to count that one. Mercicorum. Uh, Mercorum. That might be uh, a reference to people back in uh, England from Mercer. I, I'm going to leave that one. Sanctorum. Uh, that's tricky. I'm going to get rid of it, though. Signorum. Not going to be a thing. Tulorum. Not sure what that is a reference to. The Turo, uh, Turorum, the people of Tu. Oh, no. The Aegyptis. Uh, that's going to be a group. Melchites. These are all looking good. So now we're into the places. And we've already fixed it. So we've gone through all of them pretty quickly. Oh, it looks like I didn't do it right. So I skipped. Did I skip a lot of these? Tolite, uh, Tolitur. These are not. And I remember there were a lot of fear terms. Timor. Uh, there we are. Timeo. These are not instances. Timinda. Uh, now that feels like a participle. Thesaurus, I don't believe, is ever going to be a person, but let me just Google it just to make sure. Uh, mm. I'm not sure. I'm going to leave it. If I need to change it, I can always go back and change it. Terra is never going to be a, a place or a person, either one. Tertia is not going to be either, not at least in these contexts. Tempori, Tempum, nothing. Uh, tantum, Tebrancia, Tandem, Domesti, Tamen, Tamen, Talis, Talis, Tamen. Definitely a null. Uh, Scipiat, Salve, uh, Solus, Solum, Solent. You can see all these different things we're able to quickly kind of just go through and delete. Simul, definitely not. Simonis is going to be. Temptatio and Tempus, neither one of those will be. Sermo, Serva, I'm not going to count them. Servatur, not going to count that. Neither Signa, Signatur, Signa, Signorum, Silvestri, I will count, obviously. Solum, Skyst. Saturnus, ah, that's going to be a tricky one. I'm going to keep that as person for now. I'm not going to count anything that is just called holy. Salvator, I'm going to keep. That's going to be a reference to the Savior. I will keep that one. Salus, never going to be. Salamanis will be. Sacerdotes, mm, no. Sacri, Sacrificium, definitely not. Sacerdotes, not going to be a person. And now we get to all these fun cues that gave us a lot of problems. Pristo, Prizens, none of these are. Like I said, it's a lot easier just to delete things from a list than to go through and add them, as we saw earlier. So Pipino is going to be a person. That's Pippin. Petrus, good. We got all these. Petrus, Petrus, Paul, Paul, Perfectio, Perdizio. Periculum, nope. I'm not even sure what that is. Parrots, uh, that's actually going to be one of the editors, so that means that it's come up somewhere. Uh, we're going to, uh, let's just delete it. Pericure, run through, not going to be that. Pouchy. Uh, pouchies, let's get rid of some of these. Parvum, parvu, parus, paritere, parche, para, para. Austin Don Tour, nope. Off for on, uh, can't remember. I don't think that's ever going to be a name. Neck non, new vase. I'm not sure what that means. I'm going to leave it for now so I can correct it later. Miss Heat. Moras, Moras, Moribus, Moris, Morte, Morte, Mortus. Uh, Mozans, that's going to be Moses. So let's go ahead and get rid of all of these things that are definitely not going to be anything. Mericorum. Mentis. 
Malifi, that feels like something, feels kind of rivery. Let's look it up real fast. All right, uh, it's Latin, it's an adjective, so it's not going to be a person. Honey dropping, yeah, definitely not. So the flow of honey. Ah, Melus. That's interesting. So Melius, Melior, cool, we're not going to get rid of those. All right. Matthew, we are going to keep. These are all scriptural references, though, so we don't need those. Matthias, Martis, mm, this is tricky. This is probably in reference to March. We're going to delete that because we're going to write in some rules for capturing uh, dates in just a little bit. So all the different Martinez, Marte. Mm. I'm going to leave it for now. I will make sure that the pipe for dates sits before this pipe when we get to it. So Mandavate, none of these are going to be anything to do with that. I don't think Manda will be either, but let me just check. Pretty sure that's just a participle from eating. Hmm. Or it could just be a bad OCR. It might be a name. I'm going to leave it for now. So Magus, uh, not going to be... Actually, Magus might be. It might reference a specific magician. I'm going to leave it for now. Magnus, Magnus, none of these are going to be. Magister might refer to a named teacher. I'm going to leave it. See how it looks in the letters. It might need to be deleted. Labor is never going to be a name. Theostote. Maybe? Looking like bad OCR to me. Laicorum. Johannes, Johal. All right, we're getting back up to where I was at before, I'm thinking. Uh, Edrin. I'm not sure. I'm going to leave that. It's clearly bad OCR. Felix, ah, Felix is going to mean luck, but in this case, it might be referring to uh, the person Felix, which is a known entity with the Eucharist controversy. Okay, cool. Uh, Ecclesiarum, that's not. I think I got it now. Debet, that's not going to be. We can make some. We can make some corrections to this as we kind of go forward. Uh, I'm going to change this name also from backup now to kind of improved. Valid. How about valid? Oh, I gotta change this name or close that. Uh, back up. We're gonna change it to rename. We're gonna name you valid. Why can't I do it? All right. Well, it's not gonna let me change that right now. But anyways, in the app for right now, I think it's because I might have this loaded up into uh, Streamlit. We're gonna make our model this backup one. And now when we go through. Let's go ahead, let's rerun this page. We should see some improvement. Cool, all of our false positives are now deleted. Looking a lot better. So let's go ahead and look at entity one, or letter one, Benedicto, Domini, Dominus. We had a bunch of false positives here before. Now they're all gone. Deus isn't being grabbed. I need to fix that. I'm not really sure why it's not being grabbed. I must not actually have it. So let's go back into our patterns and let's add it manually doesn't really matter where it's at deus dei and deo i think i got them all there that'll be all the forms that it appears in we can go back and let's rerun and make sure that we're grabbing it so we're kind of just using our app now to help us really easily start assimilating uh I'm going to be uh, streaming as much as I can for 48 hours. I might need a few hours uh, at some point late tonight, in which case I will stop. But I'm going to give it give it my best. Maybe it's because I still have it open. I can't pull it. Let's switch modes, maybe.
switch to letters and go back to it. Not entirely sure why that deus isn't being grabbed. That is truly, truly odd. Pattern, label, person. I'm thinking it might be because that model is being cached. I bet Streamlit Share does that to make it run faster. Yep, it does. Cool. Well, we learned something new today. So Streamlit Share uh, does cache the model for you. So you don't actually have to cache it yourself. I was going to have to write all that in. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so it looks like letter two, we got all the entities correct. Let's switch over. We know, or letter one, we know that letter two had those issues, but we can start to kind of work through them because it's going to be part of letter one. I might just do some manual cleaning on that. Not a huge fan of the results of it. So this is going to be where we start to, oh, tribulation. Cool, we have another false positive. Tribulatio is not going to be correct. So let's go ahead and go back into our patterns and find Tribulatio, which should be in here. It's in here twice. Good, we can get rid of those. Uh, Trinitate, I'm going to leave Trinitate in here um, because it means the Trinity. People might want to actually extract that as an entity. Uh, so I'm going to keep it. So anyways, now we got that figured out. Let's go ahead and go back to our app and start looking at other false positives. And then I'm going to clean this up a little bit. Uh, I don't, I'm not a fan of that. Let's see. F4, remember F3 we weren't able to extract with our rules. Cristo, cool, things are looking good. Things are looking really good. So again, this is not even a machine learning model. This is just a set of rules we were able to generate pretty quickly, thanks to a couple different resources. Even with the typos, we were able to capture these entities. And uh, it's looking a lot better. I'd like to see something where we got a place referenced. Again, I don't know what Manda means off the top of my head. Uh, it's definitely, it looks like a participle. It might just be bad OCR. Here's where we can kind of do our thing. So it's on page 34. Let's use our app to actually figure it out. So we can do side-by-side -side mo mode. And let's go down. Manda is going to be right here. If anybody knows what Manda means, please tell me. Uh, Manda and Frido ut ad te viniat. Um, yeah, what does that mean? The OCR is right then. It's just really, really odd. Uh, let's look up, uh, let's use a proper Latin dictionary. Usually, Wiktionary catches most things. Uh, manda and Latin. And trust. Oh, Google to the rescue. It is on Wiktionary. I'm not sure why it wasn't coming up earlier. Uh, so, in Latin, so it is a participle. To vow. Oh, that's in Spanish. Where is Latin? Comes from Mondo. Yeah, okay, great. I was right then. Order, command, confide, put into writing, and trust. So it's definitely going to be a, not a, um, a Mondo. Cool. It's definitely not going to be that. Too bad it wasn't Mando. That'd be kind of cool, given the, uh, the recent Star Wars show. All right, let's clear the cache. So we're going to clear that model out of the cache. And now we're going to uh, switch into our NER mode. And again, it's loading up the model. And Manda's now out of there. Cool. Uh, so Frat Gonig. Again, this feels like a name in this context. Uh, Demander. Thanks, Clem. So it is, it is in fact, a part, um, some kind of a participle then in that context. Uh, so Aduvia. Uh, not probably going to be an entity. Intermedicus. So we got some improvements, but I mean, it's coming along quite nicely, our entity ruler. It's working pretty well. I really want to find an example of a letter with a place. That's my goal. Oh well, doesn't matter. Uh, 
definitely the results are looking better and better as we kind of keep on going through. Letter 18 was long. That might have the place referenced. Cogitate, Dei person. Deum! I forgot one of my days. Let's go back and add Deum into our entity ruler. I think I put Deum at the very top. Can't believe I forgot that one. <laughs> Aduvia, yeah, I was pretty sure that was help. Thanks, Clem. That's really helpful. No pun intended. Um, so Ad Yuvia. I just wasn't sure if it could ever function as a name. It didn't look like it was in that context anyway. Uh, so we've gotten rid of Aduva. We've added in Deum. It's going to be a typo. Let's fix that up. We can clean these a little bit more. Similiter is never going to be a person. Let's go back. Neither is Legimus. So Legimus. Let's remove you. Legitur. Similiter. Silvestri could be. It could not be. We're going to leave it for now. It could just be a... It's usually going to be the Pope, though. Yeah, Deum wasn't correctly tokenized. Um, so it grabbed... So one of the things is that I'm working with the uncleaned OCR, Clem. And so what's ended up happening is um, is it's got these weird et symbols still in there when there was actually a, 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 a citation, like a, like a footnote. And I got a lot of them, but I, I missed the et symbol. So I'll have to go back and clean these up again. But again, it's, it's looking a lot better already. All right. In a second, we're going to switch tacts, and we're going to start. Oh, cool. We finally have a place. I'm happy. <laughs> so we've got Italian. So we've got a whole section right here where places are referenced. We don't have Britannium uh, because, it, as Clem has pointed out already, um, it's probably being tokenized with that, um, with that mark right there. Mopso, I'm not sure what that is. That might be bad OCR. It might be uh, something. I'm not too sure what it is just yet. Um, Martinum is going to be the patron saint of Tour. Uh, Clem, who is here, uh, should be very familiar with uh, St. Martin being the patron saint of Tour. Um, you saw a Deo in there. Oh, thanks, Clem. I'm not sure what. I'll have to do some extra cleaning on the on these, but I'm going to add Britannum right here just randomly it doesn't really matter um where it's at and then one of the things i think that might be kind of fun is a lot of this part of the app cleaning can uh can be uh just really like we're doing seeing right now it can be uh crowdsourced like what are some things that you're seeing that are unclean let me know and then i can fix it so we're looking for mop so where does that appear so it appears on page 66 uh, and it appears, looks like kind of towards the end. So this might be hard to see on your screen, but we're on page 66 here. It appears towards the end, Mopso. De Mopso. It must be a person, surely, right? Mopso. Mopsus. Oh, apparently it is a, an individual. A legendary seer, Manto Calcas. So it's going to be a name. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to allow it. So let's go ahead and add Mopsos in. Mopso. I'm sure that's the only occurrence of Mop in this entire thing. I've never seen that before. So we've got that added in and Sanctum Yodicum. Clem could use some help. How would you, uh, <sighs> I'm going to classify that as, uh, what should I classify it as? Sanctus Yodicum. Would you, uh, would you classify it as, uh, the Sanctum Yodicus? Oh, it's referring to Ah, 
Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, we can work with that. Good catch on that one. So we're going to have Sanctos, uh, in this case, work as a pattern. So we can actually add in a, a rule here if an individual is ever followed by Sanctus Yodicum. Let's add this in first. Uh, we can add a rule in that if we ever see a, two capitalized words after a Sanctus, that's going to be a person, and add like a special custom pipe for that. Uh, oh, hey. Hey, that's so nice of you, Ricardo. Thank you so much. That was incredible. Yeah, Clem, I think it's going to refer to the to the holy uh, Job in this case. Or um, maybe it's not Job. Let me go back and look real fast. Uh, holy y Yod. I'm not entirely sure who that individual is. Let me look up here in the context. So Candidus Britannum, which, by the way, Candidus should be being grabbed. Where are we at? Bring him up so. Said penne. There you go. Okay, right there. So Domini and Domin Dei aren't being grabbed as people for us right now. Oh, I'm in the side by side view, that's why. Okay, so Mopso is gonna be there, and then where was the context for this? Martinos and Vichos here. Uh, Vichos, let's go back and look at the actual test. In Vichos, Yodokum. Yeah. Yodokos. What is a Vicus? Oh, this is, he's describing the scene when Martin lays down his, uh, his cloth or splits his cloth in the street. So why is he calling it Vicus by uh, a proper name? The row of houses, I'm, I'm not going to count it for right now, at least. I don't think it's a proper noun in this context, even though it's using a capital word or capital letter, but Sanctum Yodokum, I will count. Cool. Well, let's switch back to our NER mode. Yes, Vicus. Hey, thanks, Clem. David, I want to make sure that we've gotten Candidus, which we did. And a Saxonium, that's going to be uh, a person in this case. So we can add both of these names into uh, not just uh, Demoeta, but also Demoeta Saxonum. So it's Demoeta the Saxon. Uh, so there we go. All right, now let's um, clear cache, load this up again, and we should be looking a little bit better. Oh, it's uh, a noun for city. It, do you know in this context if it's a, if it if it's probably functioning as a place then, as a proper noun for a place, Clem, or do you see it functioning more as a as a, a general way of referring to the city, a, a city of tour, even if it's capitalized. I'm really curious. I, I will add it for sure if it, if, it, if it works that way. So cool. And again, we're just kind of just going through and just finding these, uh, these exceptions that we need to add into our entity ruler pretty quickly. I've never heard of Vuita, but I think that's a person yeah, looks like it from context. Uh, Clemens, Clemens. Uh, again, I'm going to take Clemens out of this. I don't know if it ever really refers to the person Clemens. Um, so better to be safe than sorry in this scenario. And I'm also going to get rid of Cleric Corum. Oh, but it's plural. Is it a fourth declension, Vicus? It's a second. I'm not sure. Uh, it's a second declension, Clem. Uh, Vicus, at least according to this. I could be completely wrong. Uh, but if it's a second... Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Because. Oh, is it actually that way in the text? 
Oh, it could be. You're right. You don't see that too often, though, uh, in medieval text, at least not in Alcuin that I know about. Let me go back to letter 18. We can kind of see it. Uh, because, because, was it letter 18? Can't remember now. No! Maybe it was 16. I'll keep a mental note of it, Clem, I promise. And uh, I'll come back to it. Okay, cool. We're seeing places flagged the correct way. Um, this is York. Uh, Britannia. This is fantastic. Here we have uh, some possible person. Dei. Oh, it's Dei Sanguine. So there's a, probably a corruption of the text there. Either way, it's looking a lot better than it was before. Uh, at first glance, I'm not seeing any entities that we haven't flagged. And let's go ahead and just jump ahead and grab some later letters. And then uh, I'm going to take a break after this and grab some food. And then I'm going to I'll be back in probably like 20. Oh, Scotus. That's going to be a person. Um, I'm going to grab some food and then I'm going to be Scotus. I'm going to be working on the header part. So the other thing that we're going to have in here, Scato, Scati. I should capture all of our singulars. I don't think he ever refers to a, a woman who is a Scot, the blood of God. Yeah, I agree, Clem. I agree. <laughs> all right, cool. Oops, I didn't mean to save that. Cool. So now this is kind of up and running. If, if anyone wants me to push this app, like I said, to the cloud, so you can kind of play around with it a little bit while I am uh, uh, going to get, grab a bite to eat, uh, do let me know. And if you find things that you think should belong to certain categories, uh, let me know. Uh, Anglorum, that's going to be not angles. That's going to be a group. Anglorum. Again, we're making these corrections. It is a group. It must be flagged twice. Here we go. Aquai. That's not going to be. It, it might. I'm going to leave it. Cool. Oh. Looking all right. Cool. All right. Yeah, I'm going to take about a half hour break. I've been doing this for almost 12 hours straight, 11 hours and three minutes with only a couple breaks. I'm going to be back in uh, in 30 minutes and uh, we'll kind of pick up. I'm going to have some food. I'm going to uh, then switch over and I'm going to go ahead before I go, though, and I'm going to actually make a separate app or a separate repo for just this app. So let me go ahead and do that now and then I'll push it to GitHub and I will actually add it to my Streamlit share. And let's pick a new repository. We're gonna call this the DAP app, which is the, that's a cool name, but it's gonna be the Digital Alcuin Project app repository. So let's go ahead and uh, publish the repository. And I don't care if it's private or not, I'll just leave it that way for now. Uh, Streamlit share can grab it no matter what. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be grabbing the different components of this uh, that are necessary. So we are going to grab the app itself. We are going to grab the models. And this way I don't have to like worry about if a, a push actually delaying the stream at all. So let me go ahead and show you what I'm doing as I do it. So we've got the models there and then uh, digital Alcuin project. I need to grab all of that data. The uh, I need to grab the Adobe images and I need to grab the cleaned letters and I need to grab the letter spans and I think I think that's it. I think that's it. So let's go ahead and go into our app repo. We're going to create a new folder called data. And then within here, I'm going to be kind of just copying and pasting all of this stuff. And the stream might slow down just a little bit here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and push everything, though. And 
I'll need a requirements.txt as well. Uh, I think all I need is spacey and spacey streamlet, I think. Oh, nope, not new folder. Uh, new, we're going to just do a requirements.txt. And this is going to be spacey, spacey streamlet. So far, those are the only two requirements of this app. Let me just go up and check just to make sure my code for the app. Uh, glob and JSON, they come standard with it, so that should be good. And I need to push the requirements and oh, commit to main. So this is going to take probably still it on the stream just a little bit while I while I push all of this to main. It's pushing all of the the text files right now. That and the images as well. So do expect the stream to be a little delayed for just a few minutes. Oh, hey, good night, Clem. Thanks a lot. Uh, once this is done uh, pushing, uh, I'm gonna have to push again with the the final commit of the requirements.txt. And then we're gonna actually just get this app up and running on the cloud so that you who are following along can kind of uh, play with it in real time. And if you find things, uh, do email me, message me, direct message me on uh, on Twitter or, or maybe uh, send it, put it in a comment. But if you find mistakes that are happening, uh, let me know. This is the whole point of kind of debugging. This is not gonna be perfect right now. Uh, we've got another, what, 36 hours for it to be perfect. So we're doing good so far. Okay, so it's committed. Now comes the fun time of going to Streamlit Share. I don't really need any of this open anymore. All right, we're going to go to Share, not Streamlit. And I'm going to make a new app. And this is, if you don't know, this is kind of how you uh, real quickly get an app up and running in Streamlit. Uh, you can host it with Streamlit, which is what I'm doing right now. And uh, we're going to do a new app. And we're going to be from the DAP app repo, which is the coolest name ever. And we're going to just hit deploy. And uh, this should be up and running in just a few minutes. Uh, Spacey doesn't take too long to install. Neither does Spacey Streamlit. And those are the only two requirements. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can actually see the app kind of populating right now. It's bu essentially building the environment. And then it's going to be installing via pip all of the necessary requirements. So right now you see it's downloading Spacey 3.1.1, which is the new a new uh, version as of, I think, last week. It's downloading Pillow, all the requirements that are going to come along with it, with Streamlit Spacey, I'd imagine, um, or with Streamlit in general. So you can actually display images. And then I'll provide the link to this as soon as this is done in the in the chat. Now, I must warn you uh, that if a lot of people try to use the app at the same time, it does tend to slow down. That's the one thing I've noticed with Streamlit apps when they're hosted on their server. I mean, but they're doing it for free for you, so you really can't complain. If you're using a, a host provider such as AWS or uh, I forget the other one, Haiku, I think is the name or something along those lines, it tends to be a little bit better. But we're going to do that at the very, very end. We're going to worry about that part of the problem. Uh, let's successfully uninstall pandas. All right. Cool. And always seeing those bubbles as a fun thing. All right. People, we got it up and running. Let's make sure all the different components works. Uh, it does there as well, Sarasano. So um, this is something that needs to be updated with Streamlit Spacey, and that's going to be they need to upgrade so they get rid of these beta expanders. Uh, that's nothing to do with us. Uh, we want to be able to make sure this works. Cool. All right, I'm going to drop this link in the description or in the comments, and uh, you all can start playing along with it if you want to. Um, let me find my Twitter, because I feel like this is one of those things that you should probably publish on or talk about. Publicize. That's the word. Close that. Let's 
So I'll, let's do a tweet. Why not? I'm going to bring this over here. Um, All right, and let's just grab a screenshot so people can kind of see the different uh, approaches. Let's do NER. Let's do the NER mode on, let's pick another letter that has a lot of entities. Ooh, I don't like that. These letters aren't organized the right way in the cloud for some reason. I'm not sure why that's happening. That's not cool. Eh, I'll figure it out later. Let's find a letter. I can't even figure out the rhyme or reason to why it's organized that way. That is very odd indeed. Oh, well. Like I said, we'll cross that bridge. We'll figure that out later. Uh, so 85 is selected. So 65. Yeah. We'll just grab a screenshot. Uh, we'll just use maybe we should zoom in a little bit more for this all right we'll do new All right, cool. So that's going to be where I stop for just a, for just a little bit. I'm going to go grab a bite to eat, and uh, then I'm going to be back and be able to continue on and improve this app as we go forward. And probably the first course of action is going to be to get this organized correctly. I have no idea why that's happening in the cloud and not happening here. Um, so something is happening that's causing these to be reorganized. I don't know what it is, but we'll figure it out. No worries. Be right back.
All right, and I'm back. So, feeling a little bit refreshed, finally got some food. So now I need to uh, to kind of figure out a couple different things. Um, I'm not sure why our multi-select box, or our select box, was getting reordered this way. 